Section 1 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Carson Section 1 Chapter 1 Out of the Way To Lisconnel, our very small hamlet in the middle of a wide bogland, the days that break over the dim blue hill-line, faint and far off, seldom bring a stranger's face. But then they seldom take a familiar one away, beyond reach at any rate of return before nightfall. In fact, there are few places amid this mortal change to which we may come back after any reasonable interval with more confidence of finding things just as we left them due allowance being made for the inevitable fingering of time. We shall find some old people who have aged under it, and some who, as certain philosophers would hold, have grown younger again. The latter may be seen just beginning, perhaps, to sit up stiff on a woman's arm, or starting for a trial crawl over Mother Earth, and of them we remark that there is another little Ryan or Quigley, while the former stay sunning themselves so inertly or totter about so shakily that we notice at once how much old Sheridan or the widow Joyce has failed since last year. These babies and grandparents often associate a good deal with one another at the stage when the old body is still capable of keeping an eye on the child and the child still resorts to all fours if it wants to get up its highest speed. But this companionship does not last long in any given case. Very soon the expanding and the contracting sphere cease to touch closely. On the one hand, the world widens into more spacious tracts for nimbler and bolder ranging over with all manner of remarkable things growing and living upon it, to be gathered and captured, or at least sought and chased, among pools and hillocks and swampy places. On the other it shrinks to within the limits of a few dwindling furlongs and perches, traversed even more feebly, until at length even the nearest stone, on which the warm rays can be basked in, seems to have moved too far off, and the flicker-haunted nook by the hearth-fire becomes the end of the whole day's journey. Thus the generations, as they succeed one another, wave-like, preserve a well-marked rhythm in their coming and going, play, work, rest, not to be interrupted by anything less peremptory than death or disablement. This wag by the wall swings and swings its bobbed pendulum without pause, but one swing is much like the other, and their background never varies. Little pat out stravading of a fine morning on the great brown-wigged bog, and it may be hoped enjoying himself thoroughly, is taking the same first steps in life as young pat his father, now busy cutting turf sods, and old pat his grandfather, idly watching them burn, with a pipe, if in luck, to keep a light and the Lisconnel folk, therefore, because the changes wrought by human agency come to them in unimposing forms, are strongly impressed by the vast natural vicissitudes of things which rule their destinies. The melting of season into season, and year into year, the leaf-like withering and drifting away of the old from among the fresh springing growths, are ever before their eyes, and the contemplation steeps them in a sense of the transitoriness of things good and bad. Even the black soil they tread on may next year flutter up into a vanishing blue column through a smoke hole in somebody's thatch. They carry this sense with a light and heavy heart. In like manner they make the very most of all unusual events. They find materials for half an hour's talk 
in the passage by their doors of one of those rarely coming strangers who do appear from time to time as frequently indeed as anybody would expect having surveyed the thoroughfare that links us with humanity for if we follow it southward where like the unvanishing wake of some vessel it streaks the level plain that is lonely as a wide water but stiller we pass by dan o'burn's forge now neighbourless and through the humble doof plain and on to ballybrosta our town but we must go many a mile further to reach anything upon which you would bestow that title or if we turn northward we only find it seeming another ample fold of bogland outspread far and far beyond lisconnel before a grey hill range begins to rise in slow undulations crested with firs and broom here we smell turf smoke again and see a cabin row that is sullenberg and hence the road strikes northwestward in among the mountains where a few mottled-faced sheep peer down over it from their smooth green walks but do not care to trust their black velvet legs upon it and then by the same time that the air has become sea-scented the road climbs to the top of a hill and stops there abruptly as if it had been travelling all the while merely to look at the view the truth is that the funds for its construction would go no further and in consequence wayfarers coming along by the shore still have to tread out a path for themselves across a gap of moorland if they are bound for lisconnel you may perceive therefore that lisconnel lies out of the way on the route to no places of importance and as its own ten or a dozen little houses are i fear collectively altogether insignificant it has small reason to expect many visitors the widow mcgurk said one day that you might as well be living at the bottom of a bog hole for any company you got the chance of seeing but this was an exaggeration she was vexed when she made the remark because mrs dooley old dan o'burn's married daughter then staying at the forge had promised to come and inspect a pair of marketable chickens in anticipation of which mrs mcgurk had wetted a cup of tea and used up her last handful of oatmeal for a cake that mrs dooley who was in rather affluent circumstances might not think them too poorly off altogether but after all the hours had slipped blankly by and nobody had arrived so the widow had ruefully put her teapot to sit on the hob until himself came in for properly speaking she was at this time not yet a widow and had stepped down her tossocky slope with her double disappointment to mrs kilfoyle mrs kilfoyle was knitting at her door and not looking out over the bog where the flushed light of the sunset drowsed on the black sod in an almost tangible fire film against it the poppies stood up dark and opaque but the large white daisies had caught the wraith of the glow on their glimmering discs she had been thinking how not so long ago her thun thaddy used to come whistling home to her across the bog when the shadows stretched their longest the sunset still came punctually every evening but had grown wonderfully lonesome since the kick of a cross-tempered cart-horse had silenced his whistling and stopped his home-coming for ever thaddy's whistling had been indifferent considered as music yet it had sounded pleasant in her ears and mrs mcgurk's trouble seemed to her not very serious however she replied to her complaint ah sure woman dear like enough she might be here to-morrow and if she is she'll be very apt to not gare e'er a chuck or a chicken off o of me not the feather of a one said mrs mcgurk resentfully 
plenty of other things I have to do besides wasting me time waiting for people who don't know their own minds from one minute to the next, and making a fool of meself, stargazing along the road, and nary a foot stirring on it no more than if it was desolate wilderness. She would not for the world have alluded to her expenditure of more material resources, and accordingly had to explain her vexation by putting a fictitious value upon her time, which in reality was just then drearily superabundant. Sure, suggested Mrs. Kilfoyle, the poor woman maybe was kept at home some way, and she would every intention to be comin'. I declare now, you'd whiles think things knew what you was mainin' in your mind, and rise themselves up again it a purpose to prevent you. They happen that contrary. As Mrs. McGurk's experience did not dispose her to gainsay this proposition, and she was nevertheless disinclined to be mollified by it, she likewise had recourse to generalities, and said, "'Deed, then, it's welcome anybody is to stop away, if they're wishful, hindered or no. Long sorry I'd be to have people distressing themselves, streeling after me.' and she added rather inconsistently the remark already mentioned but the likes of this place i never witnessed you might as well be living at the bottom of the blackest old bog hole there for e'er a chance you have to be seeing a bit of company and it's yourself would make the fine sizable water ask ma'am a high-pitched voice said suddenly from within doors causing mrs mcgurk to start and peer into the dark opening behind her, somewhat taken aback at finding that she had had an unsuspected audience, which is always more or less of a shock. The first object she descried through the hazy dusk was the figure of the old woman known to Lisconnel as Oddy Rafferty's aunt, but in fact so related to his father, sitting with her short black doudeen by the delicate pink and white embers for the evening was warm and the fire low. Adi himself was leaning against the wall, critically examining Brian Kilfoyle's black thorn, and forming a poor opinion of it with considerable satisfaction. Not that he bore Brian any ill will, but because this is his method of attaining to contentment with his own possessions. "'Weather now, and is it yourself that's in it, Oddie Rafferty?' said Mrs. McGurk, as she recognized him. "'And what talk have you out of you about water asks? You're the great man, be dad.' "'Me aunt's looking in on Mrs. Kilfoyle, ma'am,' said Oddie. "'Be reason of Brian being off to the town. "'And right enough you and me knows what's took him there, and so does Nora Finnegan.' Och, good luck to the pair of them. Courtin' said his aunt, who preferred to put things briefly and clearly, but I was tellin' Mrs. Kilfoyle to not be frettin', for sure God is good, and they'll be apt to keep her in it all's one. Goodness may pity you, woman, said Mrs. McGurk. Brian would a leaf take and bring home a she hyena, and it raven mad as anybody would look crooked at his mother. I very well know. Nora's a real decent little slip of a girl, Mrs. Kilfoyle said tranquilly, considering that her son's character needed no certificate. But the old woman only grunted doubtfully, and said, Och, is she? For she had been a superfluous aunt so long that she found it hard to believe in anything better than toleration. Talking of company, said Adi, to change the subject, which his aunt's remarks often disposed people to do, Mad Bell's just after shankin' back with herself. She's below Calogiewin with Big Anne. It's a fine long tramp she's took this time, so if she was in the humour she'd a right to hay plenty to be tellin' us. Well, now, I'm glad the creature's home, said Mrs. Kilfoyle. It's lonesome in a manner to think of the little old being roving about the world like a wisp of hay gathered up on the wind, for all to be sure it's her own fancy starts her off. I wonder where to she went this time, said Mrs. McGurk. 
"'You might as well,' said Otty, "'be wondering where one of them seagulls goes "'when it gives a flourish of its old flippers "'and away with its elf head foremost, "'bearing in course that mad bell's bound "'to keep on the dry land at all events. "'But from Salenberg ways she's come this evening, "'singing Gary Owen most powerful. "'I know that much.' ah then she might be chance i have been as far as larrig manor and has seen a sight of me brother mick and theresa mrs kilfoyle said with wistful interest for at lisconnel we still look not a little to the reports brought by stray travellers for news of absent friends much as we did before the days of penny posts and mail trains and our geographical lore is vague enough to impede us but slightly in our hopes of obtaining information from any quarter only the probability seems to be increased if the newcomer arrives from the direction in which our friend departed sure she might so said Addy, but never a tell she'll tell unless she happens to take the notion in the queer old head of her it's just be the road of humour in her now and again and piecing her odd stories together you get air of discovery so to speak of the places she's after being in the scenes of mad bell's wanderings did indeed reveal themselves to her neighbours confusedly and dispersedly in her fitful and capricious narrative like glimpses of a landscape caught through a shifting mist as this sometimes distorts the objects that loom within it so mad bell's statements were occasionally misleading once for example she threw the quigley family into most distracted concern by her accounts of the terrific shootin and murderin and massacreen she had seen in progress down away at glasgannon where joe quigley had taken service with a strong farmer these disturbances being in reality nothing more than a muster of the county militia but i can tell you how she travelled a good step of the way home Addy now continued for she told me herself the tinkers gave her a lift in their old cart somewheres beyond rosebide she met with them glory be to goodness twasn't any nearer here they were the old thieves of sin however mrs mcgurk belike it'd be wishful to see them comin along fine company they be for anybody begorra troth it's a queer ugly bog hole she'd find the equal of them at the bottom of mrs mcgurk however said protestingly och with his true man don't be talkin of the tinkers they'd a right to not be let set foot within ten miles of any decent place them or the likes of any such rogues and mrs kilfoyle said i'd leave her then a great deal and keep out of it ne'er a one of the lot of them i ever beheld but had the eyes rolling in his head with villainy and the children goodness help em do be worse than the grown people and Oddy rafferty's aunt said bad cess to the whole of them for in lisconnel nobody had a good word to say of the tinkers the tribe and their delinquencies have even supplied us with a bit of the proverbial philosophy in which not a little of our local history is epitomized the saying as pat as thieving to a tinker is probably quoted among us as frequently as any other except perhaps one which refers to jerry dunn's basket this latter had its origin in a certain event not like the former in the long accumulating observations of habit and propensities and to explain it is therefore to write a chapter of our chronicles moreover the event in question is otherwise not unimportant from a sociological point of view because it is very likely to have been the first morning call ever made at lisconnel chapter two jerry dunn's basket so it is worth while to tell the reason why people at lisconnel sometimes respond with irony to a question what have i got sure all that jerry dunn had in his basket the saying is of respectable antiquity for it originated while bessie joyce who died a year or so back at 
a great old age entirely, was still but a slip of a girl. In those days her mother used often to say regretfully that she didn't know when she was well off, like Roddy O'Rourke's pigs, quoting a proverb of obscura antecedents. When she did so, she was generally thinking of the fine little farm in the county Clare, which they had not long since exchanged for the poor tiny holding away in the heart of the black bog, and of how, among the green fields and thriving beasts and other good things of Clonmena, she had allowed her content to be marred by such a detail as her Bessie's refusal to favour the suit of Jerry Dunn. Mrs. Joyce eagerly desired a brilliant alliance for Bessie, who was rather an important daughter, being the only grown-up girl, and a very pretty one, among a troop of younger brethren. So it seemed contrary enough that she wouldn't look the same side of the road as young Jerry, who was farming prosperously on his own account and whose family were old friends and neighbors and real respectable people including a first cousin nothing less than a parish priest yet bessie ran away and hid herself in as ingeniously unlikely places as a strayed calf whenever she heard of his approach and if brought by chance into his society became most discouragingly deaf and dumb it is true that at the time i speak of bessie's prospects fully entitled her to as opulent a match and no one apparently foresaw how speedily they would be overcast by her father's improvidence but andy joyce had an ill-advised predilection for seeing things what he called decent and proper about him and it led him into several imprudent acts for instance he built some highly superior sheds in the bawn to the bettering no doubt of his cattle's condition but very little to his own purpose which he would indeed have served more advantageously by spending the money they cost him at moriarty shabeen nor was he left without due warning of the consequences likely to result from such courses the abrupt raising of his rent by fifty per cent was a broad hint which most men would have taken and it did keep andy quiet ruthfully for a season or two then however having again saved up a trifle he could not resist the temptation to drain the swampy corner of the farthest river field which was as kind a bit of land as you could wish only for the water lying on it and in which he afterwards raised himself a remarkably fine crop of white oats the sight of them done his heart good he said exultantly nothing recking that it was the last touch of farmer's pride he would ever feel yet on the next quarter day the joyces received notice to quit and their landlord determined to keep the vacated holding in his own hands those new sheds were just the thing for his young stock andy in fact had done his best to improve himself off the face of the earth and he should therefore have been thankful to retain a foothold even a loose jointed rush-roofed cabin away at stony lisconnel whether thankful or no there at any rate he presently found himself established with all his family and the meagre remnant of his hastily sold off gear and the back doors of the house seeming to loom ahead whenever he looked into the murky future the first weeks and months of their new adversity passed slowly and heavily for the transplanted household more especially for andy and his wife who had outgrown a love of paddling in bog holes and had acquired a habit of wondering what at all it become of the childer the creatures one shrill blasted march morning andy trudged off to the fair down below at duffclane not that he had any business to transact there unless he reckoned as such a desire to gain a respite from regretful boredom he but partially succeeded in doing this and returned at dusk 
so fagged and dispirited that he had not energy to relate his scraps of news until he was half through his plate of stirabout then he observed i seen a couple of boys from home in it whither now to think of that said mrs joyce with mournful interest which of them was it the one of them was terence kilfoyle said andy mrs joyce's interest flagged for young kilfoyle was merely a good-looking lad with the name of being rather wild ah sure he might as well be in one place as another she said indifferently bessie honey as you're done just throw the scraps to the white hen where she's sittin he says he's thinkin to settle hereabouts said andy i told him he's a right to go try his fortin somewhere outlandish but he didn't seem to fancy the idea and small blame to him a man's bound to get his heart broke one way or the other anywheres as far as i can see i met jerry dunn too och did you indeed said mrs joyce kindling into eagerness again jerry had been absent from clonmena at the time of their flitting and they had heard nothing of him since but she still cherished a flicker of hope in his connection which the tidings of his appearance in the neighbourhood fanned and fed and he's quit out of it himself and he continued for the old uncle of his he's been stoppin wit this while back at dusclane's after dyin and leavin him a fine farm and a hantle of money and i don't know what all besides so it's there he's goin to live and he's gave up the old place at conmena as well he may and no loss to him on it for he says himself he never spent a penny over it beyond what he'd be druv to if he wanted to get air or crop out of it at all and keep things together in any fashion he wasn't such a fool and he hesitated as if on the brink of a painful theme and resumed with an effort he bought magpie and the two two-year-olds off of peter martin cheap enough he got them too though he had to give ten shillings a head more for them than martin paid me mavrone but some people have the luck said mrs joyce and jerry bid me tell you said andy the memory of his lost cattle still saddening his tone that he might be stepping up here to see you to-morrow or next day at this mrs joyce's face suddenly brightened as if she had been summoned to share jerry dunn's good luck she felt almost as if that had actually happened for his visit could surely signify nothing else than that he meant to continue his suit and under the circumstances bessie's misliking was a, a piece of folly not to be taken into account besides that the girl she thought looked quite heartened up by the news so she replied to her husband deed then he'll be very welcome and the sparkle was in her eyes all the rest of the evening on the morrow which was a bright morning with a far-off pale blue sky mrs joyce hurried over her readying up that she might be prepared for her possible visitor she put on her best clothes and as her wardrobe had not yet fallen to a level with her fortune she was able to array herself in a strong steel-grey mohair gown a black silk apron with three rows of velvet ribbon on it besides the binding a fine small woollen shawl of very brilliant scarlet and black plaid with a pinkish cornelian brooch to pin it at the throat all surmounted by a snowy high call cap in those days not yet out of date at lisconnel where fashion lags somewhat she noticed well pleased bessie's willingness to fall in with a suggestion that she should rearrange her hair and change her gown after the morning's work was done and the inference drawn grew stronger when for the first time since their troubles the girl began to sing moldovan glana while she coiled up her long tresses all that forenoon mrs joyce had happy dreams about the mending of the family's fortunes which would be effected by bessie's marriage with jerry dunn 
when her neighbor mrs ryan looked in she could not bear mentioning the expected call and was further elated because mrs ryan at once remarked sure twill be bessie he's after though she herself of course disclaimed the idea saying och musha ma'am not at all the ryans were tenants who had also been put out of clonmena and they occupied a cabin adjoining the joyce's these two dwellings backed by the slopes of the knockhorn forming the nucleus of lisconnel about noon paddy the eldest boy approached at a hand gallop bestriding a donkey which belonged to the gang of men who were still working on the unfinished road as soon as the beast reached the open-work stone wall of the potato field it resolutely scraped its rider off a thing it had been vainly wishing to do all along the fenceless track paddy however alighted unconcerned among the clattering stones and ran on with his tidings these were to the effect that he was after seeing jerry dunn shankin up from du ways a goodish bit below the indin of the road and he would a great big basket carryin fit to hold a young turf stack the intelligence created an agreeable excitement which was undoubtedly heightened by the fact of the basket very belike said mrs ryan he's bringin something to you or it might be bessie and while mrs joyce rejoined deprecatingly ah sure woman alive what would the poor lad be troublin himself to bring us all this way she was really answering her own question with a dozen flattering conjectures the basket must certainly contain something and there were so few by any means probable things that would not at this pinch have come acceptably to the joyce's household where the heavy potato sack grew light with such alarming rapidity and the little hoard of corn dwindled and the children's appetites seemed to wax a larger day by day she had not quite made up her mind when jerry arrived whether she would wish for a bit of bacon poor andy missed an odd taste a bit so bad or for another couple of hens which would be uncommonly useful now that her own few had all left off laying mrs ryan having discreetly withdrawn mrs joyce stood alone in her dark doorway to receive her guest and through all her flutter of hope she felt a bitter twinge of housewifely chagrin at being discovered in such miserable quarters the black earth flooring at her threshold gritted hatefully under her feet and the gusts whistling through the many chinks of her rough walls seemed to skirl derisively she was nevertheless resolved to put the best possible face upon the situation well mrs joyce ma'am and how's yourself this long while said jerry dunn coming up bedad i'm glad to see you so finely and it's an illigant place you've got up here ah it's not too bad whatever said mrs joyce only twas a great upset on us turning out of the old house at home himself had a right to have left things the way he found them and then it mightn't ever ha happened him but sure poor man he never thought he'd be ruinating us with his contrivances it's god's will be stepping inside to the fire jerry lad there's a thin feel yet in the wind jerry stepping inside deposited his basket which did not appear to be very heavy rather disregardfully by him on the floor mrs joyce would not allow herself to glance in its direction it struck her that the young man seemed awkward and flustered and she considered this a favourable symptom and what ways mr joyce said jerry he was looking grand when i seen him yesterday deed he gets his health middlin well enough glory be to goodness she said some whiles he'll be frettin a bit thinkin of different things and when i tell him he'd better leave botherin his head with them he says he might as easy bid a blast o wind to not be blowin through a hole och and he's a queer man he's out and about now somewheres on the farm mrs joyce put a spaciousness into her tone 
wholly disproportionate to their screed of tussocks and boulders, and then paused, hoping that the next inquiry might relate to Bessie. But what young Jerry said was, "'You've got a great run, anyway, for the fowls.' The irrelevance of the remark disappointed Mrs. Joyce, and she replied a little tartly, "'A great run, you may call it, for begorra our hearts are broken, huntin' after the creatures, and they strayin' off with themselves over the width of the bog there, till you've as much chance of catchin' them as the sparks flyin' up the chimney.' "'That's unhandy now,' said Jerry. He sat for some moments reflectively, ruffling up his flaxen hair with both hands, and then he said, "'Have you the big white hen yet that you got from me a while ago?' "'We have so, bedad,' said Mrs. Joyce, not loath to enlarge upon this subject. "'Sure we made a shift to bring a few of the best chickens we had along with us, and sorry we had been to lose her, and she a wonderful layer, and after you were given her to us in a present that way.' "'There was some talk that time,' said Jerry, "'about me and Bessie.' "'Aye, true for you there was,' said Mrs. Joyce, in eager assent. "'Plenty of talk.' She would have added more, but he was evidently in a hurry to speak again. "'Well, there's none now,' he said. "'Things is different altogether. "'If I had known, if I had kept the hen, the fact of the matter is I'm about getting married to Sally Cochran. That's me poor uncle's wife's niece. He's after leaving her what he had saved up. She's a fine figure of a girl, as ever you saw, and as good as gold, and the bit of land and the bit of money had a right to go the one way. So I was thinking, Mrs. Joyce, I might as well be taking home the old hen with me, things being different now and no talk of Bessie. Sally has a great wish for a white hen, and we've ne'er a one of that sort at our place. I've brought a wad of hay in the basket meself, for afraid yous might be short of it up here. Jerry gave a kick to the basket, which betrayed the flimsy nature of its contents by rolling over with a wobble on its side. At this critical moment, Mrs. Joyce's pride rallied loyally to the rescue of her dignity and self-respect, proving as effectual as the ice film which keeps the bleakest pool unruffled by the wildest strong wing. With the knell of all her hope clanging harshly in her ears, she smiled serenely and said gaily, "'I be dad himself was tellin' us something about it last night. Sure I'm real glad to hear tell of your good luck, and I wish you joy of it.' "'And will you be getting married again, Shrovetide? "'Och, that's grand. "'But the white hen now. "'The only thing is the creature's been sitting on a clutch of eggs since Monday week, "'so what are we to do at all? "'There's heaps of room for the whole of them in the basket, for that matter,' Jerry suggested promptly. "'Ah, sure, it's destroyed they'd be, joggling along, and the creature herself to go distracted entirely.' Sorra a bit of good you'd get of her, but look here, Mr. Dunn, I've got another out here as like her as if the both of them had come out of the one egg, and you could be taking that instead. It's a lucky thing I didn't set her to sit the way I was intendin', only I never could get a clutch gathered for her, be reason of the lads eatin' up the eggs on me. Sure I can't keep them from the little bastoons when they be hungry." "'Twould be all the same to me, in course, supposin' she was equally so good,' Jerry admitted with caution. "'Every feather she is,' said Mrs. Joyce. "'I seen her runnin' about there just this minute. You can be lookin' at her yourself.' She went towards the door as she spoke, and was somewhat taken aback to perceive her husband leaning against the wall close outside. How much of the discussion he might have heard she could not tell." The white hen also appeared, within easy reach, daintily resplendent under the sunshine on a background of black turf, and Mrs. Ryan, standing darkly framed in her doorway, was very certain to be an interested observer of events. For the moment, Mrs. Joyce's uppermost anxiety was to avoid any betrayal of discomfiture, 
and she accordingly said in a loud and cheerful tone och and there you are andy jerry dunn's wishful for the loan of a clockin hen so i'm about catchin him the young white one to take home with him but to her intense disgust jerry who had followed her with his basket said remonstrantly whether now mrs joyce the way i understand the matter there's no talk in it of borrowing at all i'm only takin her back instead of the old one and i question would any reasonable body stand me out if i don't own her be rights it's an unjust thing to be speakin of loans mrs joyce was so dumbfounded by this rebuff that she could only hide her confusion by displaying an exaggerated activity in the capture of the hen her husband however said blandly och don't make yourself uneasy man loan or no loan you needn't be under any apprehension we'll be comin after her wid a basket divil a much stir yourself kitty and be clappin her in under the lid he's in a hurry to get home to his sweetheart wid the illigant prisint he's after pickin up for her ay that's right woman alive give a tie to the bit of string and then there's nothin to be delayin him after this everybody said good-bye with much politeness and affability though with all a certain air of dispatch as if they were conscious of handling rather perishable goods and when jerry was beyond earshot andy looking after him remarked i never liked a bone in that fellow's skin himself and his old basket the lads'll be presently coming in to their dinners do you know where bessie is said to mrs joyce her heart sinking still lower at the thought of the disappointment which she had presumably been helping to prepare for her daughter when i seen her a while back she was out there with the childer discoursin to terence kilfoyle and he said contentedly musha good gracious terence kilfoyle and what's he come after she said in a bitter tone he stepped up with a couple of pounds of fresh butter and a dozen of eggs he said he minded bessie havin a fancy for duck eggs and he thought we mightn't happen to have ever a one up here she seemed as pleased as anything but if you ax me kitty he said with a twinkle i've a notion he's come after something more than our old hin he's a great young rogue said mrs joyce yet there was an accent of relief in her voice and on her face a reflection of her husband's smile and jerry dunn's basket still occupies its niche in the stories of our proverbial philosophy End of section 1This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 2 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2. Chapter 3. Mrs. Kilfoyle's Cloak. The opprobrious proverb already mentioned is not the only permanent mark of unpopularity that the tinkers have earned for themselves at lisconnel their very name has become a term of reproach among us so that the old tinker is recognized as an appropriate epithet for any troublesome beast or disagreeable neighbor if they were not case hardened by long experience they would surely be mortified sometimes at the reception with which they meet almost wherever they go the approach of the two queer vehicles in which they now generally travel is watched by displeased eyes all over our countryside and they are so to speak lighted on their way by the gleam of suspicion or resentful glances and it must be admitted that their evil reputation has not been bestowed upon them gratuitously according to Oddy rafferty the like of such a clanjam free of thievin drunken miscreants you wouldn't easy get together if you had a spring trap set for them at the old fellow's front door 
for a month of Sundays, and if himself didn't do a hard day's work the time he was contractin' them, he never done one in his life, and that's a fact. But Oddy is apt to be particularly severe in his strictures upon the tinkers, because he feels an aggravated form of rivalry existing between him and them. For the wiliness, which is understood to be Oddy's forte, also preeminently characterizes many of the tinker's nefarious proceedings, and this makes it seem to him that they not only set their wits against his, but throw discredit upon his favorite quality for the glaring moral defects which they exhibit in conjunction with it. One's pleasure in being described admiringly as the old boyo that's in it is much diminished when one hears the same thing said bitterly of some Slavine who has filched a poor body's meal-bag or run off with a lone widdy's woman's fowl still although the tinker's name has become a byword among us through a long series of petty offences rather than any one flagrant crime there is a notable misdeed on record against them which has never been forgotten in the lapse of many years it was perpetrated soon after the death of mrs kilfoyle's mother the widow joyce an event which is but dimly recollected now at lysconnel as nearly half a century has gone by she did not very long survive her husband and he had left his roots behind in his little place at clonmena where as we know he had farmed not wisely but too well and had been put out of it for his pains to expend his energy upon our oozy black sods and stark white boulders but instead he moped about fretting for his fair green fields and few proudly cherished beasts especially the little old kerry cow and at his funeral the neighbors said ah bedad poor man god help him he never held up his head again from that good day to this when mrs joyce felt that it behooved her to settle her affairs she found that the most important possession she had to dispose of was her large cloak she had acquired it at the prosperous time of her marriage and it was a very superior specimen of its kind in dark blue cloth being superfine and its ample capes and capacious hood being double-lined and quilted and stitched in a way which i cannot pretend to describe but which made it a most substantial and handsome garment if mrs joyce had been left entirely to her own choice in the matter i think she would have bequeathed it to her younger daughter teresa notwithstanding that custom clearly designated bessie kilfoyle the eldest of the family as the heiress for she said to herself that poor bessie had her husband and childer to console her anyway but little teresa the creature had ne'er such a thing at all and wouldn't have not she god love her and the back of me hand to some i could name it seemed to her that to leave the child the cloak would be almost like keeping a warm wing spread over her in the cold wide world and there was no fear that bessie would take it amiss but teresa herself protested strongly against such a disposition urging for one thing that sure she'd be lost in it entirely if ever she put it on a not unfounded objection as teresa was several sizes smaller than bessie and even she fell far short of her mother in stature and portliness teresa also said confidently with a sinking heart but sure anyhow mother jewel what matter about it twill be all gone to holes and flitters and thureens and so it will please goodness afore there's any talk of anybody else wearing it except your own old self and she expressed much the same conviction one day to her next-door neighbor old biddy ryan 
to whom she had run in for a loan of a sup of sour milk, which Mrs. Joyce fancied. To Biddy's sincere regret she could offer Theresa barely a skimpy noggin of milk, and only a meagre shred of encouragement, and by way of eking out the latter with its sorry substitute consolation, she said as she tilted the jug perpendicular to extract its last drop. Well, sure, me dear, I do be saying me prayers for her every son goes over our heads, that she might be left with you this great while yet. Deed I do so. But ah, Kushla, if we could be keeping people that away, would there be ever a funeral, even going back on the road at all at all? I'm thinking there's scarce a one living, and he as old and foolish and little good for as you please, but some creature'll be grudging him to his grave. That's himself, maybe, all the while wishing he was in it. Or more be token, how can we tell what queer, ugly misfortune them that's took is took out of the road of, that we should be as good as bidding them stay till it comes to ruinating them? So it's praying away I am, honey, said old Biddy, whom Theresa could not help hating heart-sickly, but like enough the Lord might know better than to be minding a word I say. And it seemed that he did. Anyway, the day soon came when the heavy blue cloak passed into Mrs. Kilfoyle's possession. At that time it was clear, still autumn weather, with just a sprinkle of frost white on the wayside grass, like the wraith of belated moonlight when the sun rose and shimmering into rainbow stars by noon but about a month later the winter swooped suddenly on lysconnel with wild winds and cold rain that made crystal silver streaks down the purple of the great mountain heads peering in over our bogland so one perishing saturday mrs kilfoyle made up her mind that she would wear her warm legacy on the bleak walk to mass next morning and reaching it down from where it was stored away among the rafters wrapped in an old sack she shook it respectfully out of its straight creased folds as she did so she noticed that the binding of the hood had ripped in one place and that the lining was fraying out a mishap that should be promptly remedied before it spread any further. She was not a very expert needlewoman, and she thought she had better run over the way to consult Mrs. O'Driscoll, then a young matron, esteemed the handiest and most helpful person in Lysconnel. It's the nature of her to be settin' things straight wherever she goes, Mrs. Kilfoyle said to herself, as she stood in her doorway, waiting for the rain to clear off, and looking across the road to the sodden roof which sheltered her neighbor's head. It had been lying low, vanquished by a trouble which even she could not set to rights, and some of the older people say that things have gone a little crookeder in Lysconnel ever since. The shower was a vicious one, with a sting of sleet and hail in its drops, pelted about by gusts that ruffled up the puddles into ripples, all set on end like the feathers of a frightened hen. The hens themselves stood disconsolately sheltering under the bank, mostly on one leg, as if they preferred to keep up the slightest possible connection with such a very damp and disagreeable earth. You could not see far in any direction for the fluttering sheets of mist, and a stranger who had been coming along the road from Duffelane stepped out of them abruptly quite close to Mrs. Kilfoyle's door, before she knew that there was anybody near. He was a tall, elderly man, gaunt and grizzled, very ragged and so miserable looking that mrs kilfoyle could have felt nothing but compassion for him had he not carried over his shoulder a bunch of shiny cans 
which was to her mind as satisfactory a passport as a ticket of leave for although these were yet rather early days at lisconnel the tinkers had already begun to establish their reputation so when he stopped in front of her and said good day ma'am she only replied distantly it's a hardy mornin and hoped he would move on but he said it's cruel cooled ma'am and continued to stand looking at her with wide and woeful eyes in which she conjectured erroneously as it happened hunger for warmth or food under these circumstances what could be done by a woman who was conscious of owning a redly glowing hearth with a big black pot fairly well filled clucking and bobbing upon it to possess such wealth as this and think seriously of withholding a share from anybody who urges the incontestable claim of wanting it is a mood altogether foreign to lisconnel where the responsibilities of poverty are no doubt very imperfectly understood accordingly mrs kilfoyle said to the tattered tramp ah then step inside and have a couple of hot potatoes and when he accepted the invitation without much alacrity as if he had something else on his mind she picked for him out of the steam two of the biggest potatoes whose earth-coloured skins cracking showed a fair floweriness within and she shook a little heap of salt the only relish she had onto the chipped white plate as she handed it to him saying sit you down be the fire there and get a taste of the heat then she lifted her old shawl over her head and ran out to see where at all brian and thady were getting their deaths on her under the pours of rain and as she passed the keogh's adjacent door which was afterward the sheridan's whence their larry departed so reluctantly young mrs keogh called her to come in and look at the child who being a new and unique possession was liable to develop alarmingly strange symptoms and had now woke up with his head that hot you might as well put your hand on the hob of the grate mrs kilfoyle stayed only long enough to suggest as a possible remedy a drop of two milk whey but ah sure woman dear where at all would we come by dat wit the crother of a goat scarce wet in the bottom of the pan and to draw reassuring omens from the avidity with which the invalid grabbed at a sugared crust in fact she was less than five minutes out of her house but when she returned to it she found it empty first she noted with a moderate thrill of surprise that her visitor had gone away leaving his potatoes untouched and next with a rough shock of dismay that her cloak no longer lay on the window seat where she had left it from that moment she never felt any real doubts about what had befallen her though for some time she kept on trying to conjure them up and searched wildly round and round and round her little room like a distracted bee strayed into the hollow furze bush before she sped over to mrs o'driscoll with the news of her loss it spread rapidly through lisconnel and brought the neighbors together exclaiming and condoling though not in great force as there was a fair going on down beyant which nearly all the men and some of the women had attended this was accounted cruel unlucky as it left the place without any one able-bodied and active enough to go in pursuit of the thief a prompt start might have overtaken him especially as he was said to be a trifle lame-footed though mrs mcgurk who had seen him come down the hill opined that twasn't the sort of lameness would hinder the miscreant of steppin out only a square manner of flourish he had in one of his knees as if he was gatherin himself up to make an offer at a grasshopper's lep and then thinkin better of it 
little taddy kilfoyle reported that he had met the strange man a bit down the road legging it along at a great rate with a black roll of something under his arm that he looked to be crumplin up as small as he could the word crumplin went acutely to mrs kilfoyle's heart and some long-sighted people declared that they could still catch glimpses of a receding figure through the hovering fog on the way toward sullenbeg i think he'd be beyond seein afore now said mrs kilfoyle said mrs kilfoyle who stood in the rain the disconsolate centre of the group about her door all women and children except old johnny keogh who was so bothered and deaf that he grasped new situations slowly and feebly and had now an impression of somebody's house being on fire he must have took off with himself the instant me back was turned for never a crumb had he touched of the potatoes maybe he'd that much shame in him said mrs o'driscoll they'd a right to ha choked him troth and they had said ody rafferty's aunt is it chokin said young mrs mcgurk bitterly sure the bigger thief a body is the more he'll thrive on whatever he gets you might think villainy was as good as butter to people's potatoes you might so sharn how are you liker he'd ate all he could swally in the last place he got the chance of layin his hands on anything ach woman alive but it's the fool you were to let him out of your sight said ody rafferty's aunt if it had been me i'd never ha took me eyes off him for the look o him only goin by made me flesh creep upon me bones deed was i said mrs kilfoyle sorrowfully a fine fool and vexed she'd be real vexed if she guessed the way it was gone on us for the dear knows what dirty old rapscallions'll get the wearin of it now real vexed she'd be this speculation was more saddening than the actual loss of the cloak though that bereft her wardrobe of far and away its most valuable property which should have descended as an heirloom to her little katie who however being at present but three months old lay sleeping happily unaware of the cloud that had come over her prospects i wish to goodness a couple of the lads ud step home wid themselves this minute o time said mrs mcgurk they'd come tip wid him yet and take it off him ready enough and smash his ugly head for em if he would be givin em any impudence ay and twould be a real charity the mean beast or sling him in one of the bog holes said the elder mrs keogh a mild-looking little old woman i'd leave for nine nine pennies see them comin along but i'm afeard it's early for them yet everybody's eyes turned as she spoke towards the ridge of the knockdown though with no particular expectation of seeing what they wished upon it but behold just at that moment three figures blurred among the grey rain mists looming into view be the powers said mrs mcgurk jubilantly it's oddy rafferty himself to your souls now you've a great good chance ma'am to be gettin it back he's the boy who'll leg it over all before him for in those days oddy was lithe and limber and it's hard set the thievin turk'll be to get the better of him at a racin match ay och she had begun to hail him with a call eager and shrill which broke off in a single croak like a young cock's unsuccessful effort och murther 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 she said to a bystander in a disgusted undertone i'll give you me misfortunate word them other two is the police now it might seem on the face of things that the arrival of those two active and stalwart civil servants would have been welcomed as happening just in the nick of time yet it argues an alien ignorance to suppose such a view of the matter by any means possible the men in invisible green tunics belonged completely to the category of pitatie blights rint warrens fevers and the like devastators of life that dog a man more or less all through it but close in on him 
a pitiful quarry when the bad seasons come and the childer and the old crothers are starvin wit the hunger and his own heart is broke therefore to accept assistance from them in their official capacity would have been a proceeding most reprehensibly unnatural to put a private quarrel or injury into the hands of the peelers were a disloyal making of terms with the public foe a condoning of great permanent wrongs for the sake of a trivial temporary convenience lisconnel has never been skilled in the profitable and ignoble art of utilizing its enemies not that anybody was more than vaguely conscious of these sentiments much less attempted to express them in set terms when a policeman appeared there in an inquiring mood what people said among themselves was musha cock him up i hope he'll get his health till i would be tellin him or words to that effect while in reply to his questions they made statements superficially so clear and simple and essentially so bewilderingly involved that the longest experience could do little more for a constable than teach him the futility of wasting his time in attempts to disentangle them thus it was that when mrs kilfoyle saw who Odie's companions were she bade a regretful adieu to her hopes of recovering her stolen property for how could she set him on the tinker's felonious track without apprising them likewise you might as well try to rush one chicken off a rafter and not scare the couple that were huddled beside it the impossibility became more obvious presently as the constables striding quickly down to where the group of women stood in the rain and wind with fluttering shawls and flapping cap borders said briskly good day to you all did any of yous happen to see e'er a one of them tinkering people goin by here this mornin it was a moment of strong temptation to everybody but especially to mrs kilfoyle who had in her mind that vivid picture of her precious cloak receding from her along the wet road recklessly wisped up in the grasp of as thankless a thievin black-hearted slavine as ever stepped and not yet perhaps utterly out of reach though every fleeting instant carried it nearer to that hopeless point however she and her neighbors stood the test unshaken mrs ryan rolled her eyes deliberatively and said to mrs mcgurk the saints bless us was it yesterday or the day before my dear you said you seen a couple of them below near old o'burns and mrs mcgurk replied ah sure not at all ma'am glory be to goodness i couldn't a told you such a thing for i wasn't next or nigh the place would it have been oddie rafferty's aunt she was below there fetchin up a bag of mail and bedad she came home that dreeped the crother you might a thought she'd been after fishin it up out of the bottom of one of them bog holes and mrs kilfoyle heroically hustled her taddy into the house as she saw him on the brink of beginning loudly to relate his encounter with a strange man and desired him to whist and stay where he was in a manner so sternly repressive that he actually remained there as if he had been a pebble dropped into a pool and not as usual a cork to bob up again immediately then mrs mcgurk made a bold stroke designed to shake off the hampering presence of the professionals and enable oddie's amateur services to be utilized while there was yet time i declare she said now that i think of it i seen a fellow crossin the ridge along there a while ago like as if he was comin from salenbeg ways and according to the appearance of him i wouldn't wonder if he was a one of them tinker creatures carryin a big clump of cans he was at any rate i noticed the shine of them and he couldn't have got any great way yet to speak of supposing there was anybody lookin to follow after him but constable black crushed her hopes as he replied ah it's nobody comin from salenbeg that we're anything to say to there's after bein a robbery last night down below at jerry dunn's a shawl as good as new took that his wife's ragin over frantic 
along wid a sight of fowl and other things and the tinkers that was settled this long while in the marine at the back of his haggard is quit out of it afore daylight this morning every rogue of them so we'd have more than a notion where the properties went to if we could tell the road they've took we thought like enough some of them might a come this way now mr jerry dunn was not a popular person in lisconnel where he has even become as we have seen proverbial for what we called old niggerliness for there was a general tendency to say the devil's cure to him and listen complacently to any details their visitors could impart for in his private capacity a policeman provided that he be otherwise a decent lad which to do him justice is commonly the case may join with a few unobtrusive restrictions in our neighborly gossips the rule in fact being free admission except on business only mrs kilfoyle was so much cast down by her misfortune that she could not raise herself to the level of an interest in the affairs of her thrifty suitor and the babble of voices relating and commenting sounded as meaningless as the patter of the drops that jumped like little fishes in the large puddle at their feet it had spread considerably before constable black said to his comrade well daily we'd better be steppin home with ourselves as wise as we come as the man said when he axed his road of the old black horse in the dark lane there's no good goin further for the whole gang of them scattered over the country again now like a seedin thistle in a high wind i be dad said constable daly and be the same token this one a skin a tanned elephant it's only bogged and drenched we'd get look at what's comin up over there that rains snow on the hills every good drop of it i seen ben bawn this mornin as white as the top of a mushroom and it's thick in a wood sleet here this minute and so it is the landscape did indeed frown upon further explorations in quarters where the rain had abated it seemed as if the mists had curdled on the breath of the bitter air and they lay floating in long white bars and reefs low on the track of their own shadow which threw down upon the sombre bogland deeper strains of gloom here and there one caught on the crest of some grey bouldered knoll and was teased into fleecy threads that trailed melting instead of tangling but toward the north the horizon was all blank with one vast smooth slant of slate colour like a penthouse roof which had a sliding motion onwards Ari Rafferty pointed to it and said truth it's teemin powerful this instant up there in the mountains twill be much if you land home afore it's a top of you for it would be the most i could do myself and as the constables departed hastily most people forgot the stolen cloak for a while to wonder whether their friends would escape being entirely drowned on the way back from the fair mrs kilfoyle however still stood in deep dejection at her door and said och but she was a great fool to go let the likes of him set foot within her house to console her mrs o'driscoll said ah sure sorry a fool were you woman dear how would you know the villainy of him and if you'd turn the man away without givin him ever a bit it's bad you'd be thinkin of it all the day after and to improve the occasion for her juniors old mrs keogh added ay and more betoken you had a been committin a sin but mrs kilfoyle replied with much candour deed then i'd a tale liefer me after committin a sin or a dozen sins than to have me poor mother's good clerk thieved away on me and walkin wild about the world as it happened the fate of mrs kilfoyle's cloak was very different from her forecast but i do not think that a knowledge of it would have been consolatory to her by any means if she had heard of it she would probably have said the cross of christ upon us god be good to the misfortunate creature 
for she was not at all of an implacable temper and would under the circumstances have condoned even the injury that obliged her to appear at mass with a flannel petticoat over her head until the end of her days yet she did hold the tinkers in a perhaps somewhat too unqualified reprobation for there are tinkers and tinkers some of them indeed are stout and sturdy thieves veritable birds of prey whose rapacity is continually questing for plunder but some of them have merely the magpies and jackdaws thievish propensity for picking up what lies temptingly in their way and some few are so honest that they pass by as harmlessly as a wedge of high-flying wild duck and i have heard it said that to places like lisconnel their pickings and stealings have at worst never been so serious a matter as those of another flock finer of feather but not less predacious in their habits who roosted for the most part a long way off and made their collections by deputy copyright eighteen ninety five by dodd mead and company walled out from bogland studies and once we were restin a bit in the sun on the smooth hillside where the grass felt warm to your hand as the fleece of a sheep for wide as we looked overhead and around twas all ablaze and a glow and the blue was blinkin up from the blackest bog holes below and the scent of the bog mint was strong on the air and never a sound but the plover's pipe that ye'll seldom miss by a lone bit of ground and he leaned mr pierce on his elbow and stared at the sky as he smoked till just in an idle way he stretched out his hand and stroked the feathers of a wan of the snipe that was kilt and lay close by on the grass and there was the death in the creature's eye like a breath upon glass and says he it's queer to think that a hole ye might bore wid a pin will be wide enough to let such a power of darkness in or such a power of light and it's queer to think says he that one of these days the like is bound to happen to you and me then mr barry he says musha how's one to know but there's light on t other side of the dark as the day comes after the night and och said mr pierce what's more our knowin save the mark than guessin which way the chances run and thinks i they run to the dark or else again now some glint of a beam had come slithered and slid sure light's not easy to hide and what for should it be hid up he stood with a sort of laugh if on light says he you're set let's make the most of this same as it's all that we're like to get thim were his words as i minded well for often afore and since the identical thought it bother me head that seemed to bother him then and many's the time i'd be wonderin whatever it all might mean the sky and the land and the beasts and the rest of them plain as plain and all behind and beyond them a big black shadow let fall ye'll strain the sight out of your eyes but there it stands like a wall and there says i to myself we're goin wherever we go but where we'll be when we get there it's never a no i know then whilst i thought i was maybe a thookin to trouble me mind with strivin to comprehend on natural things of the kind and quality now that have learnin might know the rights o the case but ignorant ones like me had better leave it in place priest to be sure and parson according to what they say the whole mather's plain as a pike staff and clear as the day and to hear them talk of a world beyond ye'd think at the least they'd been dead and buried half their lives and had tramped it from west to east and who's for above and who's for below they're as pat as if they could tell the name of every saint in heaven and every divil in hell 
but cock up the lives of themselves to be settlin' it all to their taste i says and the wife she says i'm no more nor a heathen beast for mighty few of them's real quality musha they're mostly a pack of plebeians each wid a tag to his name and a long black coat to his back and it's only romancin they are be like a man must stick be his trade and they get their livin by lettin on they know how one's soul is made and in chapel or church they're bound to know something for sure good or bad or where'd be the sense o their preachin and prayers and hymns and howlin like mad so who'd go mindin em barrin women in course and wains that believe most aught ye tell em if they don't understand what it means bedad if it weren't the nature of women to want the wit parson and priest i'm a-thinkin might shut up their shop and quit but och it's loss and distracted the creatures ud be without their bitter diversion on sundays when all of them gets about clutherin and plutherin together like hens and a roostin in rows and meetin their friends and the neighbors and wearin their dacent clothes and sure it's queer that the clergy can't ever agree to keep be tellin the same true story since they know such a wonderful heap for many a thing priest tells ye the parson says is a lie and which has a right to be wrong the devil a much know i for all the differ i see twixt the pair of them is fit in a nut one for the union and one for the league and both of them bitter as sot but mr pears that's a gentleman born and has college learnin and all there he was starin no wiser than me with her shadow stands like a wall End of section two This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 3 of Strangers at Lisconnell by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3. Chapter 4. A Good Turn. Along the road to Sallenberg, little seemed to be abroad besides foul weather but there was a great deal of that. The gusts that came flapping wide-winged over the bog met the wayfarer with a furious hurtle and grapple, as if for want of better sport they had concentrated all their forces upon his sole repulse, and the drops they dashed into his blinded eyes and against his benumbed hands were as icy as they could be without ceasing to be wet. Their combined assaults were calculated feelingly to persuade a man of his uninfluential position in the scheme of things. His voice in this matter was so tyrannically howled down, or, if of less philosophic mind, to bring home to him the special disadvantages of going half-starved and clad in thoroughbred tatters. This was the plight of Thady Quinlan as, leaving Lisconnell, soon lapped out of sight behind him amid the grey web of the rain mists he tramped haltingly away with mrs kilfoyle's cloak bundled under his arm and the dread of pursuit on his mind and in his heart a great remorse the object of which you are perhaps guessing wrongly but he had also a hope and a purpose and is therefore not wholly to be pitied although the one did wane until the other looked impossible as mile after mile unrolled its drenched and dreary length without bringing him apparently nearer to his goal all the while however he was slowly gaining upon a traveller who had taken the same road a few hours earlier hopelessly and aimlessly and even more inadequately equipped than he it was his sister judy quinlan 
from whom he had parted on the worst of terms about three o'clock that morning the fact is that the tinker's raid upon jerry dunn's premises although carried out with unusual success had led not at all unusually to complications when it was time to divide the spoil over mrs dunn's second best shawl it was that the difficulty arose mrs dunn despite her husband's thrifty turn owned many shawls few of them inferior enough to be worn at all frequently and she had pinned on this one three times only during the half-dozen years of her proprietress ship so it was certainly bitter bad luck that she should by chance have worn it to confession on friday and got it soaked coming home and hung it up in the passage by the back door to dry slowly instead of to be all cockled into gathers with the heat of the fire blazing on it used to con as she explained with exasperation to ellen rowe her servant girl who had officiously suggested the kitchen hearth for this precaution proved tragically self-defeating and put its object into the very hands of thady quinlan and joe smith when under cover of the wild wet night they forced the feeble lock and made a clean sweep of all portable property that lay within easy reach the shawl formed the most valuable prize it was very admirable indeed being of a dappled fawn colour with an aberesque border of shaded chocolate and amber but in the eyes of its new owners its greatest charm was its weight and thickness judy quinlan declared pinching a fold fondly between a finger and thumb that just the feel of it done your heart good her own shawl was really only a ragged cotton table cover and had as she often remarked no more warmth in it than an old dish clout i should observe to make the situation clear that the tinker's confraternity at this time consisted of thady quinlan and his sister judy and their married sister maggie smith with her husband and his brother and his father and three or four children hence it is obvious that in any dispute which might arise between judy and maggie the latter was likely to have numbers preponderantly upon her side and this was what now actually took place the place being the driest end of the unroofed cabin in dunsboreen where the tinkers had for some time past made their camp the screed of thatch still adhering to the wall sheltered their fire of purloined sods and it burned steadily and strongly between the blasts which made its red flame duck and squeal and sent the white ash flakes fluttering so there was light enough to show how covetous gleams from the sisters eyes flashed together on the shawl of which each held a corner and no great wisdom was needed to forecast a storm mrs smith's shawl was undeniably better than judy's by many degrees but she had not the magnanimity to consider this even so far as to propose that judy should at any rate enjoy the reversion of her own on the contrary she had rapidly planned its division between her two little ragged girls judy for her part had set her heart desperately upon the acquisition and she deemed it her best policy to say in a tone studiously matter of course fay now it's glad enough i'll be to get shut of this old wad that's on me every breath o' wind goes through it as ready as if it was a crevice in a wall fit to freeze you into mortar the very vain device for her sister promptly rejoined with a sarcastic laugh and a tightened grip musha moya how bad you are entirely don't you wish you may which intimated plainly that the shawl was not to be had uncontested at this crisis judy had fully expected to be backed up by thady but he naturally taking a more dispassionate view of the matter recognized with reluctance the futility of pitting himself singly against three opponents two of them better men than he who was no great things at all 
let alone havin' one knee queer. Therefore he turned his back upon the controversy and feigned unconsciousness of it, instead of bouncing up and saying with appropriate action, and I'd like to know who's at all's got a better right to it than herself has. His defection aggrieved her so bitterly that the fiercest of her wrath turned upon him, and after a wrangle wherein all the parties concerned had made liberal use of those acculate and proper words against which the wary bacon warns his quarrelling readers she flounced away into the darkness of the small hours of the stormy december morning loudly avowing her determination never to see a sight of the ugly dirty main-spirited poltroon or open her lips to him as long as she had an eye or a tongue in her head during laughter followed her exit on a skirl of sleet-fledged wind she seethed over her anger for many a long mile to such fierceness was its flame fed by disappointment and more potent jealousy for had not thady the only person she cared much about in all the world turned against her and sided with maggie who was always a greedy grabbing little toad ever since she stood the height of a creepy stool it was an hour or so before daybreak when she sat down to rest under an immense bulging boulder that loomed dimly on her beside the road a little way beyond lisconnel then she began to look backwards and forwards far back to the time when her father kept a little shop in bantry before he was stone broke one bad year and took to carrying the remnant of his stock in trade about in a basket as a higgler which eventually led other members of his family to wander less reputably for their livelihoods she remembered that even in those days that he was always her ally and had lamed himself for life by a fall on the road when running to rescue her from the hutchinson's wicked mastiff who had knocked her down near the gate and was standing over her with a growl and a grin of which she still sometimes dreamed and again she remembered how once she had been laid up for a long while with the fever and had crept out of the union infirmary to find that her relations supposing her dead had all took off with themselves to the states and was keeping like one demented over her desertion outside mcnee's public when what should come familiarly around the corner but daddy himself who had stopped behind foregoing his assisted passage because the devil a foot of him would stir out of it so long as there might be e'er a chance at all of judy coming back whereupon it recurred vividly to her mind how she had just called him among other things a great dirty good-for-nothing hulk of a poltroon and had expressed a hope that she might never again see sign or sight of any such a hideous beast hobblin anywheres on her road to which he had rejoined that she might go to blazes and welcome for anything he had to say again it and that be dad a crosser tempered old weasel of a wizened old witch wouldn't be apt to land there in a hurry at last being very tired she escaped for a while from these fluctuations of wrath and ruth into a nook of sleep but the bitter cold routed her out of it soon after sunrise and she took the road again cramped and numbed in the teeth of the gusty showers that were still stalking over the bogland as she went the hills beyond sullenberg rose up frowning before her through rifts in the cold white fleece trailed and knotted about their front of harsh purple gloom on which the streaks and patches of ravines and fences and fields with here and there a cabin gleaming began by degrees to be traced dimly as if a fragment of the countryside were reflected on the dark thundercloud but she was now thinking more about her journey's end than about anything she saw on the way thither the bleak many-windowed workhouse at moynalone that she well knew must be presently her fate since she had thrown herself on her own resources three halfpence was all she could command for ransom 
from the durance into which self-preservation assuredly would not forbear to betray her experience gave a dreary definiteness to anticipation once again she would morning by morning awaken to the grim whitewashed ward to all the old hardness and roughness of existence with a tyrannous restraint and monotony superadded she said to herself it is true that she might as well be in one place as another since she would not have thady to go along with any more the black-hearted thieving miscreant and if she had as much wit in her as an old water-rat she'd just creep away into some dry ditch and be done with the whole of it still as she did come short of that wisdom the alternative continued to lie across her path a murky shadow which she could by no means evade nor disperse the invisible sun was low when judy came to a place where the road forks sending one branch to creep across the level bogland towards solenbeg and one to climb up among the first tilted slopes of the mountains here the rosebride river comes jostling its way down a rocky ravine spanned at the mouth by a bridge past which the swift brown streams dart along in a more spacious and smoother channel bound by rose bride bay judy stood for a while and looked down over the parapet at the swirls of creamy foam that swept under the arch then she took out of her pocket a battered looking heel of a loaf began to munch it but before she had half finished it she tossed the crust away into the river being too heart-sick to go on eating once the rage of hunger was subdued she wished sincerely that she dared fling herself after it but she was far too much cowed by cold and weariness to muster the courage for such a resolve perhaps there was not under irish skies that december day a more miserable woman than judy quinlan as she stood all alone in the world on rosebride bridge while a black mountain rampart lifted itself slowly against the shrouded west and the dusk thickened on the long shelterless road whence eager blasts whistled a summons to her nearer and nearer till they fluttered her legs and keened about her ears and chilled her to the bone suddenly something heavy and soft seemed to grasp her by the shoulders and thence fall around her in long wide folds covering her from head to foot much as if a small tent had been blown down on her of course she screamed shrilly and almost in the same breath she saw that thady was at her elbow he had for some little time been stalking her warily with the great coat expanded ready to throw over her and having done so was now holding it on with a rough hug the joy with which he had at last caught sight of the forlorn bedraggled figure had overflowed irrepressibly into this joke and its successful accomplishment put the finishing touch to his happiness as for judy if the sun had leaped up again in a fiery flurry till the hills and the plain and the river were all flooded with flushed light gleaming and glowing it would have but dimly symbolized the transfiguration of her world in the twinkling of an eye her stark despair was changed into rapturous relief a miracle which just at first made the marvellous cloak seem almost a matter of course any good thing might naturally be expected to befall her since thady was not estranged and lost to her after all whether now and is it yourself come streelin' along she said you tuck your time be dad i'm here this half hour sure i stop till i would get a trifle of things together said thady and what do you call that for an old flittijig it's not too bad said judy stroking down the cape with caressing fingers a grand weight there is in it to be sure but where at all did you come by it you're not after getting it off them thieving rapscallions of smith's anyway them or the likes of them sure not at all said thady loftily twas in a house way down below there at lisconnel 
a young woman bid me step in to eat a potato, and tellin' you the truth, I'd no fancy to be delayin', for I'd a mistrust in me mind that the police was following. The notion I had was to ax her had she seen you goin' by, only I wasn't wishful to be lettin' on I was anything to you, in case they come along, so I thought she might be chance past the remark herself, but out she ran, and the first thing I noticed was this consarn lion convenient to me hand in the windy, and wid that I whipped it up and made off. For anything I could tell, I might have met me fine gentleman full tilt at the door, and be gone it's as heavy to carry as a pair of fat geese. However, I knew it's distressed you were entirely for the want of such a thing, and me jabbers, you've got it now. Troth have I, said Judy, delightedly groping her way about her new garment. Real decent it was of you to be bringing it to me, for perished and lost I did be and that's no lie och but it's the grand one look at the hood there is to it sure it's as good as a little house of your own you might be out under buckets of wet in it and ne'er a tint you'd get whatever ay or for that matter taking a roll through the river there and sorry the harm it'd do you wit that on said daddy with pride but we'd better be quittin out of this he added with a shrug and a shiver for the wind's terrible and there's a shower comin' up on us yonder as thick as thatch. I was thinkin' you'd maybe had trampin' enough for this day. Twill be as dark presently as the inside of a cow, and we'd see daylight again before we come to Mon alone. So we might put the night over under the old bridge. There's a good dry strip along one side of it, and the way the rain's drivin', we'd get a grand shelter. Judy readily agreed, and they descended the little stony footpath that led down to the river. Beneath the arch, where Thaddy's booted steps reverberated hollowly, they found, as he had said, a broadish strip of dry ground, for the bridge had allowed the stream ample measure in its stride. The little platform was bordered by a scattering of stones and boulders, amongst which the shallow water gurgled. It seemed to Thaddy and Judy that their quarters would be very tolerable, but they soon made a discovery which promised luxury indeed. This was a dead branch which lay at one end of the arch, having evidently been floated down the current and perhaps hauled out of the water by some thrifty body who, however, had made no further use of it. Long ago that must have been, for it was dried and bleached till it glimmered through the dusk like an intricate white skeleton. Better fuel no one could desire. Daddy made for it at once with knife and matchbox, and in a few minutes crackling flames were crunching up the twigs and gnawing at a log. The red light washed flickering over the wet walls and was caught on the glancing of the water as it fled by, rapid and dark. Blue smoke trailed up lazily against the frame of the arch, blurring gleams of tossed foam as it melted out into the mist. But a fire naturally suggested food, and Judy said ruefully after feeling in her empty pocket, It starved with the hunger you'll be, Thaddy, and a sort of a taste of anything have I in the world. Deed now, if I'd only known the way it'd be, and I passed them houses below in the boreen a while ago, I seen where there was a big cake of griddle bread coolin' itself, leaned again the windy ledge, and man or mortal near it. I might a reached it down as easy as puttin' me foot to the ground, but sure I was that knocked about with one thing and another. I thought I wouldn't be bothered with it, so I just left it what it was. I did so. May God forgive me, she said with unfeigned contrition. Thaddy, however, did not seem to share her regrets. He was lifting his cluster of cans off his shoulder and extracting from them a bundle tied up in a red handkerchief. "'Is it starved you'd have us?' he said as he untied the first corner. "'Starved? How are you?' and he continued to repeat. "'Is it starving?' she said, while he was undoing the several knots. When they were all unfastened, the handkerchief was seen to hold a number of eggs and a fair supply of broken bread. 
that he might well scout the possibility of famishing. "'That's something like,' he said as he saw Judy surveying his stores, "'and I've a shillin' somewhere besides.' "'Glory be,' said Judy, looking as if she could scarcely realize a world with which there was so much beforehand. "'And we'll be giving them a boil in one of the little saucepans,' said Thady. "'Raw eggs do be ugly cold brashes, and we've plenty of water handy. Lashins and lavins of drink running on tap there, so to speak.' Supper was accordingly prepared on these simple lines with much success. They boiled many eggs and ate them using their scraps of bread for plates, an expedient not unknown at far earlier banquets, and they scooped up water to drink out of the palms of their hands, also in an old-fashioned manner. But when they had finished, that he gave a comparatively modern touch to the entertainment by lighting his pipe. He occupied the nearest place to the fire, in consideration for the scarecrow-like raggedness of his garments, which now began to weigh upon Judy's mind amid the comfort of her magnificent wrap. "'Froze stiff you'll be in them outer tatters, man alive,' she said despondently. "'Sure, you might as well be slinging yourself round with the old wisps of spiders' webs up over your head for any substance there is in them. I wonder now, could I contrive to reeve the top cape off of this twould be as good that way as a cloak a piece for the two of us thady however said decidedly blathers not at all is it destroying it you'd be after i'm plenty warm enough and he rolled the big red handkerchief which had held the eggs in many folds about his neck tucking it down under his coat collar all around there was a surprise in hate in it, he said. By this time the dusk far and near had gloomed into darkness. The black beetle had scared away the grey moth. As Thaddy and Judy sat with their backs to the curving wall, they caught only fitful glimpses of the opposite one, when any long-fronded flickers of the firelight waved across and touched it. More often they fell short and made quivering circles shine, where they struck the broken water in the midstream. Without, beyond either arch, nothing was distinguishable except glimmers of white foam shaken and tossing. On the left, looking up the river, it seemed as if many spectral hands, borne nearer and nearer, came waving and beckoning out of the night to pass by and away down the river, still beckoning and waving, carried further and further, on into the night again. Every now and then a waft of the wind sighed in on them along with the river, puffing about the flame and smoke, and blowing ice cold in their faces. When it had passed, that he always inquired, Is it warm at all, Jude? And she always answered, drawing its folds together with ostentatious satisfaction, Och, scaldin! But between the whiles there was little conversation to interrupt the monologue of the river, which seemed to find itself many voices under the bridge. The one unceasing rustle of the main stream was frayed along its margin into a myriad finer noises of murmuring and plashing, as the massed foliage on a bough dwindles at its edges into more delicate traceries of distinct sprays and leaves. Round some stones the water whispered mysteriously, coiling in and out of gurgling recesses, and against others it broke with a clear, chiming tinkle, as if elfin anvils rang. Here it droned on with a bee's hum soft and steady, and here it chuckled and chirped, bubbling up in sudden little rapids and cascades. At Judy's feet was a thin, flat stone which rested loosely on the top of another, and flap, flapped, bobbing up and down as the ripples rose and fell. Sitting idle in the firelight, warmed and fed to unwanted contentment, Judy watched it half drowsily for a while. Presently, she said, that's the very way the lid of our old kettle would be going at home when it was on the boil, and be poor mother 
bid us keep an eye on it, like enough to keep us out of devilment. Och, but that was a cosy little room of a cold night. Do you mind it, Thaddy? Aye, sure, said Thaddy, but it's one while ago. It is that, a matter of thirty year and more, anyway, since we owned the little shop. Sure now I remember a day they shut it up and put us out of it, as plain as if it was only this morning. Grand, we that was childer thought it, because of somebody's given us the end of an old jar of sweets out of the windy to pacify us. Bedad, the fightin' we had over it was fit to have raised the town. But I grabbed meself a biggish lump of peppermint twist, and would be slinkin' behind me mother to finish it, and she talkin' at the door to old Mrs. McClanagan, and I heard her sayin' her heart was broke, so I got wonderin' to myself if the reason was maybe that we'd ate it all on her. Och, but it's the queer foolishness people does be rememberin'. Be like the reason of that is because it's a plenty as anything else with them, said Daddy cynically, or maybe a trifle plentier. Sure he was only brats them time, says Judy apologetically. For anything we could tell, we might as well be streelin' about under the width of the sky like a string of wild duck as stoppin' at home with a roof over our misfortunate heads. Old Mrs. McClanagan next door had a cloak the same pattern as this, Judy continued, selecting her memories with better judgment, but twas all tatters at the bottom not worth a bawby to me and Thady said with interest, Had she now? And as for me old shawl, Judy went on, it's been a scandal and a caution this last three or four year, droppin' in bits it is, and small blame to it. I wish I had a penny for every mile I've tramped in it. Do you remember the joke me mother had about its being a contrary thing, that people travellin' would always begin a mile at the wrong end? She'd be talkin' that way to hearten up me father but as often as not he'd only let her roar at her to wisht. He was that discouraged. Twas a great wish he had, poor man, to get her back settled in a little place of her own before he was took, but twas in the big barracks of a union at Monaghan. Well, it's all one to the two of them now anyway, said Daddy, finding that Judy's reminiscences of their family history did not tend to enliven his meditations over his pipe. Ah, sure, everything will be all one to the whole of us, please God, one of these days, said Judy, who in her present mood could not easily have realized the keen contentions and scorching jealousies of the night before. And when we get done with the trampin', twill make little enough differ whether it's one mile we went or twenty hundred, only I'd liefer than a good deal them two had had better luck with it all cruel put about they were many a time and wantin the bit to keep the life in them and it just fretted out of them in the end i'm thinkin the thought of it comes again a body when one's sittin warm and snug judy said gazing remorsefully around her shadowy gusty lodging and then into the flames lighting up a bare earth patch and down at the dark folds that fell about her as she crouched on it she seemed sunk into reverie, but after a while she looked up and said without apparent relevance, Heaven be her bed this night, the creature, that are you heathen. We'd a right to be saying the rosary before we get too stupid altogether. The eyes of you are dropping into your head with sleep this minute. And me just after lighting me pipe, remonstrated Thaddy. Ah, then hurry up and finish it, said Judy betraying by this injunction an invincible ignorance touching a man's sentiment towards his last screw of tobacco. Or else I'll be off sound. It's the fine warmth makes me sleepy. Sure with this on me, Sarah, a breath of cold gets next or nigh me to be keeping me awake. Och, then, wait till it's out, said Thaddy. I will so, said Judy. Sling another stick on the fire, lad. That way you won't be perished sitting there in them woeful old rags. I've plenty of prayers I might be saying till you're ready. But in a little while Thaddy, lingering over his pipe, became aware somewhat to his relief that she had gone fast asleep, muffled up to the chin in her cloak, with her head leaning back against the stone wall. 
he sat and looked at her for some moments with an expression partly complacent and partly compunctious bedad now the creature was bein perished alive before i brought that to her he said to himself very apt she was to be gettin her death twas great luck i had in hiry to pick it up it's the hard life the likes of her has whatever trampin round ay glory be to god twas the best good turn ever i done her just at the time when thady the tinker was making these reflections while the firelight flickered and the waters fleeted under rose bride bridge some mile or so higher up the stream where the long mountain slopes are folded closer and steeper about it a great turmoil had arisen in a deep hollow among walls of bare rock down one face of these a huge glistening slab the river had for certain thousands of years been taking a foamy leap but to-night it happened that the rains beating for many days on the mountains had eaten away the clay setting which cemented a ponderous lump of rock into a niche immediately over the fall and the mass had now crashed down into the channel on the very verge blocking all the waterway this however was a door hard to keep shut when every affluent rill and runnel out on the broad mountain shoulders went darting swift and white so that every minute swelled the forces gathering pent in the barred passage as the bridled torrent seethed and climbed hissing behind that barrier the great stone tottered and swayed and before the first foam crest could overpeer it yielded to the weight of waters leaned against it and rocks and flood thunderously roaring rushed down together the sound of it doled into a moan came through rosebride bridge and thady who had grown very drowsy thought to himself that the wind was getting up and that they couldn't have done better than stop where they were instead of to be setting off tramping on such a dirty wild night god knew where they might have to go to the flood that broke away with wave tumbled over wave out of the whirling pool had not far to race down its stony stairs before it reached a place with a turbulent floor where the white mouths of other two streams foamed into it through rock rifts loud-throated on either hand thenceforward the water which had threaded the large boulders in heavy strands coiled like monstrous braids of snaky locks rose up and drew together above their tallest heads into a single obliterating fold as it slid on smoothly with only now and then a quiver puckering its surface as if it had rolled over some live creature that writhed its mounded solidity made its rapid motion look strange and terrible where circles of thin froth swam round on it slowly it was as black and white as a bit of the bog in a snowstorm or under the drift of summer daisies at the turn of the ravine's last winding above the bridge it plucked away as it passed a small company of fir trees that long had dropped their cones and needles into the river from a coin of vantage on a jutting crag and a minute after anybody who had looked up from beneath the arch would have seen the glimmering points of foam extinguishing like lights further and nearer lost amid the shadowy on sweeping of something that set all the darkness astir as if it were one vast wing unfurling and then for a moment in the narrow space lit by the fading fire he would have known that he was cut off from the world by chaos which poised towards him a formless surging front and stooped and fell but as it happened nobody was keeping a watch there what wakened thady was the clang of his cluster of tinware which the wave dashed against the wall behind him but before he knew this it had gathered him up and swung him across with it over to the other side of the arch then he caught hold of a twisted ivy tod and a bough of mountain ash whence he dropped on the bank and crawled up out of reach 
commenting in forcible language upon the occurrence by which he was still astoundedly bewildered judy who was aroused in like manner had her chance too for a branch of the same tree crooked a friendly arm towards her as she was borne past and she would have grasped it only that the weight of her heavy cloth cloak dragged her down so that instead of returning to dry land for many a long day's tramp she went out to sea in company with sundry wretched off boughs and mats of heather and bundles of wither bracken and other such waifs and strays none of which were ever again heard tidings of any more than they were inquired after in the lonely places they had left only for some stormy days the wrecked and sodden banks of the rosebride bridge were haunted by a forlorn-looking object of a lame tramp who sought vainly what his despair hoped to find as he roamed about in it he had just one spell of consolation which he was often muttering over to himself it was something he called the best turn anyway i ever done the creature in her life little enough god knows little enough but the best good turn chapter five forecasts when mrs joyce used in her last days to predict regretfully that her youngest daughter would never marry she said a bold word for at this time still theresa's years fell short of twenty and she was generally recognized as the prettiest girl to be seen at mass in the small ugly chapel down beyond near ballybrosna some people it is true said that she was just a fairy of a creature and too little for anything and she was no doubt diminutive in size nor had she any brilliancy of colouring to make amends in a hummingbird's fashion for the insignificance of her proportions resembling rather with her dark eyes and hair one of those filmy white blossoms which look the paler and frailer for their knots of ebon stamens or the delicate moth who shows fine black pencilings among its pearly down still nobody denied that she had an uncommon pretty face of her own and the neighbors moreover always found her pleasant and friendly and gay enough when they found her at all but they remarked among themselves that one seldom seen e'er a sight of theresa joyce these times anywheres about they supposed she was took up with lookin after her mother who wasn't gettin her health over well this good while back i think myself that theresa's invisibility could be only in part accounted for thus as the explanation does not cover the fact that to slip the wrong side of the dyke or turn aside among the screening hillocks and hollows when she noticed the approach of her acquaintances was the course she always adopted if she could achieve it without hurting anybody's feelings theresa much disliked doing this as a rule though she broke it on one occasion in a way that surprised and puzzled those who knew her best but whether mrs joyce forecast the future rightly or wrongly she had certainly an erroneous impression on her mind when as often happened she wound up her disconsolate musings by saying resentfully at the back of me hand to some i could name if she had proceeded to do so she would probably have mentioned persons who had done nothing to bring about the result she was deploring and she never thought of connecting it with the events which had accompanied oddy rafferty's flitting from the three-mile farm more than a twelve-month before dennis o'meara came to the place until oddy took up his abode at lisconnel he had always lived with his father who farmed a remote bit of land out towards loch glenglass it was a holding which had been wrested from the grip of a surrounding bog by earlier generations of rafferty's who were a strenuous race but in oddy rafferty's time their energies had taken a turn not conducive to reclamation or even to the maintenance of what was already won all oddy's many elder brethren sisters there were none had run wild and ended by running it so far afield that the narrow whitewashed house 
lonesome and bleak saw them no more its mistress also died failing perhaps other means of exit running wild being in her case impracticable and finding life impossibly dreary without ned the least good for of her sons and the household was thus reduced to old michael rafferty and his aunt and little oddy these domestic changes in conjunction with other untoward chances sadly hindered farming operations and nature made prompt use of the pause season by season the patch of tilled ground seemed to shrink at the wish of the greedy black land that girdled it about the outlying fields grew first garish with golden ragweed and scarlet poppies and then dull green again with brown knotted rushes and sombre sedge and all other marish growths until the re-annexation was complete and they once more were homogeneous part and parcel of the conquering bog old michael used to trudge heavily round his dwindling territories which were haunted by memories of better days there had been a time when they actually kept a pair of plough horses i believe that he would have fretted his heart out much sooner than he did if it had not been for oddy his only remaining son whose equals his aunt moggy sometimes remarked rather bitterly he conceded you wouldn't find plentier in the world than an apple sitting on a slow bush as the boy grew up the old man's pride and pleasure in him was tempered by apprehensions lest he should take off with himself like the other lads however oddy never did this nor anything worse than wax somewhat overconfident and self-opinionated and a year or so before his father's death he became associated with felix o'beirne in the management of an illicit still off away in the bog which gave him an object in life and had a sobering and settling effect upon him he was not more than twenty when his father suddenly died one early spring morning and he found himself left responsible for a few acres well cropped with weeds and sundry arrears of rent to be extracted from their produce whereupon he resolved to abandon the struggle and set up a less ambitious footing in one of the cabins at lisconnel so he got ready for the move by selling off his little bit of livestock all except rory the old black pony who had a very large head and a white face like a grotesque mask and with whom he would not have parted on the most tempting terms as for his great aunt moggy when she heard of this arrangement she resigned herself to her fate which was obviously the union away at moynalone what else should become of her since she was past field work and nobody could expect oddy now to be bothered with keeping her idle and he with scarce a penny to his name after settling with mr nugent oddy she reflected didn't mind a thraneen what way he had things in the house and didn't care to be keeping fowls so what good would he get out of her at all moggy was a dull and rather cross-tempered old person who had grown up in souring shade and never had a life of her own to live nor yet a faculty for slipping smoothly into other people's her slight intercourse with oddy had hitherto chiefly consisted of quarrels in fact only the day before his father's death they had fallen out abusively about the broiling of some bacon and this seemed to make her destination all the more inevitable therefore moggy likewise set about her few dismal preparations oppressed by a stunned sense that the black hour she had been dreading most of her life was now just going to strike on the morning of the day oddy was to flit she held a sort of carouse at her solitary breakfast over the remnant of a pound of tea which she had saved after the wake tea was ten prices fifty years ago and a very rare luxury at the three-mile farm as she poured it strong and black out of the badly broken teapot the whole one being packed up she thought that was the last time she'd ever have the chance again in the world to be wetting 
herself a cup of tea, and she thickened it recklessly with lumps of damp brown sugar, and swung it round in her cracked saucer to cool, and tried hard to enjoy it. She was still lingering over it when Adi came into the kitchen, which caused her, poor soul, instinctively to thrust away the betraying teapot out of sight on the black hob. "'What way was you intending to go, then, aunt?' said Adi. "'To moin alone,' she said, turning to face her future with a deep sinking of heart. "'Sure I suppose it's trappin' over I'll be.' "'And I wonder how long you think to be doin' it,' said Adi. "'A matter of ten mile?' "'Where's the hurry at all, supposin?' said his aunt, desperately. "'Blathers,' said Adi, "'there's room in the cart waitin' ready. "'You'd be better bundlin' yourself into it than to be sittin' here all the mornin' delayin' us. "'Deed, then, beggars drive as cheap as they walk, "'and I might as well be gettin' the lift as far as you can take me.' "'The old white-faced pony preferred to pay slowly on the long bog road, "'and as Adi always respected his whims, "'the journey barely ended with the March daylight. "'The old sad-visaged woman,' sat all the while under her muffling shawl in silent apathy undisturbed and as during the latter stages of the drive a blinking drowsiness cooperated with her want of interest in the scenes through which she jogged she naturally looked around her in bewilderment when roused by the jerk of the stopping cart she expected to find herself in the streets of moyne alone drawn up probably at the door of the big union workhouse but instead of its long rows of casements staring down blankly on her, she saw only the one mole's eye window of a tiny whitewashed cabin peering at her from beneath its thatched eaves, and all about it the great lonely bog spreading away with never a trace of any town. Och, we're a through man. What are you after doing on me? she said, beginning to bewail herself querulously. "'Sure you haven't brought me to any place at all. "'Every hour of the black night it'll be a forever I'll get there now, "'and the union will be shut, and what's to become of me then I don't know. "'You'd a right to have told me.' "'Blathers,' said her nephew, "'get down out of that wit here yawpin. "'Do you want the folk here to think you're a sack full of old hens? "'I'm going to be seeing about a bit of fire. "'It's late enough to be sure.' "'What fool's talk have you about the Union, and bad luck to it? "'You'll find a thing for supper in the inside of the old churn, Union Moya. "'And old Moggy, alighting with cramped limbs, entered her home at Lisconnel, "'feeling blissfully as if she had been unpacked out of the most horrible nightmare. "'Adi was probably actuated by several unassorted motives in dealing thus with his superfluous old great-aunt.' pride and pity and perversity and generosity all had no doubt some influence upon his conduct while long use and want had unawares given her the same sort of hold upon his affections that was possessed in a much higher degree by rory the pony whose humours were of course easier to put up with than human foibles but the old woman measured his magnanimity by the immensity of the benefit which it had conferred upon her, and with a strong revulsion of feeling she formed an opinion of his virtues and talents as exalted quite as that which she had often secretly jibed at in his father. Accordingly she sang his praises unweariedly among their new neighbours, and, as Adi was vain enough not to dislike the echoes which reached him, he soon began to look upon her with more complacency, so that they agreed much better than heretofore. She found no small solace, too, after her long, cronyless isolation up at the three-mile farm, in the company of Mrs. Joyce and Mrs. Kehoe and the other Lisconnel dames. In short, a kind of Indian summer of content seemed to be setting in for her moggy's mind however was of the self-tormenting type and soon devised means of marring it they took the form of apprehensions that Ari would presently get married and that thereupon the wife would put her out of it if she had only known Ari was at this time 
as for many years ensuing far too much taken up with himself and rory and the little concern away in the bog to entertain any such project but as it was she felt that the event with all its direful consequences perpetually hung over her and might at any moment bring her new prosperity to a miserable end her impending great niece-in-law was a vaguely appalling spectre who threatened to take the roof from over her head and the bit out of her mouth and turn her adrift to founder hopelessly at the workhouse doorsteps but it was not until more than a year after their settlement at lisconnel that she endued her bogey with one definite form by making up her mind that Ody was thinking of Theresa Joyce. Her reason was that she had one fine evening seen him carrying Theresa's water-pail for her down the hill, an ordinary act of courtesy enough, but the sight of which suddenly darkened the world before her foolish old eyes more dismally than if the golden fleece of the summer sunset had been smothered under the blackest pall ever woven in cloud looms fine colloguin they're having together she said to herself as she watched them and their long shadows down the slope and he sloppin the half of it over the edge instead of mindin what he's doin it's throwin me out on the side of the road she'll be in reality theresa was wondering why they would be a queer black sediment like in the water on some days and not on others and Oddy was explaining the phenomenon confidently and erroneously on an extemporized theory of his own but to old moggy's fears it seemed quite possible that they might be fixing the wedding day for theresa joyce herself she had no manner of misliking at all considering her to be a very decent pleasant spoken little girl but mrs Oddy rafferty seemed none the less certain to evict her without remorse and Oddy's aunt retired to rest that night in a despondent mood it was just about this time that Dennis O'Meara came to stay at Lisconnel on sick leave. The O'Meara's lived in one of the three cabins which used to stand near the O'Burn's forge, but which the great famine and fever year left tenantless for ever after. Their household consisted of the two infirm old people with their melancholy middle-aged son Tim and their sickly grandson little joe egan who was dennis's cousin now dennis had been wounded in a battle somewhere out in india and had been promoted sergeant and he but a young boy o so to speak and owned four medals and stood six foot three in his stockings and was as fine a figure of a man as you could wish to see let alone his gorgeous scarlet uniform which was a sight to behold so if he was not a hero get me one as we say in lisconnel but lisconnel was quite satisfied with him in that worshipful character and found it very easy to adopt the appropriate attitude towards him for dennis was good-natured and cheerful and never conceited at all nor vain when there was anything more to the purpose for him to be qualities which have an irresistible fascination in distinguished personages and make their followers duty a pleasure it was wonderful how his sojourn enlivened everybody even his mournful little old grandmother whose gratification expressed itself chiefly in regrets that his poor father and mother had not lived to see the elegant man he'd grown when she said this to the younger matrons of lisconnel they thought that the creature's fate was commiserable indeed and earnestly hoped that they themselves would be spared please god to witness the splendid careers that lay before their own dennises at present playing among the puddles but the older ones had to content themselves with the knowledge that if they had only just so happened to get the same chances their own lads would have done the very same things a fact which seemed to give them a sort of hypothetical proprietorship in dennis's glory his presence brightened up society as a tall poppy brightens up all a sombre potato plot and his conversation brought strange lands and extraordinary events within one remove a single pair of eyes and ears of everybody's experience 
for many years after the summer we had Dennis O'Meara up here, made a vivid time mark in our annals, and I fancy that the stories of some of his exploits, with their outlines looming large through a mythical mistiness, still float in our atmosphere. There is at least one legend relating how a soldier out in the east cut off a mad elephant's head at a stroke of his sabre, with the hero of which Dennis O'Meara could probably be identified. Altogether he was so exceptionally brilliant a figure, both in himself and in his fortunes, that the interest which he excited had no element of envy in it, as might have been the case had emulation seemed less utterly beyond everybody's reach. Next to his cousin, Joe Egan, a stunted, starved-looking sprisson of a lad, perhaps the most appreciative of his admirers, was Big Hugh McInerney, whom people were apt to call an Omadon. He also was, comparatively speaking, a stranger at Lisconnel, having come there only that spring to give General Driscoll a hand with the building of his mud cabin, after which he stayed about doing what odd jobs offered at that slack season of the year. Now and then he tramped on distillery business for Felix O'Byrne, and generally acquitted himself in a manner which appeared worthy of contempt to young Audie Rafferty, who was his companion on these expeditions. Audie expressed his opinion in unqualified terms, saying, "'Sure it'd disgust you to see him moonin' along like an old donkey strayed out of a fair.' But his senior partner, rather to his annoyance, persisted in replying, "'But mind you, the chap's no fool.' He had nobody belonging to him at Ballybrosna whence he came, and some people said that he had been a workhouse child. At the time of Dennis O'Meara's arrival, he was darning the widow Joyce's thatch for her, and not killing himself ever the job, as people said, when they reckoned how many days he had been visible crawling about on the top of her little house, a conspicuous position in which he looked, Mrs. Con Ryan remarked, a queerer great gawk than he did on dry land. He was occupied thus on the first afternoon that Dennis walked up there with some of the other lads, and while they talked to Mrs. Joyce and Teresa underneath, the thatcher took a leisurely and critical survey of the scarlet and golden newcomer, from his wonderfully polished boots to his sleek dark head and fierce moustache. The verdict he pronounced to himself with unfeigned satisfaction was, grandeur's no name for him. You himself, of large and lumbering frame, had a shag of reddish flaxen hair, which made thatch-like eaves above his small, light blue eyes and high, burnt brick-colored cheekbones. He wore whitey-brown rags. After the rest had gone on and in, he slithered down to the ground and told Teresa, who was still standing by the door, that she didn't look the size of a bit of a ladybird beside the soldier fellow. If anybody else had made this personal remark, Teresa might have been a little hurt by it, as she wished herself to be of more imposing stature. But sure nobody minded poor Hugh McInerney. At any rate, she said, "'Aye, he's a terrible big man, isn't he?' apt to knock the head off himself he'd be if he was offerin to come in at our door this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks section four of strangers at lisconnel by jane barlow this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 4 At the time of Dennis O'Meara's arrival, he was darning the widow Joyce's thatch for her, and not killing himself over the job, as people said, when they reckoned how many days he had been visible crawling about on top of her little house, a conspicuous position in which he looked. Mrs. Conryan remarked, 
a queerer great gawk than he did on dry land he was occupied thus on the first afternoon that dennis walked up there with some of the other lads and while they talked to mrs joyce and teresa underneath the thatcher took a leisurely and critical survey of the scarlet and golden newcomer from his wonderfully polished boots to his sleek dark head and fierce moustache the verdict he pronounced to himself with unfeigned satisfaction was grandeur's no name for him you himself of large and lumbering frame had a shag of reddish flaxen hair which made thatch-like eaves above his small light blue eyes and high burnt brick-colored cheekbones he wore whitey brown rags after the rest had gone on and in he slithered down to the ground and told teresa who was still standing by the door that she didn't look the size of a bit of a ladybird beside the soldier fellow if anybody else had made this personal remark teresa might have been a little hurt by it as she wished herself of more imposing stature but sure nobody minded poor hugh mcinerney at any rate she said ay he's a terrible big man isn't he apt to knock the head off himself he'd be if he was offerin to come in at our door however on the next day dennis contrived to accomplish that feat without any such accident when he called in at the joyce's to ask was his grandmother there which she was not nor indeed likely to be failing to find the old woman he postponed his quest for the present and stayed talking to teresa who as it happened was at home and then he stopped again outside to help hugh mcinerney by handing him up some rolls of green-sodded scraws and slippery bundles of rushes his long reach made him serviceable here though his left arm was still partially disabled by the sabre cut that had invalided him the gleam of the red coat at the joyce's door had apparently as fascinating an effect upon lisconnel as if the place had been inherited by a population that bellowed and gobbled its greetings instead of saying how's yourself lad and it's a grand day thank god as it came sauntering up dispersedly from various quarters before many minutes had passed quite a numerous group were collected for in these long midsummer days there is little to be done up here except save the turf a business which fine weather makes short work of in the weeks before the potato digging employment becomes as scarce as the potatoes themselves and the hours hang limp and flaccid between the meals which punctuate them with a plate full of coarse-grained gruel therefore to christie sheridan and terence kilfoyle with half a dozen of their neighbors the sight of their distinguished visitor was an oasis in a very arid desert and they made towards it thirstily by and by the group drifted away from the road before the joyce's house into the rough sward behind it rather literally drifted as the cause of the move was the wind a strong soft west wind which had been blowing over the bog all the morning in great wide gusts they seemed to lean hard against whatever they met and made standing still an effort and devastated conversation by carrying off important fragments of it uncaught no matter how loudly one bawled but the big boulders and furze clumps strewn about in a slight depression close by offered seats and shelter opportunely so amongst them presently appeared dennis o'meara's scarlet tunic and teresa joyce's brown striped shawl and mrs ryan's white frilled flapping cap which she said was being fluttered to destruction off her old head and hugh mcinerney's many rifted cowbeen for he declared that until the flurry of the blast went down a bit you might as well be letting on to thatch the sails whirling of a windmill and the rest of the company following suit might be described in terms of their attire as for the most part sad coloured and dilapidated it was just such a gathering as may be sitting to sun themselves at lisconnel this day 
if it happens to be a fine summer one, but with a touch of brilliance, both for eye and ear, added by the young soldier's presence. They had, however, but fitful gleams to bask in, for the sky was all feathered over with little silver-white plumes, which the wind kept ruffling by so fast that the light flickered in and out continually, as if it had come through a canopy of large, slowly waving leaves. Still they gossiped beneath it with much satisfaction, and catechized Dennis about his adventures, and told him all the news of the countryside and there seemed to be no particular reason why they should not go on doing so indefinitely. But in the end broke up the assembly was a slight mishap that befell Theresa Joyce. It cannot be denied that Theresa was rather vain about her long black hair, which she had only of late begun to put up in thick silken coils. Her mother said you had to take your two hands to a one of them, like as if you were twisting a big sagon that is a hay-rope, and they looked almost too heavy for her small head, no matter how closely they were wound about it. A rippling wave, moreover, ran through these tresses, which were exceedingly soft and fine, so her vanity was perhaps excusable. At any rate, it led her to fashion herself a small knot of cherry-coloured ribbon made of a bit that had trimmed the sleeve of her mother's purple merino gown it was a very small knot because most of the bit had gone mildewed lying up there before theresa grew to concern herself about such things but it looked as bright in her hair as a ruddy berry on a dark foliaged creeper and she wore it with a pleasure which was destined to be brief for as she sat knitting with the quietly creeping fingers of an expert in that art, a vagrant gust maliciously whisked off her little gaud, and tossing it contumeliously on the ground as if it were not worth carrying, began to puff it along, skimming over the heather and tussocks. Dennis O'Meara all but rescued it for her, only that Hugh McInerney, the Omadon, starting forward at the same time blundered up against him and tumbled with him into a furze bush and before they picked themselves up the cherry-coloured knot had met its fate in the shape of ryan's black-and-white kid she was tethered close by and had been apparently absorbed in scratching her forehead with her left hind foot in a way that said much for the limberness of her youthful joints but as the bit of ribbon flirted past her she made a rapid snatch and swallowed it in a gulp mrs ryan stood dismayed at possible serious consequences to the kid and theresa at the certain loss of her scrap of finery and everybody else was saying to hugh mcinerney och you great omadon why couldn't you keep yourself easy he had it safe enough only for you getting under his feet everybody that is except dennis o'meara who said sure now the both of us wasn't mindin' rightly where we was chargin' to and the reason of that belike was the neither of us thinkin' so much of what was runnin' after as of who we was runnin' for and small blame to us bedad but hugh's self-esteem was not restored by the good-natured excuse truth it is i'd a right to had stead quiet for the only notion i had was puttin' meself forward to be gettin' a hold of it before any of the others and he walked off crestfallen to resume his perch on the thatch as for theresa she ignored dennis's pretty speech and said deed now she remembered her mother had bid her step up and see what way audie rafferty's aunt was that morning and she too withdrew from the group to make this visit of inquiry as she passed on her way under the place where you was thatching he dropped a small handful of rushes on her head to call her attention and when she looked up she saw his red brick hued face in a wild tow-coloured halo peering down at her from over the eaves i am sorry i lost it on you he said ah no matter about it it wasn't your fault more than another's said teresa 
you'd a had it now said you if it wasn't for the little goat gettin the chance to eat it while himself was tumblin over me but i'd a lief have your hair the way it is now it is the blackest ever i seen one might think you'd gather it out of the middles of them red poppies there stick a couple of them in it if you want anything but to my mind it's better without only if you the fancy to be trying the bit of red string through it i'm sorry it was eight hugh's head drew back and disappeared from her view but next moment she heard him saying mournfully what am i after doing putting me foot that far down a hole it's cost fast between a couple of rafters firm it is begorra if i don't mind what i'm at is pullin the half of their house down and wrenchin me angle i'll be before i free myself and she saw him struggling cautiously on the roof all the while she was ascending the slope to ody rafferty's door within which his aunt was at present a prisoner a reluctant and repining one she was having been seized with a bad attack of lumbago at a time when she felt particularly anxious to keep a vigilant eye upon what occurred in her neighbourhood instead of being left dependent upon hearsay for a knowledge of anything happening outside her four draughty walls many a care-infested hour she fretted away between them for how could she tell with what insidious steps the calamity to ensue from oddie's courtship of theresa joyce might all the while be stealing on her she dared not confide her fears to any neighbour nor would she have put much faith in the report of observation unwetted thereby and she lived in daily dread of hearing the news announced as no mere conjecture or rumour but as a very hard fact as the days wore on the idea took possession of her more and more completely but she could only wreak her helpless ill-humour by doing foolish and futile things such as dilating to Ody upon the imprudence of getting married and the undesirable qualities of black-looking slips of colleen's a simple and ingenious expedient for putting him out of conceit with all and any of them while she assumed towards theresa a demeanour so glum and repellent that the girl could not attribute it entirely to the irritability caused by rheumatic twinges and from one of her charitably intentioned visits returned with a disconcerted expression and a resolve which she kept to pay no more but in fact Adi was during these weeks even more than usually engrossed by the affairs of the inobtrusive little manufactory which he and felix o'byrne superintended away in a retired part of the bog and not they alone but lisconnel collectively had been going through some excitement on this account this was occasioned by the livelier interest which the police had recently manifested in that branch of home industry stimulated by admonitions from their authorities to the effect that the hunting down of illicit stills and confiscation of the produce might with advantage be carried on more energetically hence had resulted several appearances in lisconnel of the constabulary from ballybrosna and other stations and when these occurred otty was in his element of wiles and stratagems more than once he enjoyed the moment of their visitor's departure on a wild goose chase consaitin they've got us by the hind leg this time for certain and long did he chuckle over the evening when they came and sat discoursing as pleasant and easy as a rabbit in its hole by a hearth where there was enough of the stuff to float a lot of them lying within six inches of their shiny brogues it was however thought expedient to guard against a repetition of this perilous entertainment the contraband crocks were transferred to a still more secluded hiding-place in the queer tiny sod and stone shanty with hugh mcinerney who had displayed unexpected strategical ability and presence of mind under the late emergencies now knocked up for himself in a hollow behind the hill so old moggy's fears might have been better employed then about this time too a thrill was caused 
by the mysterious horseman who visited the O'Byrne's forge one night and got old Felix to break open for him an immensely strong small iron box which he carried the same box being found next morning lying empty in the little Lisconnel stream beside which the horse a grand big roan was quietly grazing while his rider was nowhere nor was ever after anywhere to be seen an incident which gave scope for infinite speculation at Lisconnel. all these things happened before Oddie's aunt got about again by that time it was well on in august and the season having been hot and dry lisconnel's oat patches were already reflecting as if in a mirror tarnished somewhat and rusted the broad golden blaze that had looked down on them so steadily and people had begun to think about reaping and ryan's fields indeed were so ripe by the day of ballyrosner's big fair that paddy ryan commissioned hugh mcinerney to bring him back a reaping hook from it hugh was going to attend it on business of his own and Oddie rafferty had some bulkier commissions to execute in behalf of his neighbours but he encountered some difficulties in getting under way due to the inopportune devices of old rory whom he proposed to bring with him Oddie had been careful not to put on his best clothes until he had caught the beast because as he remarked he well knew the creature would be off with himself hiding in the unhandiest place the devil would put in his mind if he noticed ever a decent stitch on him yet despite this precaution when his master went to look for him after breakfast no black pony was in sight and he that'll be foosterin everywhere under your feet otherwhiles he's that fond of company said Oddie's aunt who hobbled out of doors for the first time to assist in the search belike he's seen you rubbin up your brogues and be reason of that he took off with himself be dad now the big old head of him is as full of deceit as it can hold he's a notorious schemer god forgive him Oddie said rather sadly for it went against the grain with him to admit defects in rory but his scheming bad fair to prove successful as Oddy, after long hunting stood baffled at the door with his expedition seemingly frustrated when hugh mcinerney passing by reported that he was after seeing the beast leanin gathered up close again the back of the big stone above there wid a contented grin on the old gob of him that it frighten you wid the villainy was in it whereupon the two young men went to dislodge him from his fool's paradise and the three started together without further delay till a short way down the road they met old felix o'byrne and with him dennis o'meara at whose heels followed joe egan ragged and small his habit being to dog his splendid cousin so persistently that old mrs byers next door said she wondered the young chap didn't of an odd while take him be the two shoulders and sling him over the dyke so you're off to the fair said old o'byrne and is it sellin the pony you to be at last sure now he'll be the pick of the market that's certain ah they'll never give me my price for him the nagers said Oddie our captain commander here had a right to take him off of you for a trooper said old o'byrne and fay there wouldn't be his equal in the length and breadth of the army what did you offer for him lad look at the size of the head he has on him and the unnatural white face of him that's fit to scare a regiment before it if there was nothing else is it broke bankrupt you'd have me then said dennis settin up to be buyin meself mounts of that expensive description mush your good gracious man promise him the first thruppenny bit you meet floatin down the river on a grindstone and you'll be buyin every hair in his tail said the old man but come along and don't be delayin him they're goin after fairins for their sweethearts the way you'd be yourself if you weren't too great a nigger or maybe there isn't anything good enough for her to be had in bolibrosna is that the reason of it little joe was beginning to say in a resentful shout nagger yourself he and i are going to get but dennis pulled him on jocularly by the collar and the parties went their several ways Oddie then said sweethearts is it 
he's the queer old man for talkin'. Glory be to the great goodness, I'm troubled with ne'er a one. Here's out of it, says I. Unnatural, says he. Musha cock him up and himself, showin' old groans all the days of his life. Hi along, Rory Jewel. But you said meditatively, and more than half to himself, which was rather a habit of his. Well now, for the matter of fairin', it's just the best length of ribbon I can get them to give me for a shillin' yellow it's to be. I wasn't long either plannin' away to find out the colour she'd like. Sure I'd give her a bunch of flowers with poppies in it, and daisies, and furze blossom, and foxglove, and forget-me-not, and meadow sweet, and says I to her, which of them was the finest colour? And, says she, the furze blossom was, be reason of it being, the bright gold all over, that the others had mostly only a spark of somewheres inside. So it's to be yellow. Telling you the truth, I'd leave her she wouldn't be wearin' air such a thing at all. Anyways, not in her hair. That's a sight purtier just in the big black twists. But, sure, it's the fancy she has, and more betoken. I think bad of me lettin' the little goat swally the weeny bit she had on her. I be dad, I'd a right to be bringin' it to her. And at all events, I'd be doin' a foolish thing to come home without it and me not gettin' a bit of fat bacon these six weeks next Saturday to make up the price. I wonder now what length they'd give me for one shillin'. But Otty, who had not been listening, only said oracularly, Och, that's a cordin, which did not materially assist you's speculations. Yellow ribbons were not plentiful at Ballybrosna Fair and Hugh McInerney had to ask for them vainly at several stalls before he came to an old clothes cart, where the proprietress, being hot and cross, took him aback by replying, And who ever heard tell of selling ribbons by the length, you queer-looking stracon? Sure it's meself couldn't say, but you might. I never had any call to be buying such a thing before but a bit that one shillin would be the price of is what i'm wishful to be gettin if it was yellow and beggin your pardon ma'am hugh answered with a glib meekness which mollified the old woman as much as his not undesigned mention of his shilling so she said deed now i believe i've a splendid yellow bit somewheres a trifle creased in the folds but i could make you a present of for a shillin and she rummaged and unrolled before her interminable coils of vivid dandelion-hued ribbon the grand colour of it couldn't be bet she said in ireland you could see it a mile off and you wouldn't get the match of it in dublin under half a crown if she wouldn't be pleased with that you've got an odd one to satisfy Oddy with Rory came by as she was wrapping it up in paper, and you, pointing to his purchase with a melancholy air, said in an aggrieved tone, It's a terrible quantity they're about giving me, yards and yards, enough to rope round a haystack, and it's an ogeous colour. Troth now, if she takes the notion to be sticking the whole of it on top of her little black head of her, it's an object she'll make of herself, she will so. It's a pity. I'd leave her there hadn't been the half of it. What for, then, are you getting more than enough of whatever it is? Oddy asked, not unreasonably. Suppose you wanted any such trash at all at all. Ah, sure, I settled in me own mind to be spending me shillin' on it, and that's the way it is, you said resignedly. Maybe she'll have more wit, the bit of a creature. She might never put it on. So now I've only to see after Paddy Ryan's rape and hook, and then I am done. And as it is carrying them two bags all the way home, you'd be? Sure there's plenty of room for them on the beast. Aye, is there, said Oddie, but the fact is Rory's in none too good a temper this minute, goodness help him, and he'll be apt to be travelling more content the creature if he sees he's not the only body with a loadin'. Reach me over the one of them, said you. I've naught bearin' the bit of ribbon, and the reapin' hook'll be nothin' to me at all. And in this way they plodded back to Lisconnel. Chapter 6 A Fairing 
about Lisconnel, meanwhile, as the idle hours loitered by, Adi Rafferty's aunt grew tired of her solitary housekeeping, and late in the afternoon she made her way down as far as the Joyce's. Here a number of the neighbors were sitting about in almost the same place where Theresa had sustained the loss of her cherry-colored knot. But today there were no rough breezes stirring to bring about such disasters by their unmannerly pranks. The sun-steeped air was so still that the thick bushes stood as steady as the boulders, and even the rushes nodded slightly and stiffly. As the old woman hobbled down the slope, she saw Dennis O'Meara's scarlet uniform gleaming martially against a background of dark broom and hoary rock. Its wearer was, however, very peacefully employed in pulling the silky floss off the heads of the bog cotton, which lay in a great heap before him on a flat-topped boulder, with a big bunch of many-hued wild flowers beside it. Theresa Joyce, who sat opposite him, was pulling bog cotton, too, though less diligently, for it might have been noticed that she often looked off her work and toward the scrap of road that lay within her ken. Joe Egan was at his cousin's elbow, and a few other lads and lasses made a rough circle. But old Mrs. Joyce and old Mrs. Ryan and old Paddy Ryan and old Felix O'Byrne had established themselves on a low grassy bank at a little distance. It was kept so closely cropped by Ryan's goat that its dandelions grew dwarfed and stalkless and were set flat on the fine sward like mock suns. All this day the real sun had shone on it so strongly that the air was aromatic with the odor of its dim-blossomed herbs, and to touch it was like laying your hand on the warm side of some sleek-coated beast. Old Paddy said you might think you were sitting on the back of an old cow, but his wife rejoined that... You'd have to go far enough from Lisconnel, worse luck, before you get the chance of doing such a thing. And she shook her head over the reflection so regretfully that a matter-of-fact person might have inferred her to have been formerly much in the habit of enjoying seats on the backs of cows. These elders, from where they sat, commanded a comprehensive view of the crops of Lisconnel, its potatoes and oats, green and gold, meshed in their grey stone fences, and flecked with obstructive boulders and laboured cairns. In the middle of Ryan's neighbouring field there is a block of quartzite, as big as a small turf sack, which gleamed exceedingly white from amongst the deep muffling greenery of potato plants. Mrs. Joyce had been praising their thriving aspect to old Paddy, who, however, was disposed to express a gloomy view of them. "'It's too rank there, growin' altogether,' he said. "'Ne'er a big crop you'll ever get under that height of holmes, heavy thatchin' and light liftin', as the sayin' is.' To Felix O'Byrne the smooth, leafy surface recalled a far-off incident of the war when the dense foliage of a certain potato field had permitted the execution of a curious military maneuver. It was one of old O'Byrne's favorite stories, and he often related it at full length, but today it was cut short by the arrival of Audie Rafferty's aunt, whom Mrs. Joyce and Mrs. Ryan were prompt to greet, making room for her between them, on the bank with an alacrity which somehow conveyed an impression of uneasiness, lest she should establish herself elsewhere. And what at all is Teresa busy with over yonder, and young O'Meara? Is it bogberries they're after pullin'? Mrs. Joyce said, No, ma'am, it isn't bogberries, and left further explanations to Mrs. Ryan, with the air of one who refrains from self-glorification, but accounts upon its being done for her, more gracefully, by deputy. Sure wasn't he out on the bog the length of the day since early this morning. He and little Joe gathering her the bog cotton, said Mrs. Ryan. 
the full of a potato creel he brought her they have it there in a heap twas because he heard her sayin' last night she wished she had a good bit of it to stuff the pillow she's makin put in mrs joyce off he went after it the first thing this mornin whither now is that the way of the wind said otty rafferty's aunt with a pleased smile striking out unfamiliar paths among her wrinkles troth but i'm real glad to hear it bedad it's a grand thing for little teresa he's a very dacent poor lad mrs choice said looking over with pride at the handsome young sergeant and thinking that otty rafferty's aunt must have some good nature in her after all since she was so evidently glad of their good luck deed but there's not a finer young man in the kingdom of connaught this day said mrs ryan who could of course be frankly laudatory and with everybody's good word high and low and drawn grand pay and the colonel in his regiment ready to do a turn for him any time and a real steady kind-hearted lad to the back of that but sure he's after as nice a little girl as he had found anywheres with all his travellin and as good as gold he'll be very apt to be speakin out to her presently for it's gettin near his leave's end and what for would they be waitin but to my mind it's as good as made up after what he's done to-day in a little while after this oddie rafferty's aunt slipped away and set off hobbling along the road toward duffclane she wanted to intercept her grand nephew on his way home and tell him this news for all day she had been haunted by an apprehension that Audrey meant to return with a fairing for Teresa, the presentation of which might bring about a crisis in his courtship very disastrous from her own point of view. Old Moggy surveyed her world rather steadily at all times from that particular outlook, finding in her solitary superfluousness little to deflect her gaze the disappointment which on her own theory these tidings would bring to oddie did not do so now and she put her best foot foremost animated by the pleasure of telling some new thing one moreover that threw a reassuring light upon her situation with even her amended opinion of the lad she could hardly imagine that he would have a chance against magnificent dennis o'meara whom nobody would have ever expected to look for a wife in poor little Lisconnel. But you never could tell, and she felt that it still behooved her to be on her guard against all possible perils. Therefore she at present thought it expedient to waylay Oddy, and let him know that if he had any notion of Theresa Joyce, he was a day after the fair. Hobbling on bent and breathless, wrapped in her rusty black shawl with her shadow flitting far out over the level bog amid the slanted beams she looked a not inappropriate messenger of woe symbolically impotent and insignificant a little dark speck in the wide westering light a feeble stir of life creeping on the verge of a vast silent solitude and full with all of baseless fears and futile plots concerning the withered shred of existence that remained to her she was just in the nick of time she said to herself when she saw the trio presently come up over the top of the hill oddie was pointing out conciliatingly to the morose rory how they'd be at home now nearly in the time he'd be waggin his tail a new machinery was resolving that he would go on straight to his own place and defer the presentation of the ugly yellow ribbon until to-morrow all three were hot and fagged and dusty well lad and what's the best news with you oddie's aunt said to him as they met little enough said oddie and you comin out of a fair she said bedad now we make a better offer at it ourselves up here for the matter of news what's that at all said oddy sure am it i just after hearin tell of a grand weddin there's goin to be presently said his aunt and that doesn't happen every day of the year 
Och, her wedding, said Ody. I was thinking maybe there was something queer at our little place beyond yonder. But as long as it's nothing worse than weddings you're hearing tell of, I'm content if you listened the two ears off your head. It's Dennis O'Meara and Theresa Joyce has made a match of it, said his aunt, conscious that she was slightly overstating facts. Settled up it is only this evening, and the wedding's bound to be before his leaves out, so there's for you. Sure good luck to the both of them, said Ody. Theresa Joyce is a pleasant little being. I'll say that for her, and devil a bit of harm there is in O'Meara either. A fine chap he is for a soldier. Not that there any great things as far as I can see, just police a trifle smartened up. Ody's thoughts were for the moment running on the police, a couple of whom he had lately espied at a short distance coming across the bog. "'Well, if you wanted to see the two of them,' said his aunt, raising her voice as he began to drive Rory on, "'there they are, just at the back of her place, sortin' the stuff he's after getting her on the bog. He brought her the full of a potato creel. Her mother's as pleased over it as anything, and sat up to eyes, she bedad. The old woman was, for the time being, almost as much disappointed as relieved by the equanimity with which Ody had received her tidings. Yet if she had but known, they had not failed to produce a strong sensation. Only she never thought of considering how they might affect that queer big gawk, Hugh McInerney. What did occur to her in this connection, as he began to trudge alongside her after the pony, was that he was as ugly as if he had been bespoke, for Hugh's long tramp under the sultry sun had scorched him a deeper and a more uniform red brick than usual, and his shock of tow-coloured hair jutting from beneath an unnoticeable round cap looked more than ever like thatch over his blinking blue eyes. When they had gone a few yards in silence, he suddenly said amusingly, "'I don't know why he wouldn't have as good a right to be bringing her anything she had a fancy for off the bog in a potato creel as me to be buying her lengths of hideous coloured ribbons to make a show of herself wit. But all the same, I'd as lief he let it alone. For some reason or other, I've a wish in me mind I was slinging the whole of it into one of them bog holes out there. That'd be no thing to go to on her. And that was a queer story the old woman had about them getting married. Somebody was apt to be making a fool of her. Who was it would be telling her, I wonder? But old Moggy partly overheard and said, and them that knew what they was talking about, supposing it's any affair of yours. So he did the rest of his meditating inaudibly. He said to himself that he was stepping home straight, continuing the while to walk in quite the opposite direction, and that he wouldn't be going to the Joyce's place to-night at all. What'd bring him there, and it getting so late? But, of course, he went there as surely as a swimming bubble goes over the cataract's smooth lip, or a fascinated little bird down the snake's throat. For the sensation which he had begun to experience, and which was a strong one and strange to him, was nothing less than jealousy. He was jealous of that potato creel. When he came to the place Oddie's aunt had told of, he found a group of young Joyce's and Ryan's and others gathered among the boulders and bushes in a circle of which the heap of bog cotton formed the centre and a glance having showed him that it included dennis and teresa he sat down facing them and said to himself if i'd a known now it was bog cotton she was wantin i could have been gathering her plenty last night after i come home there's a grand big moon these times with lashins and lavins of light to be getting them kind of glimmerin things by I seen a black place below, between the thrain of water and roadside all waved over white with it, like as if it was a fall of snow trying could it flutter off away with itself again out of the world. I'd have gotten her enough to fill a six-foot sack. What for didn't the creature tell me? 
pursuing these and other such reflections use attentions which at other times had a long tether strayed far afield he did not hear dennis o'meara inquire of him twice whether Audie rafferty had got his fine price for the old pony not yet peter ryan rejoined after an interval that he supposed it was such a big one anyway you mcinerney couldn't get it out of his mouth that was sizable enough no doubt it was this symptom of absent-mindedness that emboldened thady joyce to set about twitching out of hugh's pocket the flimsy paper parcel seen protruding from it a feat which he achieved undetected while his surrounding accomplices nudged one another and whispered och he has it now whoa he'll do it that he conveyed that he had filched to molly and nelly ryan who manipulated it for some time amid much giggling and then nelly with dexterous audacity pinned their handiwork on to the cap of her neighbour dennis o'meara who sat all unawares thus it came to pass that when hugh was at last roused to a vague sense of tittering all around him which reached him much as the clacking chirp of sparrows gets meaninglessly into our frayed morning dreams and looking up out of his reverie stared about him for an explanation the first thing his eyes lit on was dennis's smart cap surmounted by a mass of gaudy yellow ribbon in immense bows and loops and streamers flapping and waggling absurdly at every movement made by their unsuspecting wearer and the spectacle caught his breath and dazzled his sight with a sudden scorching blast of wrath for it seemed to him that dennis was not making merely a mock of him and his fairing which he thought intrinsically of small amount but through it of theresa herself and her foolish little fancies and there sat theresa looking on with a quick pink flush and shining eyes and a quiver about her mouth the next moment you had hurled at the bedizened cap that he happened to be holding in his hand and this was paddy ryan's new reaping hook thereupon followed a terrible confusion and clamour which seemed to fill at a sweep all the spacious drowsy light of the sun setting for the missile had gone surely to its mark and had not simply knocked off dennis's cap but made a shocking gash in his temple so that there was only two sufficient reasons for the rising shrieks of holy virgin he's murdered he's killed amid all the turmoil with dennis fallen on the ground and you standing staring and everybody else rushing through other like crows in a storm one person alone appeared to act with a definite purpose and that was little joe egan the event had made him like one possessed with rage and despair to joe weakly and timorous and not overwise his valiant handsome good-natured soldier cousin had come as the most splendid apparition that had shined upon him in the dim course of his fifteen years and he had spent the past three months in adoring it devoutly so that now to see him laid low suddenly in this savage fashion was a sight that might well cause a burning thirst for vengeance upon the miscreant who had dealt the stroke joe generally had to get his revenges wreaked by deputy and now as he darted away his intention was to find the police somewhere and bring them to take up the great beastie murderin devil hugh mcinerney and if by any means possible get him hung he attained his object sooner than might have been expected as not far down the road a pair of constables were run into by a small tatterdemalion figure who choking and stammering and writhing in an ague fit of fury proceeded to inform them that big hugh mcinerney was just after murderin dennis o'meara up above there taking the head off him with a rapin hook and further that if they looked in the dirty thief's little place at the foot of the hill they'd find that every other stone in the walls of it was nothing else but a crock of poteen this was the cause of the police's prompt arrival on the scene when nobody resented joe's action 
Dennis's injury, though so grave, happily did not seem to be mortal. In fact, on this occasion, young Dannelburn, albeit scarcely more than a spalpeen, displayed a handiness and resource about bandaging and other remedies, which foreshadowed his future reputation throughout the district for knowledgeableness in surgery and medicine. Hugh McInerney was, of course, at once arrested without any resistance on his part or any sympathy from the indignant neighbors. He appeared to be what old Will Sheridan termed fallen into serious consternation, and was heard to make only one remark. It was when people were saying that Theresa Joyce had took a weakness and her brothers had carried her indoors. Och, the creature, he said, and it might easy have hit her very easy. Meself's the queer divil. Once the police and their prisoner had gone, Dennis having been brought into the Ryan's house, a deep and melancholy hush settled down upon Lisconnel, as if a murky wing had flapped out its brief flare of excitement. The whole thing had happened so quickly that the rich light from the west was still bronzing the edges of the flat-ledged firs' boughs and rosing their white stems when the little hollow behind the Joyce's house rested quiet and deserted, with no traces left of the company lately there assembled, except a litter of silky white bog-cotton tufts soon to be swept away by the breeze, and the unchancy yellow ribbon which had been torn out of Dennis's cap and lay coiling among the rough grass, whence, as the dusk thickened, it glinted like the wraith of a lost sunbeam or a ray from an evil star but that night fell very dark with the moon so closely veiled that the flaggers and bulrushes waving their swords and spears fast by dwindled into mere rustlings and murmurs the air was full of them at the dimmest hour anybody who had stolen out of a neighboring door and passed between the faintly glimmering white boulders as if in search of something lost there might have seemed only one of the whispering shadows and these might have begun to say sorra aught can i do at all at all and ne'er a soul is there to speak a word all of them begin him and it no fault of his when he would be tormented that way they'd no call to go play such a trick on him and he didn't mean it a purpose i very well know but the other chap was intendin' to annoy him sittin' there with a great ugly grin on his face i wish he'd never come next or nigh lisconnel but be that as it may when the next morning's light twinkled among the dewy blades the yellow ribbon had disappeared after this the days seemed to drag heavily at lisconnel where a dullness and flatness had come over society. Dr. Hamilton had carried off Dennis O'Meara to Ballybrosna, and there was nothing to fill up the blank he left except speculations about his chances of recovery and censures upon Hugh McInerney, monotonously unanimous. In his favour, indeed, no one seemingly had a word to say. People declared that they'd never have thought he'd take and do such a thing for though he might have been a queer sort of bastoon he was always decent and peaceable but cancelled praise is the bitterest of blame and they added that it was real outrageous of him to go do murder on the likes of dennis o'meara and no credit to lisconnel for it to be happenin him there illigant characters it'd be given them if it went back to the regiment with his eyes slashed out of his head as much as to say he hadn't a fair chance among us unless he'd come with his side arms the neighbors were of opinion too that it was no wonder little theresa joyce had got a bit moped and quiet after her sweetheart being as good as destroyed before her eyes and it hard to say if she'd ever see a sight of him again it was a misfortunate thing mrs conryan remarked one day when the subject was under discussion that young O'Meara hadn't actually spoke out before it happened him. To have made her a deal easier in her mind now, I wouldn't wonder. Because the way the matter stands, he might take up with some different notion, and just be off with himself like a cloud blown out of the sky, and she couldn't be saying a word if she was ever so sure of what he was intending. 
young mrs kehoe to whom she made the observation refused to entertain this view and replied sorra a fear is there of that it was easy to see he had gone to the well of the world's end after her let alone steppin up from the town if he spared to get his health ay he'll be comin back for her one of these fine days sure enough please god but the fulfilment of her confident prediction looked several degrees more doubtful in the light of one of the two pieces of news which mrs carbury accompanied by her daughter rose conveyed to the joyces on a bright september morning a short while after her son had come home with it from the town too late the night before one of them was hugh mcinerney who had been awaiting the assizes in one alone jail had died of the fever there on last friday there was nothing very surprising in this event as hugh's open-air life could have but ill acclimatized him to the atmosphere of the unclean little jail and it was not likely to be very deeply deplored at lisconnel where he had not been known long nor as we have seen much to his advantage as mrs carbury sat in the three-cornered armchair with the sun dazzle off a burnished mug on the dresser shimmering into her eyes and making her blink quaintly she said with rather severe solemnity that she hoped the young fellow had had time to repent of his sins or else it was very apt to be a bad lookout for him and he after comin within a shaven of takin another man's life no time at all ago so to speak near a chance but it would be clear in everybody's recollection mrs joyce however said ah sure maybe the creature wasn't intended any such great harm all the while god be good to him and anyway where he's gone he'll find plenty ready to be speakin up for him and puttin the best face they can on the matter ay will he said old biddy ryan who was calling too and be dad it's one great differ there is be all accounts between that place and this for here if a misfortunate body does aught amiss the first notion the rest of us have god forgive us is to be axin what worser he was meanin like as if it was some manner of riddle that there's bound to be an answer to if one could find it deed and i don't know if they haven't very far to look ma'am said mrs carbury with dignity when a chap does his endeavours to take the head off another man with a reapin hook ma'am and i don't know ma'am for that matter said old biddy also with dignity if it's any such a great deal better to have one's mind took up wid inventin other people's bad intentions than if it was wid one's own ah well i wouldn't be thinkin too bad of poor hugh mcinerney at any event said mrs joyce twas maybe a sort of accident for he seemed a decent creature afore that och now to think it's only a few odd weeks since he was creepin about over our heads up there mendin the old thatch you'd whiles hear him hummin away talkin to himself like some sort of big bee and in his grave to-day but isn't it a lucky thing that he's leavin nobody belongin to him to be breakin their hearts frettin after him teresa dear child you're ne'er a stim of light to be workin in sittin there in the corner but teresa said she had light enough to blind her and was only windin a skein and could see better to do that in the dark so mrs carbury passed on to her second piece of news which though less tragical than the first was not likely to sound very cheerfully in the ears of some among her audience it ran that her son ned was after seeing denis o'meara down beyant and that he was doing finely next door to himself again and that the people in the town did be saying he was courtin mary ann nelligan the people's daughter that he was lodging with a terrible fortin she was said to have and that he'd be very apt to be taking her along with him presently when his leave was up mrs carbury supposed there were none of them very likely to see him again up at lisconnel and the rest of the neighbours having heard her tale supposed so likewise and said among themselves that teresa joyce was to be pitied yet not many days after this while the early autumn weather was still soft-aired and mellow-lighted 
over our blue misted bogland where the leaves and berries were brightening and even the little frosty grey cups on the lichened boulders getting a scarlet thread on the rim on one clear dew-dashed morning who but denis o'meara himself should come stepping into lisconnel the neighbours who saw him go by were glad to notice that he looked as well as ever he did in his life and he greeted them all blithely though briefly eluding every attempt to entangle him in conversation and making very straight for widow joyce's house which was by these same observers considered to betoken a healthy frame of mind only mrs joyce and mrs kilfoyle were in the little brown room when he arrived but they gave him a cordial welcome and he took a seat from which he could keep a watch on the door while they talked about different things one of these naturally was the melancholy end of dennis's assistant poor hugh mcinerney and mrs joyce said it was little enough they'd have thought a while ago that it would be dennis who'd come back but indeed she said if anything had took you we'd a been in no hurry ever to set eyes on the other unlucky bastoon dennis said faith ma'am i'd give six months pay the thing had never happened devil a bit of harm i believe there was in poor mcinerney and i spoke to dr hamilton to speak to mr nugent and the other magistrates for him but they said after what me cousin joe let out about the poteen at his place the police would be wishful to keep him convenient to them for a while and to be sure they kept him too long altogether i know ma'am young rafferty and the rest had his shanty pulled down before the police come up next day but they thought they'd get something out of him the little jackass ought to have held his tongue it was a pity bedad hard times it is on a man to be losing his life you may say along wid his temper just be reason of a bit of a joke still as he looked out into the sunshine he could not help thinking that he would have had a greater loss of life had poor hugh mcinerney who it was evident would always have met with a cold reception from everybody at the joyce's then he said to mrs joyce and how's theresa ma'am mrs joyce was in the middle of replying that she was grandly and had just run over to mrs keogh's on a message when theresa herself came in dennis jumped up quickly saying ah theresa it's a great while since i've seen you but theresa only lifted her head without turning it and walked straight as if nobody had accosted her hurrah now theresa darlin don't you see dennis o'meara said her mother puzzled and rather dismayed and then theresa did turn and look at him yes i see him she said and indeed she might as easily have overlooked the red flame in a lantern as the tall scarlet lancer in her mother's little misty cornered room i see him she said and i hate the sight of him and thereupon she turned again and walked out of the door leaving a dead silence behind her this was one of the very few harsh sayings that theresa joyce has uttered in the course of her long life and it came like a shock upon her hearers mrs joyce at last said blankly what at all has took the child and bessie kilfoyle said to dennis who stood dumbfounded but indeed now you may be sure there's not a many up here at any rate who do that but he replied if she does it's many enough for me mrs kilfoyle and i won't stop here to be driving her out of the house so i'll say good-bye to yous kindly for i'll be off to dublin to-morrow or next day and in course mrs joyce remarked ruefully after he had departed retreading his steps through the bright fresh morning with so crestfallen a mien that all the neighbors knew things had not run smoothly you couldn't reasonably expect him to stay here to be hated the sight of and indeed what with one thing and another it's it's none too good treatment the poor lads got up at lisconnel more's the pity theresa herself never had any explanation to offer of why she would be that cross with poor dennis o'meara her mother accounted for it by pique at the carberry's ill-timed gossip about his imaginary courtship of mary ann nelligan and mrs kilfoyle was for a while inclined to the same opinion 
until one day by chance she espied in the little old tin box which contained Teresa's treasures a roll of bright yellow ribbon wrapped up very carefully, and thenceforward she silently ceased to hope that things might all come right yet if Dennis O'Meara came back again on leave. So, although Mrs. Joyce may have drawn wrong inferences, the results were much as she had foreseen. Theresa never married, and when her mother died she went to live with her brother Mick at Larig Manor, where she is still living still, notwithstanding that it is so long since all this happened. Since the fine summer when Dennis O'Meara was at Lisconnel, a you McInerney, who luckily left nobody to be breaking their hearts fretting after him, died in Moynalone jail. The yellow ribbon lies safely in her box, and with it a grimy bit of paper, brought to her one day by a trusty hand, to which you found out a way of committing it before he was took bad entirely. Teresa herself has never deciphered its wild scrawls, being an unlettered person but its bearer read it over to her until she knew it by heart every word. "'For your own self, the yellow ribbon is,' the letter ran, "'but don't be wearing it unless you like it, and I'm sorry the man got hit, but I do be dreamin' most nights that it's you I'm after reapin' the little head off of, and I'd liefer lose my life than think I'd be after hurtin' a hair of it. But the devil was busy with me that evenin' and I'm very apt never to get the chance to set foot again out on the big bog. it do me heart good to see the sun going down in it a great way off, for this is a queer small place. It's a long while, but sure, to the end of all the days of me life, it said to her like an echo, beaten back from the walls of the great abysm. It's of yourself I'll be thinking off away in contentment at Lisconnel. End of section 4。This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 5 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5. Chapter 7. Mr. Polymathers. It was to an accidental circumstance that Lisconnel owed the prolonged sojourn there of perhaps the most distinguished scholar who has ever visited us for when he arrived at O'Byrne's forge one misty June evening, the night's lodging only was all he asked or desired. But in those times, now some fifty years since, we had a terrible deal of sickness about in the country, and next morning the stranger was down with the fever, which, although so mild a case that even Bridget O'Byrne never gave him over more than twice in the same day, brought his journey perforce to a halt. At the beginning he was very loath to believe that he must relinquish his intention of reaching Dublin by a certain day, the first Monday in July. However, having once recognized the impossibility of doing so, he showed no haste to quit his quarters, and his stay with the O'Burns lengthened into months as the summer slipped away. At this time the forge was owned by Felix O'Byrne, blacksmith, Sheberner, an ex-white boy, and with him lived his orphan grandsons Daniel and Nicholas, his very old ancient mother, who still drew enjoyment in whiffs through the stem of her black dudeen, and his elderly sister Bridget, who had taken little pleasure in anything since the Redcoats shot her sweetheart in the war. The missing third generation was represented occasionally when Mrs. Dooley, Felix's married daughter, came on a visit. It was conjectured among them that the fancy the old gentleman had for learning all manner to young Nicholas contented him to stop, 
and this may have had something to do with it, though less probably than the vaguer fact that he from the first took kindly to the O'Burns and they to him. His appearance puzzled them a little. He was of a massive, large-boned frame, such as nature seems to design for rough uses. But, as Felix remarked, you could easy tell by every finger and thumb on him that hard work wasn't the handle he took a hold of the world by. He wore a very long grey frieze coat and a chimney pot hat so old and tall that it looked as if it must have grown slowly to its great height. When he took it off he uncovered a shock of soft white hair like the wig of a seeded groundsel about a face which was furrowed and wrinkled ruggedly enough in a different pattern somehow from what is commonly seen at Lisconnel, where sun and wind have a large share in the process. His baggage consisted of two bundles, very unequal in size and weight. The contents of the smaller one were mainly a shirt and three socks, knotted loosely in a blue cotton handkerchief. The other was done up carefully in sacking, and he liked to have it under his eye. Of course, the O'Burns visitor was often talked about among the group gathered of an evening, much as they are nowadays for gossip and poteen within the broad-leaved forge doors, through which, on dark nights, the fire still blinks as far across the bog as the amber of the sunset or the rising glow of the golden harvest moon even from felix's first report it appeared that the stranger was no ordinary person wonderful fine discourse he has out of him anyway he told the neighbors a few nights after the arrival every now and again he'll out with a word as grand like and big as his reverence at mass goodness forgive me for saying so sometimes we've been hard set to tell what he's driving at but that's the way it is with them words that has a power or meaning in them they're apt to bother you a bit when you're used to spakin plain be like it's the fever in his head sets him talkin oddly said young barney cochran i mind me brother joe when he was bad would it would be raven wild sorra the sensible word there was out of him for the best part of a week this way of accounting for his guest's fine language rather affronted felix and he consequently said musha now was there not and how long might yourself be under that description of fever ah sure what did we do at all if poor bonnie was took that way said peter keogh and nobody able to tell was it a raven he was, or settin' up to be talkin' reasonable for any differ they could see? Barney cleared his throat disconcertedly, and the old man, recalling his responsibilities as a host, and perhaps not admiring his sarcasm thus elaborated, said conciliatingly, Och, he'll do right enough if he never raves any worse than Mr. Polymathers. All that ails him is that we want to get a bit used to his manner of speaking. Polly Mathers, said Peter. To be sure, Polly Mathers, did you say it any better than I? Well, I never heard tell of anybody called that way before. It's a queer she-he soundin' sort of name, said Peter. Fay, then, there may be plenty queer in it. We never heard tell of it, if that was all, said Felix. Anyhow, it's his name, and his people's afore him himself told me his father was the oldest of all the polymathersers there was in the country he came out of somewheres down south i think he said and the head of the whole of them forby ay he did so said dan says you to him there was a deal of water run down hill since the time there was o'burns's blacksmiths in this part of the country and your father was a one says you and says he to you, he couldn't be any manner of means pretend to be the equal of what his father was. And says you to him, what was he? And says he, it was one of the Polly Matherses he was, and well known for his learning through the length and breadth of the county Sligo. And a name it was, says he, any man might be proud of owning. 
be jabbers himself was the great conceit of it at all events said peter but he might find people could be tellin him there's keogh's as good as any polly mathers's ever was in it every hair the stranger's patronymic having thus been ascertained it was desirable to fix his calling and despite his disclaimer of inherited erudition several circumstances bespoke him a schoolmaster even before the question seemed settled by the first act of his convalescence being an inquiry into the amount of book learning which dan and nicholas had amassed during their sixteen and fourteen years this was not large though as much as could be expected considering that in all this connell there was not just then i believe more than four volumes one of which being merely the index to a non-existent encyclopedia can scarcely rank as literature the boys themselves and their grandfather were deeply interested in the examination and very anxious that it should have a creditable result for learning and learned have at all times been held in profound respect among us away on our bogland where the devotion to something afar springs perhaps the more abundantly because so many things are remote on this occasion mr polymathers opened his most sizable bundle and it was seen to be filled with books not fewer doubtless than a score in leather bindings ragged and battered and brownly time-stained all over their margins as if the river of years had for them run no metaphor but a russet bog stream they comprised homer virgil livy and other ancients likewise two latin lexicons which looked extravagant until you observed how each did but supplement the other's deficiencies and this so imperfectly that their owner was still liable to search in vain for words between m o and n a these however were evidently not the most prized portion of mr polymathers library though he displayed them with some complacency reading out here and there a sonorous foreign phrase at which his audience said more power and your soul to glory and the like it was when he handled the shabbiest of the volumes with broken backs and edges all curling tatters that his touch grew caressing the lookers-on contrariwise thought but poorly of them because they set up seemingly to be illustrated works and their pictures mostly of uninteresting round and three-cornered objects struck lisconnel art critics as very feeble efforts to be sure mr polymathers called them diagrams but that was no help to the overtaxed imagination only young nicholas o'burned listened intently to the explanation which he gave of one of them nicholas was a long thin lad with melancholy grey eyes and a square forehead whose capacity his grandfather had held in some esteem since it had been discovered years ago that the spalpeen could make out an account for four sets of shoes and half a stone of three-inch holdfasts and a dozen of staples and two gallons of the creature and allow for a hundred weight of old iron all on his head and right to a farthing now the melancholy eyes darkened and brightened with excitement as mr polymathers discoursed on right lines and angles and circles and expounded the mysterious signification of certain a b c's and he had thenceforward an unweariable pupil in nicholas complained albeit with less ardent zeal and at a slower rate of progress by his elder brother dan more general interest however continued to be taken in the stranger's classical attainments everybody the o'burns themselves their neighbours in the cabin row close by now long since an untraceable ruin and the people of lisconnel proper a couple of miles further on felt uplifted by the residence among them of a man who they boasted would talk latin to you as soon as look at you 
but as we never enjoy our own happiness fully until it has been looked at through other men's envious eyes they could not here remain content with simply possessing this privilege or even with dilating upon it to their less favoured friends down below and down beyond they longed to make a parade of it to give a demonstration of it and the method of doing so which they came to consider most desirable was the bringing about of a conversation in latin between mr polymathers and father rooney the parish priest for if that took place they could easily imagine his reverence riding home to report in the town that a wonderful great scholar entirely they had stopping above at lisconnel moreover the conversation itself would be a, a real fine thing to have the hearing of terence kilfoyle for instance said that it would be as good as a play which as he had never seen one was to entertain unbounded expectations and at last after they had wished the wish for some weeks a prospect of its fulfilment came into sight together with father rooney's cream-coloured pony jogging along through the light of a fiery zoned july sunset in which mr polymathers was basking by the o'burns door in those days his reverence was a youngish man ruddy and of a cheerful countenance a substantial load for his sturdy nag and although in his glossy black cloth a figure very different from their gaunt sad-visaged shaggily garbed old guest he was at the time of father rooney's approach seated on a two-legged three-legged stool propped precariously against the ray-rused cabin wall and was teaching dan and nicholas the twelfth proposition of the second book of euclid dan had not yet grasped it but it all lay as clear as a sunbeam athwart nicholas's brain and he was fidgeting like an impatient horse at the slowness of his fellow several of the neighbors chanced to be about for the forge saw a good deal of company in those long empty days before the potato digging could begin they all drew together into a small crowd and closed in step by step to watch the first meeting between these two notable persons much admiring the deftness with which old burns secured it by pronouncing one of the pony's shoes in need of tightening and the felicitous opening he made by assuring his reverence that divil a bit need he be mindin the delay because mr polymathers there had enough foreign languages to keep them all diverted if the beast owned as many feet as of forty legs wid the shoes droppin off every pair of them that was to say in course supposin he got the chance of conversin a bit wid somebody equal to answerin him back illigant the way there wasn't ever a a one of them could make an offer at doin no more than them little weevils of chirpin chickens yet the interview turned out disappointingly after all if such a thing had not been of course exceedingly improbable one might have fancied that each scholar stood in awe of the other's reputation they steered so clear of all recondite subjects keeping to the merest commonplaces about rain and potatoes and turf which anybody else could have discussed quite as knowledgeably in vain whenever there was a promising pause would the bystanders nudge one another whispering hopefully whist boys they'll be saying something now only the plainest english followed and at last when father rooney rode on his parting joke which referred to the difficulty his pony would now find in the way of becoming a barefooted pilgrim left for a wonder solemnly irresponsive faces behind it michael ryan said with a touch of resentment ah well one couldn't maybe expect it of him to be troublin' themselves talkin' fine for the pack of us as ignorant as dirt in the middle of the old bog and his wife said deed now i wouldn't wonder meself if the reason was his reverence would think bad of usin his latin words for anything else only prayers and such it might be something the same as if he went and took his grand vestments to go dig potatoes in and that ud be a great sin god knows but old felix who was as we have seen a rather touchy person 
construed this suggestion in an implied censure on his own wishes in the matter and said huffily sorra the talk of sin i see in it at all ma'am tis a deal liker they just couldn't get out wid it convenient off-hand the same way that i'd easy enough bait out a shoe on me anvil there when it's bothered i'd be if you axed me to make a one promiscuous here of a sudden on the roadside mr polymathers himself meanwhile was perhaps dimly conscious that he had disappointed hopes and failed to rise duly to the occasion and this may have been why he slipped indoors and fetched out a small book he had never produced before bound in a dingy greenish blue with a white paper label do you know what that is sir he questioned rhetorically handing it to felix o'beirne it's the calendar let me tell you of the college of the holy and undivided trinity juxta dublin there's a print of the front of the buildings attached to the fly-leaf i'm after picking it up this spring at moynalone twas new the year before last and comprises a deal of information relative to terms examinations fees and so forth begor then it looked to be a wide house said felix confining himself to the picture as a comprehensible point it's apt to be an uncommon fine place sir i should suppose you may say that me man said mrs polymathers emphatically not its match in the kingdom of ireland the home of literature and the haunt of science and it's there i'll be pleased god next october musher and will you be travelling that far to dublin said felix ay will i and would have gone last month only for the fever delaying me till after the midsummer entrance me savings amount to be something over thirty pound so i may venture on the step and present myself at the michaelmas term in short said mr polymathers repoising himself upon his rickety stool i might describe myself as an unmatriculated candidate undergraduate of the university of dublin and what at all now would that be sir if i might be axin said felix humbly after the awe-stricken pause which followed mr polymathers proclamation of his style and title it's a necessary preliminary said mr polymathers to proceeding to the degree of baccalaureatus in artibus or in artibus baccalaureatus the ordo verborum is i take it immaterial to judge by the transposition of initials in the case of blank fay but it's the fine latin you can be discoursing now and his reverence half ways home said felix reproachfully mr polymathers glancing round a circle of deeply impressed faces felt that his prestige was restored and even began to enjoy a foretaste of the triumph which had been one part of his dream through the long laborious years but he was puzzled how to bring the full grandeur of his design clearly before this uninstructed audience and after reflecting for a while in quest of concise yet adequate definitions he launched out into an eloquent description of the ceremonial observed in conferring degrees at dublin university it may be surmised that many of the details were due to his own fondly brooding fancy for not only did the highest learning in the land crowd the hall in their academic robes but the lord lieutenant himself took a prominent part in the proceedings which were enlivened by military music and thunderous salutes mr polymathers nearly toppled off his tricky stool more than once without noticing it in his excitement as he rehearsed these splendid scenes declaiming with great unction the formulas long since learned by all his heart especially ego auctoritate mihi concessa and the rest until he came to his peroration and all this pomp and ceremony mind you to the honour and glory of science and fine scholarship it's a grand occasion lads it's an object any man might be proud to give here he pulled himself up warmed by an unusually violent lurch that his theme was running away with him but having by no means worked off his enthusiasm he expended some of it as a schoolboy might have done 
in throwing a small bit of turf at a stately white hen who just then sailed across the dark doorway like a little frigate under the most crowded canvas she immediately took flight with floundering screeches which drowned what the old man was muttering to himself however it was only admitote admitote after these revelations mr polymathers was looked up to more than ever as one not only endowed with rare gifts but destined by their means to scale heights of hardly realizable exultation be all accounts there was no knowin what he mightn't rise to be at dublin college the neighbours said they also often remarked that it was a surprising thing to see a great scholar like him spending his time over teaching them two young O'Burns. If the speaker happened to be afflicted with a twinge of envy about those educational advantages, he was apt to say, them two young bastoons or gomorals. But Dan and Nicholas were not, in fact, any such thing. Nicholas, indeed, quickly proved himself possessed of what Mr. Polymathers called a downright astonishing facility at the mathematics, far outstripping Dan, not quite to Dan's satisfaction, as he had always enjoyed the preeminence conferred by superior physical strength and a practical turn of mind. So well pleased was the old man with his eager pupil that he would have liked to do his teaching, nothing for reward, but his host's hospitality and his own ambition would not permit this. Now and then he rather puzzled Nicholas by an apologetic tone in answering questions about his university career, and once at the end of a lesson he said, as if to himself, May goodness forgive me if I'm taken what he'd have done better with. But sure he's young, he's plenty of chances yet. However, as the time for his departure drew on, all his misgivings, if such he had, seemed to vanish away, and his thoughts became very apt to journey off blissfully to Dublin in the middle of the most interesting problems. Nicholas had to wait till they came back. Mr. Polymathers left Lisconnel on a fine autumn morning, when the air was so still that the flashing and twinkling of the many dewdrops seemed to make quite a stir in it. The sky was as clear as any one of them, and in the golden light the wavering columns of blue smoke rose in curves softly transparent. He started with a buoyant step, as well he might, since he was setting out on the enterprise into which he had put all the spirit of his youth. He felt some regret at parting from his Lisconnel friends, but his plans and prospects were naturally very preoccupying, whereas he had the ampler leisure of the left behind to deplore his flitting which seemed likely enough to be for good. Nearly four years, he had explained, must elapse before the crowning height of the B.A. degree could be won, and it was only just possible that he might manage to tramp back on a visit meanwhile during some long vacation. This doubtful chance was cold comfort for that ardent scholar Nicholas Byrne, who grieved more than anybody else most ruefully did he help dan to carry the candidates undergraduates library as far as the town nor could he take more than a downcast pleasure in mr polymathers farewell gift to him of the raggedest euclid and as he stood watching the car out of sight his eyes were as wistful as if a door briefly opened on glimpses of radiant vistas had been inexorably barred to his face Yet, after all, Mr. Polymathers's absence was not to be measured by years or months. One evening, on the threshold of December, Lisconnel was lying, roofed over, by a massy, livid black cloud, which came lumbering up and up interminably, and which the weather-wise estimated to contain as much snow as would smother the width of the earth. The north wind moaned, and keened dismally under the toil of wafting on this portentous load, and its breath was bitingly sharp, so that when the lads came in from the forge, their grandfather said, Ah, Dan, shut over the door, for there's a blast, sweeping through it, it frees ten regiments as stiff as staties. 
we usually take a large view of things at Lisconnel. Dan went to carry out this order, but instead of doing so, he suddenly shouted, Murder alive! Here's Mr. Polymathers! Through the grey gloaming came a Mr. Polymathers, very different from what he had been on that brilliant, hopeful morning only a few weeks ago, when he had stepped lightly and held his head up as if he were looking a friendly fortune in the face. Now his feet stumbled and dragged as he fared slowly against the wind's blustering, with his eyes on the ground, and his movements seemingly guided more by the weight of the bundle he carried than by his own will. Before he came within even loud shouting distance, everybody felt a presentiment of disaster. But he had not spoken a word to justify or discredit it by the time he got indoors. Musha, and so it's yourself, sir, old Felix then repeated in a congratulatory tone. Ah, but it's a hardy evening, and it's perished you are, sir. Come in by the fire. I am back, Mr. Polymathers said slowly, after a hesitating pause, as if the remark had been interpreted to him by some second person. I was bringing the books, thinking the lad might use them. He's young enough, but I'm not come to stop on you, he added, speaking faster, only just for this night. Early tomorrow I must be off to Art Cray and try for the teaching there again. "'Twas only on account of bringing the books I came this way. I'll be on the road quite early." His insistence on this point made somehow a very melancholy impression on Felix. But he replied jovially, "'Is it tomorrow? Bedad then, sir, don't you wish you may slip off on us that soon, and we after getting a hold of you again? What fools we are! Not if you was as slithery every inch of you as a water-eel. The wraith of a relieved smile at this came over Mr. Polymathers' face. Still it looked so grey and withered, and his eyes were so sunken, and his large bony hands so shaky, that all with one consent refrained from questions which they were agog to ask. And when Mrs. Kehoe by and by dropped in, and being an inquisitive and not very quick-witted person, said, Saints among us, it's Mr. Polymathers, and how's yourself, sir, and are you bringing home the grand decree? Though they all listened eagerly for the reply, they wished she had held her tongue. The devil a degree, ma'am, said to Mr. Polymathers, and never will. There was a short silence, and then he turned round on his stool. It was the same from which he had made his boast in the summer sunset. But Dan had meanwhile mended its broken leg with the handle of a worn-bladed spade. I've given up, he said to them. I no longer entertain the project of becoming a graduate, or, for the matter of that, an undergraduate of Dublin University. And if I'd done right, I'd never have taken up such an idea. I've put it out of me head. "'but it's been in me mind a great while, a terrible long while. "'Look you here, Mr. Polymathers, sir. "'Are you after getting any bad treatment from any people up in them places?' "'said Felix, who always liked better to lay a grievance on some human "'and possibly breakable head than to believe it the work of the vengeance "'baffling demon bad luck. "'Not at all, not at all,' said Mr. Polymathers, when the question reached him. I've nothing to complain of. They're very respectable people in Dublin, and it's a fine city. But me head's a bit giddy yet with the driving they have in the streets that makes one stupid. I mind there was a car tattering along, and I crossing over the college green had me down on the stones. Only a decent lad gripped a hold of me and whirled me inside the college gates. There I was before I rightly knew anything had happened to me, and I, after spending the best part of me life getting to it, twasn't the way I thought it'd be, but the college is as grand as any notion I had of it. Only since I've seen it, tis like a dream to me that ever I set foot in it, just a sort of dream. Great ancient places the squares are. I walked round the whole of them before I found the hall. A couple of chaps in uniform, like, came axing me 
me business, and I told them fast enough that I was a candidate. Ah, goodness help me. And the hall's a spacious and splendid apartment. Only it was strange now to see it full of nothing but young fellows, scarce older than the two lads here. I might sure enough have known the way it'd be, but I'd come to consider, but somehow it seemed to put me out, as if I'd no call to be there at all. There was one of them began pricing me old hat, and another of them tripped him up against a black marble construction with a pair of angels atop of it that there is on the wall. Sure, they were just spalpeens, but I'll give you me word, when they called me up to the examiner's table, there was a young gentleman sitting at it in his black gown and cap with the tassel, bound to be one of the college fellows and every sort of a fine scholar, and for all the age there was on him, he might have been me son or me grandson. And so he handed me over the little black Virgil, with the page opened where I was to exhibit me acquaintance with the text. It was merely a bit of an oration of Queen Dido's that I've known every line of these forty years as well as I know me own name, and better. And what came over me is more than I can tell, but the minute I took the book in me hand, it seemed to me as if every atom of sense and meaning slipped out of the words or out of me head. I couldn't say which, and I just stood staring at them, and staring until everything else got whirling round about me, fit to shake the panes out of the big windows and the pictures off the walls. Be like himself perceived, I was flustered for. Take your time, says he, and after a while they stood steady enough. But the Lord be good to me, saw a syllable of the sense came back, and to me that I well knew it was all up with me and I was thinking me father's son had no business to be standing there making a show of meself in the middle of Trinity College. So the lad in the cap said again, Take your time, sir, take your time. But I said to him, God help me, so that I've taken very nigh oil I'll get, for I declare to you, lad, I'm over seventy years of age, but as for your time, sir, I said, I'll be wasting no more of it. And with that I put down the book, and out I went. I mind the sun in the square nearly dazzled the eyes out of me fool's head. I never seen it blazin' brighter. And there was a big bell somewhere boomin' away, as if they'd set the heart of the world tollin'. It's ringin' in me ears yet. And a couple of days after that I quit out of Dublin, and I've been trampin' back to the country, takin' me time, as he said. There's no hurry now about anything. So that was the end of me university degree. I just wish I could get discoursing with that young feller, said old Felix vindictively, himself and his tassel on his cap. Sure, man, twas no fault of his, said Mr. Polymathers, and I can live without a degree if that's all. Me betters did before me. To tell you the truth, I've thought often enough as I was coming along now that I do not know how at all I'd have had the face to meet me poor father one of these days, and I cocked up with a baccalaureatus in artibus, and he would not so much as a decent stone over his grave to commemorate his name. That was the most illustrious polymath in the county Sligo, with more learning in the tip of his ear than ever I got into me old skull. Never a hapworth of good was I at anything except the trifle of mathematics, but he was as great at the classics. I used to humbug myself sometimes, letting on I hankered after it, because it would have gratified him maybe to hear of the event. But little I ever done to please him, God forgive me, let alone going and making an old fool of myself up at Trinity College. Twas a terrible upset to him when I turned again the priesthood after he had the money saved up for the seminary and all. Words about it we had, and the end of it was that he put it all into be Brother Ned's little farm. Ned had no more fancy for learning than the beasts of the field. A trifle of it would have come in very handy sometimes for buying me books, however it was not to be. And the books there, I only brought them along to have with you for the youngest lad, I, Nicholas. He has a head on his shoulders for the mathematics, I can tell you. He might do something yet if he got his chances. They're no use to me now, and I'd as lief be shut of the sight of them, and tomorrow I'll be off to Onyx Grieg. 
so the gaunt old man talked on groping his way out of hesitating pauses and straying into dreamy meditations as if he sometimes forgot his story and sometimes his hearers they did not know what a life wreck it outlined but they saw and surmised enough to make him think of himself as the creature and speak to him with more deference than if he had returned in a radiant glow of success symbolized as some of them had anticipated by scarlet robes as splendid at least as father rooney's at high mass and felix o'beirne took occasion of a madly skirling gust to say listen out of that sir and don't be talkin wild of travellin off to-morrow if i might be sayin so you're a deal better stay quiet where you are this minute and as for teachin sure it's proud and thankful the two boys would be for ever a bit more there's nicholas mopin about like an old hen that's lost her chickens ever since you quit mr polymathers did stop quiet very quiet but he taught the boys no more in fact he did nothing except sit all day staring into the fire as if he had lost something in it once after nicholas had sat looking very hard at him for a long time with the ragged euclid ostentatiously open at a crook's he seemed to rouse up and putting out a hand for the book began an explanation but it died away unfinished in an aimless muttering which both shocked and saddened nicholas and the experiment was not repeated then towards christmas time all the neighbors were saying that mr polymathers would greatly fail to what he had been and bridget o'beirne reported that you might as well be argufying with a scutty wren to swallow down the full of the duck's dish as persuading him to take a reasonable bite and sup dr hamilton from the dispensary who was consulted on the case conceded bridget told inquirers that he might be after getting a sort of stroke like unbeknownst but her own opinion was that he had so to speak lost the knot off his thread and twould be much if he didn't slip away out of it on them afore they seen e'er another green leaf on the bushes it was at any rate more than happened one snowy afternoon when he had been busy for some time scrawmin a manner of letter which related he said to the disposition of his property mr polymathers grew so much worse that dan and nicholas ran off for the doctor and the priest and before their arrival could possibly be expected it became evident that he could not wait to receive them bridget o'beirne deploring the hap by his bed in the small room off the kitchen thought a few minutes before he went that she heard him murmuring something coherent as she called to little rosy cochran child alive me head's bothered come in here and listen can you make out at all what he's sayin rosy came reluctantly and listened i think she whispered it's some sort of prayers like what his reverence says ah then glory be to god for that itself said bridget there might be a good chance for him after all but she had been misinformed the words mr polymathers was muttering over and over to himself were admit o te admit o te chapter eight honorus causa the evening of the day after mr polymathers died was a very wild black and white one out of doors all round lisconnel yet notwithstanding the flakes in the air and underfoot the o'burns had received some company not at a wake however the purpose of their assembly was to discuss a serious business matter upon which old felix o'burn wished for friendly counsel hence his contemporary old paddy ryan had prodded little round craters in the snow with his thick stick all along the good step of bleak road which lay between his house and the forge and with him had come on the same errand terence kilfoyle who although of so much junior standing was esteemed as a man of notably shrewd sense and judgment 
but then neither he nor his neighbors knew how often he took and gave Bessie Kilfoyle's advice. These two were present by express invitation, but another pair of guests, the Dooleys, would never have been asked for the sake of their opinion, which they were indeed encouraged to keep to themselves, and appeared at this domestic crisis merely by virtue of family ties. Old Felix had always thought little of his daughter Maggie's mental powers, and less ever since her marriage with Peter Dooley, who kept a shop in the town and could be described as an old gombeen man, if one wished to regard him from an unfavorable point of view, which his father-in-law not uncommonly did. He had been heard to say of Peter that the chap was that smooth-spoken you might think he was after swallowing a one of those gracy dips, only he'd liefer be chatin' some poor body over the sellin' of it, a perhaps not inexcusable preference. As for Peter, he contemplated humanity with a jovial cynicism, and rather enjoyed the society of the old blacksmith, despite the gruff sarcasms which sometimes made their womankind turned the conversation apprehensively. He had been heard to say of Felix that it was easy work running down other people's business, and small blamed the old man if he had a fancy for a light job now and again, when he would be tired pounding the old iron at a profit you couldn't see to pick up without a strong pair of spectacles. Proximity had brought to the consultation Mrs. Carberry and Tim O'Meara from adjacent doors, and they, with old ancient Mrs. O'Byrne and her daughter and the two lads, formed quite a large party about the fire. The business to be brought before them was Mr. Polymather's will. Now, lest it should be thought that unseemly haste was displayed in attending to this affair, while Mr. Polymathers still lay in the little next room, I must explain that, for special occasions, the nature of the funeral arrangements depended upon the result of the conference, and how deeply important such a point would be considered at Lisconnel, I need remind no one who has occasionally been perplexed by our propensity for the pinching and scraping which takes toll of a lifelong penury and a brief show of pomp may invest the last scene of all. This propensity is not seldom misconstrued into the outcome of a mere personal vanity, whereas it has its root in the worthier sentiment of veneration for our kind. Old Patty Murphy, who has subsisted all his life upon an insufficiency of potatoes and inhabited a largest sty, never loses the sense that he owes something better to himself in his character of a human being, and he takes painful steps to ensure the ultimate discharge of the debt. One of these days he who has hitherto come and gone in unimposing guise shall be born on wheels if possible, but here I mention grandeur never even dreamed of up at remote Lisconnel, in unwanted state certain to draw the gaze of every passer-by. But as if with a fine touch of courtesy, he so times his assertion of dignity that none of his fellows shall thereby be abashed, nor envy bitten. No ragged wayfarer shall wish to change places with him as he passes solemnly along, nor grudge him the unshared splendor of his somber equipage not even if it display the crowning glory of woolly black plumes to waggle over his head. Accordingly, when Pat has died on his humble bed, which is as likely as not just earth tempered with straw, under his rifted thatch, through which he may see the stars glimmer with nothing except the smoke haze and gathering mists between, he is conveyed thence with whatever pomp and circumstance his savings permit, and all his neighbors feel that the right thing has been done. It is true that Mr. Polymathers has given no sign of any such sentiment. When discreetly sounded on the subject, during his last days he had replied, Ah, man, it's very immaterial. 
in a tone of indifference as unmistakable as the phrase was ambiguous. And from this fact, coupled with his written instructions, it might, one would have thought, safely have been inferred that he desired no costly magnificence at his obsequies. Yet the point was obscured in his late host's mind by a thick cloud of doubts and scruples. Mr. Polymathers had died surprisingly rich. Not less than twenty-five pounds, seven shillings, and threepence, having been counted awe-strickenly out of his leathern pouch. The ground rents of all Lisconnel did not reach to such a figure. It had been larger still before his disastrous expedition to the university, but it had never undergone any diminution so long as he abode under Felix O'Byrne's roof. On the first Saturday after his convalescence, he had inquired, pouch in hand, and what might be the amount of my pecuniary debt to you, sir? And old O'Byrne had replied, and you spending your time putting the height of learning into the two lads' head, bedad, sir, it's debt the other way round, supposing there was to be any talk about it. The same little scene, dwindled at last into a mere form and ceremony, had taken place on every succeeding Saturday. Not that Mr. Polymathers did not feel he had grounds for more than merely formal demur, but he was then facing the steep hill of his ambition, and had sometimes to stoop as he climbed. But now, when he had turned back baffled and all his climbing was done, old Felix had no engrossing object to blunt a sense of many scruples that must be removed before he himself or his family could with honour derive profit from the event, as they would do if Mr. Polymathers' instructions were carried out, for by that document, which he had finished drawing up only just in time, all his property was left unreservedly to Nicholas O'Byrne, with the injunction that as little of it as possible might be expended upon the burying. Of course it was an extraordinary thing that such a piece of good fortune should befall such a number of pounds accrue to anybody at all, but apart from this there seemed to be nothing very strange in the bequest. Everybody knew that Mr. Polymathers had entertained a great opinion entirely of Nicholas's abilities. Time and again he had said that the lad would be heard of in the world if he got his chance of some good teaching, and he once more expressed the same conviction, only at fuller length, and in finer language, in the composition which had been the last effort of his wearied brain. It would give me, he wrote, the utmost satisfaction to think that the legacy may eventually smooth his path to the attainment of those university distinctions which have eluded my own grasp and almost his latest moment of consciousness had been pervaded by a faint thrill of pleased pride at the turn of the sentence as he read it over. This high style was not, however, maintained throughout, and the purport could not be misunderstood. Furthermore, everybody knew that he had said he had not a relation belonging to him in this world, and that being so, it was natural enough for him to make a promising and favourite pupil his heir. At first sight, therefore, no difficulties presented themselves. But old Felix slept upon the matter, and by morning grave doubts had risen in his mind. The gist of them was that, if they took and grabbed the old gentleman's bit of money, and he after dying all his loan up among them there, with ne'er a one of his own folks near him to see he had his rights, it might look ugly enough again them, and set some people past remarks he'd be long sorry to have made on him or any of his name, and that for the precluding of such animadversions it might behoove them to provide a burying, not merely decent but very respectable whatever, and to expend the remainder of Mr. Polymathers's personality upon a headstone for his grave and masses for his soul. 
to set against these apprehensions were mr polymathers wishes and nicholas's interests and the longer the old man balanced them in his mind the more perplexing became their tremulous poise so at last goaded by the urgent necessity for a prompt decision he turned to seek it among his neighbors he could not forbear a hope that their voices might be convincingly in favor of giving nicholas his chances still his strongest feeling was that it would be a relief to get the matter settled one way or the other very different in its degree of intensity was the interest with which his grandson nicholas looked forward to the issue the question to be decided seemed to him of almost as vital importance as if it were whether or no the sun should rise again next morning for him at least it depended upon that whether his world should loom back again in a dreary blankness or waken lit with new and wondrous gleams nicholas's thirst for knowledge and love of learning were much more essentially part and parcel of him than his hands and eyes and had so far found a little except dreams and desires to thrive upon even before the memorable summer evening when the gaunt old man in the curious big hat had asked for the night's lodging which lengthened into a season's sojourn he had often wandered among visions of places where there were as many books as anybody could read a dozen maybe and some people in it with a power of book learning as much perhaps as his reverence or the doctor only neither priest nor quality but just neighbors whom he could question about anything that came into his head as he used to question his grandfather and paddy ryan and terence kilfoyle until he got tired of being asked in reply musha good gracious and who could be telling you that an answer which had repeatedly left him a discouraged atom of bewilderment symbolically environed by our wide-spreading bog since mr polymathers visit these visions had grown clearer but not under any rays of hope his initiation into the elements of mathematics had pointed out the road along which he should travel but had simultaneously revealed all its obstacles insurmountable for him solitary and unequipped in those days his mind was constantly fumbling at some insoluble problem with the sense of frustration that one has who gropes vainly in the dark well knowing how a single unattainable match flare would put what he is seeking into his hands and no brighter prospect seemed to lie before him anywhere in his future so when he suddenly learned that mr polymathers had left all his money sums and sums to be spent on getting schooling for nicholas o'beirne and when the sums and sums were actually counted out on the table he felt as if a door into enchanted regions had majestically opened in a blank wall that night he went to bed in a state of joyous excitement only dashed by some pangs of self-reproach for being unable to feel more sorrow at the flickering out of his poor old teacher's dim life he had to frame excuses for himself by recollecting how his great-aunt bridget had said ah sure the creature's better off god knows what else did he do and the heart of him broke but quit out of it if he got the chance i bedad some people have all the queer good luck and when he got up with his happiness still fresh and strange in the morning there was his grandfather declaring he didn't know if they'd have a right to touch the bit of money at all it might be no thing to go do schoolin or no schoolin he wouldn't be givin people any call to say the o'burns were after playin a dirty trick at this nicholas's experience was like that of a desert traveller who should see a mirage of palms and pools grow swiftly before his delighted eyes into a substantial oasis and then anon or ever he could approach it shimmer back with all its sheen and shade into a mocking illusion again for thus did it fare with his hopes as his grandfather talked of renouncing mr polymathers's bequest moreover the grounds which the old man alleged forbade his grandson 
loathfully though he listened to utter a word of protest and even made himself half ashamed of his vehement longing to do so nicholas had been at auburn for but fourteen years but he had already entered upon his inheritance of family pride only he could not bring himself to believe that the honor of his house called for so prodigious a sacrifice and he could have urged a dozen arguments against it if some other person had been the legatee as it was all that delicacy would permit him to do for himself was to give piteously inadequate expression to his sentiments in casual remarks about the grandeur of getting a bit of learning and the difficulty of understanding some things out of one's own head altogether that day was the longest and most anxious that he had ever spent dan also though his fortunes were not involved to the same extent as his younger brothers was not easy in his mind all day he had been thinking rather badly of himself and suspecting that other people thought worse of him than he deserved and the reflection was depressing and irritating the news of the legacy certainly had not given him unmixed pleasure as he felt that it ought to have done but at the same time he was aware that he neither grudged nor envied nicholas his good fortune and that this unamiable frame of mind would nevertheless probably be ascribed to him if he betrayed any dissatisfaction or disapproval the truth was that he could not help feeling some mortification at the way in which both mr polymathers and his grandfather assumed the forge to be his destiny and portion in life dan did not by any means despise it he took an interest in the work and a pride in the fact that farmers sent their horses thither from beyond the town so well reputed was old felix o'burn's shoeing but it did not follow that he wanted to be a blacksmith all his days even if he had done so he was sixteen and consequently of an age to resent any prescribed calling especially since he knew that the selection here had been made as a result of an unfavorable comparison of his abilities with those of another person dan is no fool mind you mr polymathers had said once but for intellect you need never name him on the same day of the month as nicholas a verdict which fell with a slight shock upon dan accustomed to the precedence given by two years seniority superior strength and a more practical turn of mind what was far more serious however dan secretly cherished an ambition of his own it took the form of thinking that it would be a wonderfully fine thing if he could ever get to learn the doctoring and be able to drive about on a car like dr hamilton with a name and a remedy for everybody's ailment a particularly fine thing it seemed to understand the construction of bones and joints a knowledge which would put it in his power to prevent people from coming to such grief as for instance poor matt halloran down at duffclane who must limp on a crooked leg to the end of his days because the man who pulled in his dislocated ankle for him had made watch of it through not knowing rightly what he was about dan had been much impressed too by several cases where a few drops of brown stuff out of a bottle had put people to sleep when various aches and pains had long hindered them from closing an eye a result which the neighbors were occasionally disposed to view with mistrust as rather probably wrought through the agency of some queer old pistrogues that is charms but which to dan's mind proved the possession of a skill as enviable as it was beneficent beside it hammering out horseshoes appeared a tedious and aimless pursuit and he sometimes thumped away in a very vague dream of one of these days finding himself more congenially employed now however it was perfectly clear to him that if nicholas took off with himself to get scholarship his own portion must be to stick to the anvil for otherwise supposing his grandfather got past his work or anything else happened him there would be nobody left to look after dan's great-aunt who was not very old 
and his great-grandmother, who was such a wonderful age entirely that no one could say how much longer she mightn't live. Even the wildest dreams are not quite easy to scare away, and it was this chiefly that marred his content with Mr. Polymather's testamentary dispositions. Still, when he heard his grandfather's doubts and saw his brother's downcast looks, he became almost as anxious as Nicholas himself that the neighbors might talk away the old man's scruples and allow a will to stand. End of section 5
one of the lads must needs slip his foot and they right in the middle of the river and down with the whole lot of them like a stook of oats in a gale of wind twas twenty wonders e'er a man of them ever got his feet under him again fay now the yell every soul let you might a heard anywheres at all for some of them was thinkin the misfortune of body was apt to be swept away and mortally drowned to the back of bein hung and some of them wasn't thinkin any such a thing but as for the coffin i'll give you me word if it didn't take and set off wid itself floatin away bobbin along atop of the water as light now as if it was a leaf dropped down from the boughs archin over our heads and wasn't that curious enough and as quare as anything it was to behold the people all peltin along be the two wet banks of the river as hard as they could drive and trippin themselves up over the roots of the trees and slitherin into the pools wid the coffin just skimmin and swimmin away down the stream ahead of them and easy and pleasant as if it was a bit of pecan you might a sworn there was ne'er a nothin in it to look at it and he they were after hangin a big fine man would weigh every ounce a fourteen stone i told you it was a queer thing so where it would be sailin to nobody could say very belike out into the bay below but sure when it come where the river runs past the old church the strong current that was racin under it just gave a sort of lap round with it and washed it clean up on the flat stones at the gate goin into the burying ground and left it lyin there same as if the lads had set it down off their shoulders bedad now it was a very lucky thing it so happened there was none of the police or red coats about be reason of their getting notice the burying was somewhere else uncommon lucky it's as queer as the rest of it said peter dooley who had heard the story before that nobody among them had had the wit to put a few brickbats in it or some good big lumps of heavy stones stones is plenty and cheap enough they're things you haven't the sellin of then i'll go bail said old felix he spoke in resentment of the interruption but mr dooley took the speech as a flattering tribute to his business capacity and acknowledged it with a good-humoured smirk so bridget might have spared herself the uneasiness which made her say hurriedly to her brother if you were lookin for mr polymathers bit of writin felix i left it lyin convenient to you under the plate there on the table oh i be dad that's what's been botherin me said the old man reachin for it i dunno rightly what to say to it but sure any of yous that like can be readin it and see what he says for yourselves reading was not a question simply of liking with all members of the company but everybody could hold the paper and look wise and if he were none the more so afterwards that may have been only because he knew the contents of it beforehand when it was peter dooley's turn to examine the signature closely and said but what name's this he's put to it john campion i see but divil a sign of any polly mathers ah that was another thing was bothering me too said old o'burn rather dejectedly a little while ago when dr hamilton was coming to see him for the old gentleman told him campion was his name and it appears polly mathers is some description of trade and not rightly called to anybody at all so i was thinkin he was maybe annoyed wid our callin him out of his name all the while but he said all that ailed it was it was a deal too good for him and better pleased he seemed he would keep on wid it oh ay john campion's right enough i never heard of any such a trade as polly matherin said his son-in-law would it be anything in the peddlerin line is it peddlerin said o'burn and he that took up wid learnin and literature he could a told you the price of a penny loaf fay man if i was maggie i'd just put a good dab of strong glue in your place behind the counter down below and stick you standin steady in it for buyin and sellin's all the notion you have in your head here or there peddlerin says he well at all events said peter dooley unperturbed he's got together a decent little fortune one way or the other 
Maybe he didn't come by it any worse, but sure, that's no great odds now. And plain enough, he says the young chap's there to have it. That's all the one thing with yourself. But anyhow, I don't know who could easy contrive to be taking it off you, and he leaving no one belonging to him. And you have it safe enough. Grab all you can and keep a hold of it when you've got it, says I. But you're safe enough, no fear. Nicholas, watching his grandfather's face from his corner, would have given ten years of his life to throttle his uncle's reassuring speech midway. "'There's no mistake, I should say, about what he was intending,' said Terence Kilfoyle, in whose hands the paper was by this time. "'And who'd be apt to know better than himself what he had in his mind, so long as he was right in his head? And if he wasn't, it's little likely he'd be to have got that written. Hard enough work it is, according to what I can see, even when a body has all his wits to the fore, said old Paddy Ryan, whose acquaintances did as a rule get more out of breath over a letter than over a wrestling match or the recapture of an active pig. Mad people do be surprising cute some whiles, mind you, said Mrs. Carberry. There was a demented body used to be up at our place. Daft Jimmy, they called him. And if you axed him the time of day, he'd tell you to the minute, exacter than any clock that ever struck, and he be like not within a mile of era a one. It seems a sight of money to be layin' out on learnin', pursued old Patty. I don't know where'd you be gettin' the valley of it that away unless he was learning everything twixt over, same as you put two coats of whitewash on a wall, if you're after mixing a drop more than you want, you might do it then. His friend's arguments and illustrations had apparently a depressing effect upon old Felix, and he said with impatience, Weary on it, man alive, sure there's no doubt about what he was meanin' at all at all. The question is, have we any call to be taking him at his word, and spending it away from aught to do him a benefit, the burying and masses and such? That might be a different thing, said Mrs. Carberry. I'd scarce think it, said Terence Kilfoyle, considering he'll say no more to make it so. The job's out of his hand, and it'll stay the way he left it. He might have changed his mind afore now, for anything we can tell, said Mrs. Carberry. Deed then, he might so, the poor man, heaven be his bed, said Mrs. Dooley. You could ax the priest about it, Tim O'Meara said diffidently, out of the melancholy muteness which it was his habit to maintain. That's as much as to say it should go for masses, said old Felix, clutching at any shred of definite opinion for it's only in the nature of things his reverence would be recommending them but tim shrank away from the shadow of responsibility protesting och not at all not at all i wasn't as much as saying anything the old man tossed up his chin disgustedly and meditated gloomily during a brief pause there's no denying he said then that poor mr polymathers had a wonderful great opinion of himself over there he nodded towards Nicholas's corner, and used this periphrasis with a sense that he had taken a precaution against perilously arousing the boy's vanity. Times and again last summer he was saying to me, the latter do credit to us, yet if he had his chances, a pity it would be, he said, if he didn't ever get to school, or maybe college itself, and gave him his books and all. But sure, I don't know would that make it look any the better for us if we was to be grabbin his bit of money and we the only people he had to see he got ferrety after he was gone never a word had i again schoolin and college if there would be no doubtin over the matter but there's some things you can't stand too clear of like the heels of a kickin horse it might have a queer bad appearance real mean and long sorry i'd be for that what did you say now? He looked slowly round the flickering room, but met with no response from old or young. All silent, from his mother, asleep in her elbow chair by the hearth, to his grandson Nicholas, very wide awake, 
in a nook beyond her. Then his eyes travelled across to the opposite corner, and as they lit there upon his other grandson, he specialized his question into, What did you say, Dan? Dan, thus abruptly called upon, was intensely conscious that two eyes shining out of the shadow over against him had fixed him with an unwavering gaze and it is hard to say how he would have answered their urging if at the same moment mr dooley at his elbow had not been loudly whispering to mrs dooley colleges sure that's just talk he has be way of an excuse for keepin it a great notion he has of spendin it on colleges he knows better be dad mr dooley who was rather like several sorts of rodent animals in the face or a smile at his own penetration i don't know but it might look ugly dan said suddenly he was staring straight before him yet he knew somehow as if by a sixth sense that the shining eyes opposite ceased their watch with an angry flash and he had scarcely spoken before he would have given anything to call back his irrevocable speech his grandfather's puzzled will closed on the opinion with a vice-like grip, as if at a touch given to a powerful spring. Indecision was with him an unwanted mood, from which it was an irresistible relief to escape, even at some cost, and nobody who knew him could suppose that his mind, once made up, would alter. "'Begora, Dan, I believe it's true for you,' he said. "'Twould be no thing to go do.' and devil a bit of me'll do it whatever over from the burying and bit of gravestone may go for masses sort a penny of it one of the o'burns will touch so nicholas lost his chances which seems a pity when one considers how for the sake of bringing them to him old mr polymathers dazed and enfeebled and hope bereft came tramping on that long long journey day after weary day under the scowling wintry sky and against the ruffling blasts back again across the breadth of ireland the road was all strewn for him with the wreckage of his shattered dream and the one gleam of consolation that lighted him on the way had been the thought that his savings might now give a help to the lad up at lisconnel this had often been in his mind when he set off shivering in the bleak morning and when he stopped to shift his over-heavy bundle and when he roused himself painfully from the bewildering lethargies that fell upon him but he had reckoned without the pride of the o'burns it was a pity too that the affair should have led to an estrangement between the two brothers which set in as tacitly as a black frost for neither of them ever said a word to the other about dan's intervention this silence left him in the thorny grip of misgivings as to the motives with which nicholas might be charging him that he had done it on purpose to spoil nicholas's chances out of spite was one of these and although dan knew very well that he had spoken from an altogether different impulse he was conscious of having had feelings which seemed to give him a cruelly clear insight into the possible workings of nicholas's mind conceitin that it was because i was envyin him that's what he's thinkin again me he said to himself as the days went by and he perceived or fancied that nicholas in his disconsolate moping about had no other aim than to keep away from wherever dan might be but dan's unhappiness took an acuter phase in a fortnight or so when nicholas began to resume his mathematical studies there lies just opposite the o'burns front door a low turf bank gently sloping and mostly clothed with short fine grass but liable to be cut into brown squares if sods are wanting for roofing a shed or for spreading a green layer of scraws under new thatch this had been done on a rather large scale in the past autumn and the boys had been in the habit of utilizing the smooth bare patches as tablets whereon to trace with pointed sticks or any handy implements borrowed from the forge 
the figures and diagrams according in Mr. Polymathers's scientific lectures. Nicholas now, albeit he had buried both teacher and hope, began once more to draw his circles and triangles and polygons on the soft mould, as it grew damply and darkly through the wearing snow coverlid. Sometimes in the excitement of demonstrating involved relations between ABs and BCs, he would for a while forget his disappointment almost as completely as he did the wet-winged winds that had been flapping and wheeling about the house ever since the thaw set in. His obliviousness could not, however, ensure him against the effects of cold shower-baths, and before long his geometrical drawing was done to the accompaniment of a hollow-sounding cough, which made Dan remember a time some years ago when Nicholas had been so seriously ill with pleurisy that voices had said at their door, "'Ah, the creature he'll scarce last a night. Dr. Hamilton has no opinion of him at all. Deed now his poor grandfather's to be pity, losing such a fine young lad.' and he also remembered having occasionally heard his great aunt say that Nicholas took after his poor mother, and would never comb a grey head. Now, therefore, the figure of Nicholas sitting out on the bank in a vibrating mist of rain, with his feet in a puddle, and his hair flickering in damp strands upon his thin face, became for Dan an ominous and saddening spectacle. But while he was ruefully contemplating it one day, a happy idea struck him. He would get Nicholas some clean white paper to draw his diagrams on, and then belike he'd be content to sit in be the fire instead of to be catching his death scrawling out there in the mud under teams of rain. Grand writing paper was to be had at Isaac Tarpey's down in Ballybrosna, and Dan at this time happened to be in possession of a whole shilling, which he dedicated more than willingly to the purchase. Isaac Tarpey presided over the Ballybrosna post office, which was in some respects a singularly complete establishment, as not only was the raw material for a letter kept in stock there, but the letter itself could, for a consideration, be written on the premises by the postmaster in person. It is true that Isaac did not supply more than the barest necessities of scribes, the bread and water, so to speak, of stationery, the very plainest pens and paper and ink. He kept his ink in a single moderate-sized jar, out of which he measured pennies' worth and hapworths into the various receptacles brought by customers who came to demand a sup or a drain. On these sales his profits were certainly enormous, not less than cent per cent, but then the consumption of that article was extremely small in Bellybrosna. It took a long while to reach the sediment at the bottom of the jar, and Isaac's letter-writing, done at the rate of threepence apiece, probably was a more lucrative branch of his business, though the correspondence of the town was not large enough to put his services in frequent requisition. Partly on this account, and partly because he was by nature a strong conservative, Mr. Tarpey set his face sternly against the spread of education. He was distressed by the appearance of any symptoms of it among the neighboring youth, even when it took the form of an inquiry for his limp paper and skewer-like pens. In fact, the diffusion of penmanship was what he most seriously deprecated and discountenanced. The Lord knows, his main argument ran, the foolery them spalpeens'll be gabbin promiscuous would sicken you, without giving them the chance to be sitter down easy and invented it. His wife once suggested that the creatures might be more sensible-like when they were taking time to consider themselves, but Isaac said, pigs may fly. At the time when Dan came for his paper, the office was occupied by Nora Fotrell, engaged in dictating a letter to her sweetheart, Stevie Flynn, away in Manchester. 
the composition still looked discouragingly brief despite isaac's big flourishing hand yet nora's ideas had already run so short that she was staring in quest of more up among the cobwebby rafters over her head you might say said she after a pause that i hope he's gettin his health where he is i've said that twist before isaac objected severely och murder have you said nora reverting to the rafters with a distracted gaze couldn't you tell him the price your father got for the last beast he sold said isaac bedad i might so said nora twas only thirty shillin but it'd take up a good bit of room and look a mr tarpey couldn't we leave the rest of the page clean as like as not the bastoon wouldn't be botherin his head spellin out the half of it the adoption of this course expedited nora's love-letter to a happy close but when dan took her place at the counter isaac assured him not without satisfaction that they were clever and clean run out of all their writing paper barrin it might be a sort of butt end of loose sheets left litterin at the bottom of the drawer and they that thick with dust you could be plantin potatoes in them for by gettin mildewed lyin up in the damp so long it was not so much compunction at dan's disappointed countenance as an irresistible hankering after a good bargain that ultimately led the postmaster to sweep his uninviting remnant together and fix upon it the price of sixpence the charge was exorbitant considering the small quantity and damaged state of the goods yet dan carried off his little packet quite contentedly announcing that he would step over again for another six pennyworth next week when as isaac reluctantly admitted a fresh supply of stationery would have arrived as dan left the office he passed an unknown gentleman tall with a shrewd sallow face dark peaked beard and alert grey eyes who had been leaning against the door while the bargain was struck the stranger was mr alfred b willett of new york a wealthy engineer who on his way home from europe had been visiting his friend dr hamilton of Ballybrosna. his curiosity now was roused by dan's evident eagerness to acquire materials for the drawing of diagrams the pursuit striking him as so strangely incongruous with the aspect of the brown-faced stalwart ragged youth that he stepped inside when the place was empty to make inquiries on the subject the postmaster's information was to the effect that the o'burns above at the forge had always had the name of being very decent respectable people up to then and he never before seen any of the young ones settin themselves up to be askin after such things he hoped it mightn't be a sign that the old man was goin foolish and let the lads get past his control but sure enough we must all of us put up with growin good for nothin some time unless we happen to have never been worth anything to begin with and he wished he had a penny paid him for every one of that sort he'd met in the course of his life the cynical disquisition was not very enlightening however next week when dan slipped over again for his second sixpenny worth mr willard it chanced was there too having called to report on the excessive thickness and other undesirable peculiarities of some ink lately supplied to him it had been in fact composed of the sediment artfully diluted with a drop of vinegar but isaac tarpey said it was thick with the strength was in it and set about uncorking his fresh jar with an affronted air when his customer persisted in pointing out that its adhesive properties were less valuable in ink than in glue meanwhile mr willett fell into a conversation with dan which ended in his engaging the lad to accompany him as guide on a shooting expedition next day the arrangement turned out satisfactorily and was repeated more than once with the consequence that dan and the stranger talked about many things in the course of several long tramps until one evening the latter sitting on a stone wall after a steep pull uphill made dan an offer which caused the most familiar objects to seem unreal because a marvellous dream was coming true among them 
for Mr. Willett proposed to take Dan home with him and have him taught whatever he most wished to learn. "'You're a smart lad, Dan,' he said, "'and I reckon you'll make more of that in the States than in this country.' "'Ah, the doctrine,' said Dan, turning as red as the young sorrow leaves and letting his darling wish slip out in his surprise as involuntarily as he would have blinked at a flash of lightning. But next moment he remembered Nicholas and fell silent. Nicholas, who had not looked him in the face since that snowy evening weeks ago, the dream seemed to stop coming true. "'There's no need to make up your mind in a hurry,' said Mr. Willett. "'You can be thinking it over between this and Monday.' Dan did think it over deeply that night, and the next day, and the day after. He thought how fine, it rather fearful, it would be to go on such a journey, and what a splendid thing to learn the doctor in business, and some day come home again, able to cure everybody of anything that ailed them. For out in the States, like enough, they had all manner of contrivances the people over here had never taught but Dr. Hamilton, whose skill was occasionally baffled. He imagined the neighbor's surprise when he came driving up on his car. If possible, he would be driving a little blue roan mare like Farmer Finnacoon's Rosemary, with whom he had made friends in the course of many shoeings. He thought he would be sorry to miss seeing them all for so long, and yet it would certainly be very pleasant in a way to get to a place where things were a bit different sometimes, not like here where when you were getting up in the morning you knew what was bound to be happening all day just as well as you did when you were going to bed that night. And next he thought that such days would be coming to Nicholas, while he himself was away seeing and learning all manner of everything, and that if he had held his tongue that time, maybe Nicholas would have got his chance with Mr. Polymathers's money, instead of its all being spent away on nothing and he thought that it wasn't his fault. For what else could he say when he was asked all of a minute except the first thing that came into his head? And he wondered how it would be if anything happened to his grandfather. Nicholas wasn't over-strong and too young altogether besides. And then he thought again that Mr. Willett was cleverer than anybody he had ever seen, and more good-natured. It was a pleasure to go about with him and people were great fools to give up their chances. Maybe Nicholas might get another some day, and maybe Mr. Polymathers had been mistaken in thinking that he was the one best worth teaching. All these things Dan thought, and the result of his cogitations was that on the Monday he stole a sheaf of Nicholas's most complicated cobweb-like diagrams from their hiding place in the wall brought them with him when he went by appointment to meet his patron off beyond Knockfinney. And when Mr. Willett said to him, Well, Dan, what about the states of the doctrine? He replied inconsequently by holding out the sheets of paper with the explanation. It's me brother Nicholas, sir, does be doing these mostly out of his own head. Mr. Willett looked at them for some minutes with interested ejaculations. Upon my word, he then said, if these were done out of his own head, he must have about as much mathematics located in it by nature as a spider. "'Aren't they good for anything at all, then, sir?' said Dan, not knowing exactly what he hoped and feared. "'Good? They're astonishing,' said Mr. Willard. He asked some questions about Nicholas's age, schooling, and so forth, after which he said, "'You must take me to see this brother of yours, Dan.' I expect he'll have got to come right along with us. But Dan stared round and round the spacious brown-purple floor they were standing on, and after a far-off flight of wild fowl, and up at the sky, where the clouds travel without let or hindrance, before he answered hesitatingly, The two of us couldn't ever both go, sir. How could we be leaving the forge and all on me, old grandfather? and Nicholas never makes any great hand of the work. "'Ah, is that the way the land lies?' said Mr. Willett, as if half impatient and half amused, but not best pleased. He looked hard at Dan, and thought he saw how matters stood. 
you've no mind to leave the old grandfather and the rest of the concern but you think it would be more in the other lad's line as a matter of fact dan was at that particular moment feeling strongly how easily he could have reconciled himself to the separation and how entirely it would be the making of him to do so but he did not gainsay mr willett's statement to himself he said he's a right to have his chances and the one of us is bound to stop in it a mode of expressing his sentiments which showed that he had much need of culture and aloud nicholas always had a powerful wish to be gettin some learnin and i'm a fool to him at the geometry anyway the upshot of it all was that when some six weeks later mr alfred b willett sailed for new york nicholas o'byrne accompanied him and dan o'byrne remained at lisconnel it was on a gleamful april day that they set out with soft gusts roaming all around as if they had come from very far off and were eagerly exploring the strange places and many light clouds flitting up swiftly above as if they had a long journey before them and were in a joyous flurry over it dan spent the slow-paced hours in the forge where he hammered loud and long and seldom looked across the threshold the pleasantest thought in his mind was the remembrance of a short conversation which he had had with nicholas while they were tying up mr polymathers's old books at the kitchen door just as the grey chink in the east filled with rose light and the earliest breeze came over the bog waving the withered grasses dan had said to nicholas sure i wouldn't be grudging you e'er a bit of good luck lad and nicholas had replied and never did after nicholas's departure many days bad and good rose on lisconnel but few of them brought any tidings of the absent letters passed now and then laggard and uninstructive as such letters must be and they grew rarer and briefer as time went on perhaps a dozen years had gone by when dan one day received simultaneously an american newspaper and a parcel the newspaper was marked with large blue chalk crosses at a paragraph which related how the degree of doctor of science had been conferred honoris causa upon mr nicholas o'byrne by the university of sarabraxville and in the parcel more astonishing still was a brown covered book lettered on the back treatise on conic sections by nicholas o'byrne by this time dan had been left alone at the forge but he was courting mary ryan mick ryan's daughter so he naturally conveyed to her this remarkable news it produced a profound impression old patty her grandfather was with difficulty brought to realize the fact that they were after making a doctor of young nicholas o'byrne him that went out to the states the year before the famine and when he had got the idea into his head it seemed to act like a swivel joint and set him nodding to the tune of well to be sure glory be to god young nicholas o'byrne i wish to goodness he'd come over and cure mick poor man said mick's wife for he hasn't been worth picking up off the road ever since he was bad with the fever last year and he might as well be drinking so much ditch water as the old stuff dr carson's given him ah but it's not the medical doctor and nicholas has gone to said dan the shadow of a shadow crossing his face there'd be different letters for that and he proceeded to read out the report of the degree conferred honoris causa upon the distinguished young irishman mr nicholas o'byrne whose recent contributions to the study of the higher mathematics had aroused so much interest in scientific circles ay true for you dan said mary you don't hear them callin dr carson an honorary gauzy dan's shred of latin had grown rustier than the oldest iron in his stock but was not yet utterly worn away the meaning of that he explained would be be reason of honour 
and i should suppose they'd give it to him for the sake of what all he's after doin bedad then dan said mrs mick some one had a right to be given you an honorary cowsy yourself considerin the cure you have to make it on mr finnecoon's old mare and everybody of the opinion she'd never stand on four feet again to the age's end och blathers ma'am dan said modestly sure anybody with the sight of their eyes might easy enough had seen what ailed the creature that was no great cometh her and look at what nicholas is after doin he wrote a book no less the treatise on conic sections created an even stronger sensation than the news of the honorary degree especially among those who had letters enough to spell out the familiar name on the title page dan's mary was not one of these scholars but she found another page to admire saying that the circles drew in and out of each other like a lot of soap bubbles had an uncommon tasty look and so had all them weedy corners with the long beams between the moral of a chain harrow you couldn't mistake it sure it's proud of it anybody might be probably nicholas was very proud of this first air of his invention diagrams and all whether it ever had any successors seems doubtful certainly none of them arrived at his old home but his treatise is still safely stowed away there in the corner of the dresser most likely it is the only copy of o'burn on conic sections existing in ireland and who would expect to find it lodged in a smoke-stained cabin on the wild bogland between Duffclane and Lisconnel. Chapter 9. Boy's Wages One leaden-roofed morning in the winter after his brother Nicholas had gone to the States, young Dan O'Byrne was in rather low spirits and rather out of humour. It was not unnatural that such a mood should occasionally overtake him, since he had reached apparently a straight and monotonous track of road which would have looked interminable to the eyes of seventeen had not his household companions been now all declining folk whose presence brought under his constant observation the last stages of a long journey in december gone half a century or so of smithy work even with some unlicensed doctoring and illicit distilling thrown in was not by any means the future that he would have liked his oracle to predict for him and though he forecast it accurately enough without the intervention of any soothsaying this no more helped him to avoid it than if he had been an old-world tragical hero whose friends were seeking by vain device to circumvent the promulgated decrees of his destiny dan indeed took no steps of that sort for him as for most of us the skirts of circumstances were as the meshes of the net in which fate holds us and his evil star was an object of which it seemed very hard to get a good grip i have always wondered myself how people set about it at any rate dan continued to walk under his that is to say if it were really bad luck that kept him at the forge upon this point there might be differences of opinion terence kilfoyle for instance who dropped in to escape from a snow shower in the course of that morning would not evidently have taken such a view for when dan said something grumblingly about lisconnel being a slack sort of a place where one didn't get much chance of doing anything at all he replied be dad now if i'd the fine business you and your grandfather have to be put in me hand to i wouldn't call the queen me aunt in those times the district around our bogland was more thickly inhabited than it is at present and the blacksmith's jobs were proportionately plentier nowadays the forge is liable to long spells of silence but dan who as young dan has been superseded philosophizes over them and talks no more about chances on this occasion his remarks were overheard 
by his grandfather, perhaps because the old man had begun to have thoughts of chances which made him sensitive to signs of discontent in his assistant. And by and by, when Terence had gone, he said, Terence said a very sensible word. A lad might easy get a worse start in life. Aye, indeed, he might so, if it was twist as slack. But anyhow, there's them here that it'd be hard set to make a shift for themselves if the two of us was out of it and i'm apt to be quittin before biddy at all events to which dan replied why what talk was there of quittin and the subject ceased out of the conversation during the subsequent silence dan thought among other things that it was easy for his grandfather to be talkin but in this he made a mistake for old o'burn remembered vividly that he had once had his own restless ambitions and his chances too of realizing them in times when he did more stirring things than merely forge pikeheads. Therefore he guessed what lent an unnecessary vehemence to his grandson's hammering, and if he could have thought of any consolatory remark, he would have made it. But it only occurred to him to say that the days would soon be lengthened now anyway, and even to himself this seemed cold comfort. Dan replied, Och, they're plenty long enough and sent a thick swarm of fiery bees flitting up the dark-throated chimney. That evening, when Dan closed the broad-leafed forge doors, he shut himself out into a world as black and white as moonlight on turf and snow could make it. Though the morning's flutter of snow had left but a meagre sprinkling on that great bogland, the moonbeams touching every scattered flake seemed to gather it all up widely in one stark spectral gleam far away towards the horizon this doled off into a shadowy zone of mist where the wind was muttering and moaning to itself dimly heard across the hushed floor of the night beyond that dan was aware wistfully of regions unknown with all their possibilities fascinating and mysterious but he had small scope for speculation about what he should find when he opened the house door fast by and in fact he discovered everything and everybody just as he could have foretold the fire-lit room was filled with the busy weaving of the web that ruddy gleams and russet shadows never got finished swiftly as they glanced and overhead the black spaces between the rafters gloomed down like inlets of a starless sky. There sat his great-grandmother, smoking her dudeen in her nook by the hearth and her big cloak, a very little of wizened old woman to a great many heavy dark blue folds. There too knitted her grey-haired daughter Bridget, who said, as she did every evening well dan so you're come in and would have not much more to say for herself that night except the rosary and his grandfather who had come in just before him was lighting his pipe in the opposite chimney corner a year ago his brother nicholas would have thrust a head all eyes and rumpled hair into a patch of bright flickerings to pour over the tattered arithmetic book but by this time his absence had become a matter of course the only at all unusual feature was joe denny the blind fiddler who had called in on his way home and had a drop of poteen and a farrel of wholemeal cake yet joe was indeed a tolerably common incident and his jokes altered not he had begun his parting one which was to the effect that sorra a man in the country of connaught could see clearer than himself if the night was dark enough when dan's arrival interrupted him and made him declare taking out his fiddle that twould be a poor case if the lad didn't get air a tune at all dan was not much in the humour for tunes but he said ay joe give us a one man alive and joe struck up with twangle and squeak he was playing over the hills and far away 
over the hills and beyond the sea over the hills and a great way off and the wind it blew when a shuddering knock on the door seemed to beat down the shriller sounds and stop the sliding bow dan went to see who it was and found standing on the threshold a tall lean old man in a long ragged coat with a thick knotted black thorn in his hand a few hard frozen granules pattered in at the open door which admitted a glimpse of the moon tarnished by a thin drift of scudding cloud god save all here said the old man who was a stranger good evening to you kindly sir responded old felix from his fireside corner and wouldn't you be steppin within i'm only axing me way to the place below there Ballybrosna, beyond duffclane said the old man it's the road i must be steppin for i'm more than a trifle late but he came slowly forward into the room as if lured by the fire at which he looked hungrily he stooped and limped very much and when he tore off his black caubeen the sharp gleam of his white hair seemed to comment coldly on those infirmities i'm within a mile or so of it or maybe less by now i should suppose he said fay then it's the long mile said the fiddler put half a dozen to it and you'll be nearer and bedad it's easier work doin that in your head than on your feet be the same token i must be leggin it or they'll conceit i'm lost at our place and he stepped out darkly into the veiled moonlight with us through and weary on it the old man said to himself and then to the others is it that far as he says ay it is every inch said old o'byrne and too long a tramp for you altogether sir if i might make so free for the matter of that said the ragged old man proudly i've walked the double of it and more times and again without so much as considerin but your road's a bit heavy to-night with the snow and cold that's the worst of the roads said the little old woman peering suddenly out of a corner the longer you walk them the longer they'll grow on you till you begin to think there's no end to them and after that the best contrivance is to keep off of them cliver and clean the way i do then there's no length at all ah ma'am but twouldn't be very handy if the young folk took to try on that plan the old man said we're bound to keep steppin out a short silence followed this remark because the hearers felt uncertain whether he meant the pronoun for a jest to evade the difficulty old o'byrne bade dan fetch a mug for a drop of poteen and meanwhile said to the stranger sit you down sir and take a taste of the fire where might you be travellin from this day i was livin over in innisloan said the old man sitting down on a creepy stool musha then you didn't ever come that far all on ind sure it's miles untold twas the day afore yesterday i quit last night i slept at sullenberg and this morning i met a man who loaned me a grand lift in his cart i used to know a man lived in innisloan said old o'byrne by the name of brian english he come by here of an odd while after the stuff ay bedad and a very decent old creature he was meself's one of the demrodies young christie they call me but old christie that was me poor father's dead this while back thank you kindly lad the man said to dan who now handed him a little deft mug half full of whisky why you're nigh as long a fellow as meself are you good at the wrestling och i'm no great things whatever dan replied with becoming modesty there's not many heavy weights in the parish who'd care to stand up to me said this young christie holding the mug in a gaunt tremulous hand fay it's no ways for i'd they'd been out about it since the time i come near breakin rick ty's neck i've noticed that begorra now every soul thought i had him massacred he said with a transient gleam of genuine complacency you might have heard tell of it belike it'd be happenin 
before my recollection, sir, maybe, said Dan, looking at him perplexedly, if twas apt to have been a longish while ago. Twasn't long to say, said the old man. He drank the spirits lingeringly in slow sips, and seemed to sit up straighter as he did so. Then he set down the empty mug on the table and said, Boys' wages. But he had scarcely uttered the words when he perceived that he had thought aloud irrelevantly and made haste to cover the slip. I'd better be getting on with meself, he said, rising. Thank you kindly. That's an elegant fire you have. He looked at it regretfully, but turned resolutely towards the door, still open and framing the broad, dim whiteness out away to the bounding curtain of gloom. It's a grand thing, he said defiantly, to have all the world before you. The sentiment was not accepted without qualification. That depends, said old O'Byrne. Some whiles, I question, would you find anything in it better than a warm corner and a pipe of tobacco, if you tramped the whole of it, and you might happen a deal worse. What do you say, mother? She was knocking ashes out of her pipe bowl against the wall, and nodded in a assent. It's no place for people that can keep shut of it, she said. If you're near a chance of getting into it, said Dan, I don't know what great good it does, you being there afore or behind. Or if you knew there was nothing left in it, you'd want to be going after, said his great aunt, half to herself. Well, whatever way you look at it, said the strange old man, I've a notion I've a right to be getting something more out of it, be now, than boy's wages. Ay, it's time I was, boy's wages, the lion spalpeen. If you axed me, sir, said old O'Byrne, I'd say twas time somebody else would be getting the wages. Isn't there any childer to be earning for you? Haven't you e'er a son that you need be trapped in the country that fashion, let alone talking about all the world, wild like? I've a son, truth have, if that was all, said the old man, turning away angrily, then it's that much better off than me you are. The only one I had he took and died on me himself, and his poor wife a couple of days after him, God be good to them, when the lad there wasn't scarce the height of that stool, and less the size on his brother. That's a way now in the States getting all manner of a fine education. Very decent poor children they always was too, but it was a bad job. He might have done worse again you than that, said Christy Dermody, be the powers he might. He had retreated as far as the door, but now he faced round and stood on the edge of the thin snow, leaning his right shoulder against the post and looking in at the other old man by the fire. He might have fooled you for years and years and made a laughing stock of you with everybody about the place and me with ne'er a thought of any such a thing. He might so and bad luck to him, foosterin' about and conceitin' to be doin' a fair day's work when he's the creep of a snail on him and the strength of a rat. That's what I heard Tim Riley sayin', and I'm goin' home on the Saturday night. But if I come creepin' after him, the young beast, he'd maybe had reason to remember it, and himself and the wife lettin' on there was nothin' like me, and he callin' me to come into his room. I heard him plain enough all the while. No fear, but I wouldn't be lettin' on. There's ne'er a hapworth ailin' him. Troth, he may call till he's choked afore ever I come next or nigh him, and sendin' the little girl slitherin' to say her daddy wanted me. I told her want might be his master. Sure they're all the one pack, and the widest width there is in this world, I'll be keepin' between them and me. Shut of them I'll be for good and all, and I'll make me fortin' yet, and no thanks to him. What talk have they of old men, boys' wages? Good night to you all. To those in the room it seemed as if he dropped away back into the wan dusk behind him, and the next moment they saw him in motion a few paces distant, limping fast, and gesticulating as though he was still carrying on his monologue. That old creature's astray in his mind, I missed out, said old O'Byrne, and I wouldn't wonder if he was after getting bad treatment among his own people. Goodness pity him, said his sister Bridget. 
it's a cruel perisher night and snowin' thicker where will he get at at all and carryin' naught but an old stick we'd better have kept him sure we couldn't have stopped him anyhow said the blacksmith no more than one of them flusterin blasts goin' by when a body's took up wid unreasonable notions you might as well be hammerin cold iron as offerin to persuade him different but he'll maybe turn in at the gallagher's they watched him until the dark imprints of his receding steps in a thin snow sheet could no longer be distinguished and then dan closed the door shutting out the wide world and the fortune seeker things is queer and contrary he said to himself some two hours afterwards they were all sitting round the fire still it was nearly nine o'clock which is late in lisconnel but they found it hard to detach themselves from the cordial grasp of the warm glow bridget however had put by her needles and begun to tell her beads when another knock broke in upon them he's come back belike said old o'burn but when dan opened the door the person who stood there though likewise tall and gaunt and ragged had grizzled black hair and was not more than middle-aged his face was hollow-cheeked and drawn and his eyes glittered while he shivered and panted the night had grown wilder as the moon sank low and the snow went past the door like rapid wafts of ghostly smoke this newcomer stumbled into the room without ceremony as if half blinded and said breathlessly did any of yous be chance see an old man go in this road to-day an old ancient man something lame be the name of christie darmody i sure enough himself was in it not so long ago said old o'burn if it hadn't been you twas very apt to have been him come back in the man's face one trouble seemed to be relieved by another at the tidings glory be to goodness then that i've heard tell of him at last he said but god help the creature what's to become of him streelin about this freezin night the snow's as dry as male dust perished he'll be och he's the terrible man to go do such a thing on us what way did he quit it's me old father sir that's over eighty years of age and is he after strayin away on you said old o'burn following him since yesterday mornin i am said the other when it's in me bed i should be by rights for i'm that destroyed with the cold on me chest i've scarce a bit of breath in me body but sure what matter if i can come be the creature again is it that away he went did you notice you're bound to wait till the flurry of the wind's gone by said old o'burn for his visitor pointed out into a shrieking whirl shrilling higher and fiercer sorra a minute you'd lose for you couldn't stir a step in that or see a stim sit you down a while what was it set him rovin did he say anything agin us anything of being treated bad well i wouldn't say he seemed altogether satisfied in himself said old o'burn remembering his suspicions something he said of being made a fool of and told lies to and gettin boys wages said dan ay ay with us through that was the very notion he had goodness help us what will we do at all with him you see sir me father's a wonderful proud-minded man he is that and a great big man and as strong as ten he was until he got real old entirely so it's cruel bad he thinks of not being able for everything the way he used to be and he won't let on but he is be no manner of manes he won't deed no he says he's as good a man as ever he was in his life end of section six This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 7 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 7 Belike now he's of the opinion the sun doesn't drop down out of the sky of an evening, said little old Mrs. O'Byrne with sarcasm. What does the old body expect? I don't know, ma'am, I don't know. Sure it's again nature and reason. There's meself getting as grey as a badger, and no ways that supple as I was, but me father's a terrible clever man. You'd never get the better of an argument with him, for he wouldn't listen to a word you'd be saying. So you see the way of it was. The two of us is working this great while on Mr. Blake's land. That's a decent man enough. And it might be three year ago, he says to me one Saturday night, for by good luck, twas me and not me father, he'd mostly be payin'. Says he to me, Look at here, Ned, it's the last time I'll be givin' man's wages to your father, for be dad an infant child to do as much as he any day of the week. So I'll put him on boy's wages, he says. That'll be three shillings and every penny as much as he's worth, says he. And sure I knew it was the truth he was saying, but twould break me father's heart. So naught better could I do only to make out twas he would be getting the man's wages and meself the boy's. Different reasons I contrived, he said, with some natural pride in the details of his strategy, but mostly I let on twas because of me being such a fool about the horses they couldn't trust me with any except the old ones. Anyway, me father was content enough. Fay, some whiles he seemed a bit set up like, considering he had the pull over me, and he'd be saying, What at all would we do without him, and I such an omadon? Never a cross word we had until last week I got laid up with this mischancy cold and the pain in me chest. So sorrow afoot could I go to me work, and I well knew the whole thing had come out if he went when I didn't. Bedad, I dreamed it all the night asleep and awake till I was fairly murdered in me head. To be sure, said old O'Byrne, that's the worst of letting on. If anything goes crooked, it's like the bottom burst out of a sack of mail. You're carrying about nothing at all before you know what's happening to you. Well, we done the best we could, me wife and me, to dispersuade him off of going on Saturday. Bad wit the cold, too, we said he was but och not a foot of him but would go so barney mcauliffe was telling me wife when the men were paying in the yard me father he ups and says to mr blake beg pardon sir but you're after giving me no more than me son's money and it's meself was working this week not him and mr blake says just going off in a hurry what are you talking about ma'am whither now you don't suppose i've been paying you full wages that hasn't done a stroke of work worth naming this half dozen year that'll have to content you till ned's back again and barney says my father had ne'er a word out of him but just went home dazed like and me wife says when he come in he sits down on the form be the door and never opens his lips so she knew right well what ailed him and she said everything she could think of how it's destroyed we'd be only for him now i was laid up and the wonderful man he was and this way and that way but never a word he heeded nor near the fire he wouldn't come and had her heart scalded seeing him sitting there in the draught of the door and i meself was tired calling him to come in and spake to me and i lying in bed but next or nigh me he never come not even for little maggie that he always thought a heap of and the next morning, if he wasn't quit out of it early afore anybody knew, in the bitter black frost and a queer threatening of snow. So then as soon as I heard tell, I up with me and come after him. Troth, I left the wife frettin' wild, the creature, thinkin' I'd get me death. But what else could I do? And now I must be steppin' on again. Och, no, thank you, lad, if I took a drop of spirits, I'd be choked with coffin but you might just set me on the right road. I'll go along with him, said Dan, aside to his grandfather, and if I can bring him or the both of them back here I will. It's my belief he's as bad as he can stick together. So Dan and old Dermody's son went out into the night. A lull in the wind had come, and the light of the moon hung near the horizon's rim, flickered out dimly ever and anon as the edge of the drifting mist lapped up wave-like and touched her 
It was piercingly cold. Ned Dermody leaned heavily on Dan as they walked. Only till he fetched back his breath, he said, but it was slow in coming. They had not gone many hundred yards, yet vast tracts of solitude seemed to have folded round them, before Dan caught sight of something that somehow startled and shocked him, a group of boulders by the road, with a shadow under one of them strangely like a human form. A few paces further on he became aware that it really was a man, the old man, sitting huddled up against the big glimmering stone. Thus far had he carried his forlorn quest after fortune, and mutiny against fate. His snaggy stick lay at a little distance, a black line on the snow, and the sight of that made Dan's heart stumble. But Ned Dermody shouted out hoarsely and loud, "'Be the Lord, it's himself!' and as Dan afterwards used to tell, took a flying leap at him as if he had a mind to lip over the world. "'Musha now, and is it there you would be sitting to catch your death of cold?' he began in a tone of gleeful reproach, shaking the old man by the shoulder. "'Goodness forgive me for saying so, but it's yourself, the pernicious old miscreant, fine trampin' over the country I've had after you, for by givin' us the greatest fright altogether.' should i give you me word the whole of them at home was running in and out of the house on sunday morning like so many scared rabbits about a bank and ne'er a man jack of them you perceive had the wit to find out where you was off to till meself riz out of me bed to go look and now man alive get up with yourself and come along for it's mortal cold here and there's tons weight of snow this instant meanin' ready to drop down on our heads come along should it's never distressin' yourself you'd be about old Blake and his wages. Musha sure Norrer and me was sayin' only a Saturday night that there wasn't many stockhorns like me had fathers to be bringin' them home shillin's every week as regular as the clock and givin' presents to the children in all manner. There's little Maggie frettin' woeful to be messin' you out of it. Don't be keepin' me standin' on me feet." there's a good man for it's queer and bad i've been and the doctor was saying he couldn't tell what ruination might be on me if i didn't mind what i was at and here's the decent lad waitin to show us the road we're just comin along this instant boyo look at daddy twas all a mistake and we'll settle it up next week when we're both workin again but it be like mr blake didn't rightly know what he was sayin wake up and come along daddy darlin don't you hear what i'm tellin you it's raisin your wages they'll be after lent i wouldn't wonder raisin them a shillin be like real grand it'll be god almighty he stood up suddenly and looked towards dan but at neither him nor anything else the moon began to shine clearer in a chink between two straight leaden bars and the great white bog seemed to grow wider and stiller under the strengthening light the very wind had forsaken them and gone off keening into the far distance. It seemed to Dan that even a flake fluttering down would have been some company, but not a single one was in the air. He felt himself seized by a nameless panic, such as had not come over him since he was a small child a dozen years ago. "'What's the matter at all?' he said futilely to Ned Dormady, knowing well enough. "'Gone he is,' said Ned. The life was vexed out of him among us all. He's gone, and it's following him I'd liefer be only for them creatures at home. But in another moment he came staggering against Dan and clutched his arm, saying wildly, Ah, lend me a hand for pity's sake, a hand for a minute. Don't let go of me. And he leaned such a heavy dead weight on him that all Dan could do was to let it slip down and down as softly as might be until the snowy earth took it from him. Ned had followed in spite of the creatures at home. CHAPTER Ten, CON THE QUEER ONE Among the unfamiliar faces that show themselves now and then at Lisconnel, some make no second appearance, never coming our way again but passing out of our ken as utterly as if their route lay along a tangent, or the branch of an hyperbola, or other such unreverting line. 
we seldom it is true get proof positive as in the case of the dermodies father and son that they will no more return generally their doing so any day may be supposed possible as long as anybody remembers to suppose it but some come back at more or less regular intervals like periodic comets so that if a certain time elapses without bringing one of them the neighbors say they wonder what's took him at all while some reappear erratically enough to preclude any calculations upon the subject of this latter class was con the queer one who after his first arrival on a summer's evening now more than a quarter of a century since became a rather frequent visitor usually stopping for a few days at least before he resumed his travels it was conjectured that these were very extensive though perhaps less so than mad bells but it was even more difficult to obtain a satisfactory report of them from him than from her mrs mcgurk said he was so took up with his own notions that he mostly knew no better where he'd been or what he'd been doing than a beast driving home from a fair you might as soon be axin questions of one as the other though when con chose to give his mind to it he knew what he was about as well as anybody else sure if you wanted to know which way he was after comin as likely as not he talk about nothin only the sorts of clouds he'd been watchin goin by over his head and twould take a clever body to tell from that what road he might have had under his feet this inner commutativeness made him a disappointing guest sometimes by the firesides where he was finding a night's lodging though he might eke out his conversation with a little twanging on his fiddle in which the melody would be quite as vague as his narratives as for his own earlier history he never gave any clear account of it probably having none to give and the neighbors speculations upon this point were somewhat wide of the mark which was not surprising as what stray hints he did let fall could be very deviously construed the opinion most commonly received held that he had took and run off from home and he but a gossoon be reason of doin some queer bit of mischief and had a mind yet to be keepin out of his people's way though like enough they weren't trouble in their heads about him be now a theory which was not entirely in accordance with facts con was not i believe an especially queer one at his first start in life begun under the thatch of a little whitewashed cottage dotted down among grass fields beside a clear brown river which kept his mother busy exhorting him and his half dozen brethren to not be falling in and drowning themselves on her her days were haunted by apprehensions of that catastrophe which however was not included in the plot of her life's drama con's chosen bugbear was the bridge which bestrode the river close by and beneath the arch of which he had once happened to be while a cart passed overhead for the lumbering rumble had been an appalling experience which he shuddered to repeat yet he lacked the moral courage to rouse his elders derision by an avowal so he followed and did not let on whenever their wading and dabbling brought them into the hollow-sounding shade despite this daily anxiety con spent his earliest years light-heartedly enough with no stinting of potatoes not at least that reached the childer an ample scope for sports and pastimes but when he was still very small his grandmother lately widowed and on her way to a new abode stopped a night with her married daughter and begged that she might bring home one of the grandchildren with her just to take the cold edge off her lonesomeness a request which could not well be refused and con seemed the appropriate person to go as the old woman considered that the dark head of hair he had on him was the moral of his poor grandfather's afore it turned white therefore the swiftly running mysteriously murmuring river flowed away out of his life and with it vanished all the faces and voices and comradeship that had made up his world 
at first he fretted for them rather persistently but after a time adopted himself to circumstances and contented himself with grass-bordered hedge-muffled lane which had become the scene of his adventures fraternizing with the reserved fawn-coloured goat and demonstrative terrier who alone took an intelligent interest in them for his grandmother was satisfied with the sense of having him playing around handy and could not be counted company but after nearly a twelfth month had passed con seemed one day to be seized with a fresh fit of homesickness it was a brilliant late summer morning yet to old mrs quinn's perplexity he continued to sit on his little stool with his slice of griddle cake half crumbled in his lap and answered her suggestions that he should finish his breakfast and run out to play by irrelevant requests for his own old mammy he wanted her cruel bad he said and there was nothing ailed him and he wouldn't like to look for blackberries along the hedge or to throw stones for bran or even to be given a whole halfpenny to go buy himself a grand sugar stick down at the shop he only wanted his mammy such was his attitude and refrain all that day and the next after which his grandmother said to her neighbor judy ahern that she couldn't tell what had come over the child and he had her fairly distracted listening to him and mrs ahern said maybe he might be getting something there's a terrible deal of sickness about but he doesn't look very bad to say ara now con avic why wouldn't you run out and play a bit this lovely morning wantin your mammy sure that's foolish talk and she nobody can tell how far away this minute it's just a notion you have deed ma'am i dunno but maybe you'd a right to let him home to her or else he might get frettin and mopin himself into the fever he's a poor little creature the face of him this instant isn't the width of a halfpenny heron and he so contented said mrs quinn until he took his fatigue real queer it is most things do be queer and ugly these times said mrs ahern goodness help us all there's poor mrs duff travelin off to-morrow to go stay with her brother at gortnackel very be like she'd take him along and he'd be easy landed home once he got that far and on the morrow con did actually set off with mrs duff feeling half appeased and half compunctious as people do when they get what they have clamoured for sorry a while to lose sight of bran staring open-mouthed after him down the lane and relieved through all by a vague sense that he was going whither his heart-strings pulled if he had been a more experienced traveller he might have noticed some signs that things were as judy ahern had said out of joint it was harvest time and the weather was not wet though dull and chilly but nobody was working in the fields nothing seemed to move in them as they lay deserted except trails of white mist that drifted low among the furrows where the potato halms looked strangely discoloured speckled and blackened as if a shrivelling flame had run through them all charring and strewing pale ashes the air was full of a peculiar odour heavy and acrid the very life-breath of decay the roads were deserted too for miles nobody would be met and then a small stationary crowd of people would appear collected it would seem without any more purpose than cattle huddled together in a storm and as dumb as they not giving so much as a fine morning to the passer-by other crowds they fell in with now and again pacing slowly along and these always had a heavy burden carried among them and sometimes women keening once the car-horse shied violently at some dark long thing that was stretched out by the footpath and mrs duff crossed herself and said god be good to us and the driver said without looking off his reins he's lying there since yesterday and i seen another above about the four roads and i'm comin past this mornin con did not give much heed to these incidents 
but one scene in his journey impressed him strongly it was at the small town where they slept the night and it happened while they waited in the broad main street next morning for their car to pick them up as mrs duff travelled by a rather disjointed system of lifts in vehicles that were going her road there were few people about and con was intensely admiring a gaudy tea-chest in the window of the shop before which they stood when a great roar began to swell up round the corner where the lumbering of wheels heard fitfully through it presently a large crowd came struggling into sight a street full of men women and children surrounding a blue red-wheeled cart piled high with dusty-looking white sacks half a dozen dark uniformed policemen were trying to haul on the horse and keep between the cart and the crowd whose shout generally sounded like devil of foot it's to quit devil of foot it was a crowd that looked as if it had somehow got more than its due share of glittering eyes in mistake apparently for other things as the cart came crawling past where mrs duff and con stood a furious rush so tilted it over that the horse fell breaking a shaft and some of the topmost sacks tumbled off dropping with dull thuds like dead bodies upon the damp cobblestone pavement con saw a little cloud of white dust rise up over each as it dumped down and melt away on the air making him wonder to himself is it smoking hot they are but in another moment they were hidden for a while by a wild wave of the crowd which threw itself tumultuously upon them one of the sacks burst spilling the soft flour in flakes and round it the jostling and writhing grew fiercest the faces that got nearest to it looked hardly the whiter for their smears and powdering a young woman all black eyes and elf locks with a baby wrapped in her shawl crouching low and making a desperate long arm grasped a covetous handful which spirited away wastefully between her clenched fingers she moistened some of this in a puddle as she knelt and held the paste to her baby's mouth but its head was drooping wearily aside and its lips did not move when she touched them eat it up my heart's jewel she said eat it up mother's little bird deed then but you're the contrary little toad it's breaking me heart you'll be roaring when i've ne'er a bit to give you and sleepin' dead when i've the chance to feed you she was beginning to shake it but a young man who stood behind her put his hand on her shoulder saying wisht wisht you creature for god's sake it's done wit wantin' and cryin' and a good job for it too the lord knows when the girl shrieked again and again the people about her said from one to the other it's her child's starved on her and an old man caught up the little body and held it high over his head shouting boys boys look use at that there's the way henderson's cartin off the childers bit of food to make his fine fortune in england and the crowd shouted back through a surge of curses devil afoot will he this day a very little old woman seized hold of an outlying sack and tried to lift it a ludicrously impossible feat at witnessing which a cripple leaner than his crutches laughed boisterously saying och good luck to you granny you're making a great offer at it entirely is it often you do be liftin up the hill of hoth more power to your elbow and the crowd yelled with laughter too at this moment there was a prodigious clatter of hoofs on the stones and round the corner whirled a squadron of hussars all in their blue and yellow like a flight of macaws coming to the rescue of mr henderson's sacks but con saw scarcely more than the first confused onset for somebody snatched him up and hurried him into a dark passage the last sight he had of the fray was of a glossy black horse plunging frantically back from the cloud of the flower flung into its face and rearing higher and higher until he fell over with a terrific scrambling crash con particularly noticed the white 
gloves of the rider and thought to himself he's been grabbing the flower too and the women about him said och murder the beast the man's apt to be kilt when mrs duff and con emerged again all was quiet in the street two or three women had even stolen back and were scraping up the white patches and he was driven away on a car for what seemed to him a vast length of time but at last as he peered listlessly out on glimpses of the dreary strange road caught between the shawled heads of two other passengers his eye suddenly fell on something delightfully familiar it was a grey ruined mill which stood by the river not many hundred yards from his home all at once he seemed to be set down in the middle of his old life as if he had never left it only with a charming freshness superadded a delicious feeling came over him as he watched the clear sky-glinting loops unwind themselves in the grass while the car jogged along there were the big stones over the edges of which the brown water broke into dancing crests of crystal bubbles when the river was full and the deep pools under the hollow banks where they had seen the trout that was the size of a young whale and the twisted wild cherry tree from beneath which the eddies sometimes twirled away bearing fleets of frail snowy petals and johnny and katie and the rest might all come into view paddling round any corner when the car stopped at the gap through which you got into the field just behind his cottage he was almost beside himself with joy as his fellow travellers who were less elated lifted him down and handed him his bundle and bade him run straight into his mother like an elegant child he did run down the steep little footpath at the top of his speed and round the corner of the house and in through the open door the room looked very dusk to him coming in from the mellow afternoon sunshine and the first thing he noticed was that the fire had gone out the hearth was a blackness sprinkled with white ashes which made him think of the flour spilt on the dark ground next he saw his mother sitting on a stool by the hearth with her head leaned against the wall and his father's old caubeen hanging on its nail above a very unusual sight at that hour con rushed at her head foremost saying och mummy darlin', i've come home this long way and they are fighting with all the soldiers and spilling the flour and his horse reared up on his hind legs till he fell off his feet and where's daddy if he isn't workin and musha what's for it nanny and johnny in bed he pulled her shawl because she did not look round at him and immediately she dropped down prone on the floor as heavily and helplessly as he had seen the white sacks fall she had in truth been dead for hours but con ran out screaming that he was after killing his mammy and nothing would persuade him otherwise vainly the neighbors averred that the creature was starving herself this great while to keep a bit for the children let alone her heart begin broke frettin after her poor husband and little pat who were took from her wit the fever both of them the one day con's mind would shut fast into the dreadful moment when he had pulled her shawl and she had fallen down and therein it abode sorely afflicted until a spell of brain fever intervening let it loose into a region of vaguer and more varied dreams and when he had struggled through this illness nobody well knew how or why he woke up to find his world swept very bare father mother and all his brethren except little katy were vanished out of it and as it came looming back to him thus depeopled its aspects were immeasurably desolate nor did his loss end here for from this time dated the springing up among his neighbors of a suspicion that he was not all there a suspicion which developed into an accepted article of belief the more readily perhaps because nobody remained from whom such a fact would have had a personal bitterness the old grandmother having slipped away out of her lonesomeness before his recovery 
it would not be easy to explain how it was that Con grew up into that privileged and disfranchised person who is spoken of as a creature, and whose proceedings are more or less exempt from criticism. People often said of him that he had plenty of sense of his own, and the remark was to some extent explanatory, as a certain singularity in his way of viewing things, even more than an occasional inconsequence and flightiness in his sayings and doings, tended to establish the reputation for eccentricity, which followed him closely as a shadow, and set an impalpable barrier between himself and his kind. And as he advanced in life, this was strengthened by his increasing fondness for his own society. But he did not take to his solitary wanderings until after his sister Katie married young Peter Meehan and emigrated to New York. It was suggested to him that he should accompany them, but he sat looking meditative for a while and then said, How far might it be from this to the States? I don't know rightly, said his informant, but a goodish step it's apt to be for people's better than a couple of weeks sail on there i'm told con meditated a while more before he put another question would you be within hearin out there of the folks talkin foolish he inquired why to be sure man what'd hinder you that you wouldn't hear them talkin same as anywhere else Bedad, then, said Con, it seems a long way to be travelling to a country as close as that. Sure, if you take out for a stravade over the bog here, you'll be troubled with nothin the length of the day, only the curlew. And maybe a couple of seagulls skirlin reasonable enough. I'll be apt to stay where I am. Con, who was a person of many moods, happened to be in an unusually cynical one just then. However, he adhered to his resolution, and when his sister had gone, he adopted a life of long tramps. Somebody had given him an old fiddle, and this he carried with him, though chiefly as a sort of badge, as his performances were but feeble, and he could turn his hand to many other things when he found it necessary to do so. His rovings had gone on for several years before they led him to Lisconnel. In those days he was a strange small figure, who wore a coat too large for him, and a hat set so far back on his head that its brim made a sort of halo to frame his face, which had a curious way of looking fitfully young and old, with a shining of violet-blue eyes and a puckering of fine-drawn wrinkles. A small boy and a little old ancient man would seem to change places half a dozen times in the course of a single conversation. Even his hair was a puzzle, regarded as an indication of age, because its black had become streaked with white in such a fashion that its apparent hue varied according to what came uppermost in accidents of ruffling and smoothing. A neighbor once said of him that he was the living moral of a little old leprechaun, that they were after making a couple of sizes too big by mistake. And my own impression is that further opportunities for observing specimens of the race would be likely to bear out this statement. The summer evening on which he was first seen at Lisconnel had followed a very fine day. In the heart of its golden afternoon, Mrs. O'Driscoll trusted her youngest son Terence out on the bog with his brothers and sisters and some other children, the eldest of whom, Joanna Harvey, the Ryan's orphan niece, was credited with wit enough to keep the party out of the holes. They wandered off rather more widely than usual along the foot of the hill, lured on by a sprinkling of dainty white mushrooms which they found generally with yells studied here and there at last they sat down on a bank to peel their delicate pink quilted buttons all of them except terence who was not yet of an age to have acquired a taste for mushrooms he had been carried most of the way still he had toddled further than he was accustomed to do 
and his unwanted exertions led him to curl himself up behind a sun-smitten rock and fall asleep with a quietness which presently brought upon him the fate of out of sight out of mind after a while however joanna did bethink herself of him and was just on the point of wondering aloud where little terence had gone to when her cousin thady turned her thoughts into a different channel by saying suddenly what was there in it before the beginning of everything thady was a small anxious-looking child whose pale and peaky face his mother often likened regretfully to a hapworth of soap after a week's washing he had spent a surprisingly considerable part of his six years in metaphysical speculations and was always disposed to make a personal grievance of the difficulties in which they constantly landed him his tone was now rather peremptory as he repeated what was there in it before the beginning of everything sure nothing at all said his elder brother peter to whom the answer seemed quite simple and satisfactory but joanna looked as if she had caught sight of some distant object which provoked hard staring then what was there before the beginning of nothing pursued thady dunno said peter indifferently unless it was more nothing sure not at all that wouldn't be the way of it joanna said dreamily yet with decision if there was nothing but nothing in it there had been apt to not be air and anything ever where did it come from don't be telling the child lies peter why for one thing she said her tone sharpening polemically and taking a touch of triumph there was always god almighty in it and the devil maybe that's what you call nothing peter evaded this point saying well anyway those times if there was just the two of them in it and no harm to be doin let alone any good people to know the differ it's only a queer sort of devil he'd get the chance of bein i wouldn't call him anything much he wouldn't be so very long you may depend joanna pronounced musha sure the devil couldn't stay content any while at all till he'd take to some manner of old mischief would soon show you the sort of creature he was it's his nature i should suppose the first thing he'd go do would be makin all the sorts of hideous roarin great beasts and snakes and reptiles that he could think of and the desolate black wet bogs with the cold wind over them fit to cut you in two when you're sleepin out at night said joanna whose ten years of life had brought her into some rough places before her adoption by aunt lizzie ryan and the workhouses bad luck to the whole of them where there's rats in the cocoa and mad people frightened at you and the cross matrons and the police and the sea to drown the fishing boats in and dirty old nagers who put decent people out of their little places if it had been me said peter i'd a been very apt to just hit him a crack on the head when i noticed what he was at and bid him leave them sort of constructions alone i don't know the rights of it entirely joanna admitted but it's a cruel pity he ever got the chance to be carrying on the way he's done ah sure it can't be helped now at all events said peter who was for the time being not inclined to quarrel seriously with the scheme of things as he basked on the warm grassy bank where the wild bees were humming in the time happily remote from the grim house and the hungry sea be like it can't said joanna but twould be a real grand if it could suppose i was out of the hill there some fine evening and i not thinking of anything in particular and all of a sudden i seen a great big ugly black-looking beast of a feller the size of forty skitin away with himself along the light of the sky over yonder where the sun was about going down and his shader the length of an awful tall tree slippin stealin after him till it was off over the edge of the world like and that same would be just the devil that they were after bundlin out of it body and bones the way he wouldn't be meddlin and makin an annoyin people any more so with that i'd take a race home and be tellin you all the illigant thing was after happenin 
and in the middle of it who'd come landed in but me father and mother and little dan and then if it isn't the grand cup of tea i'd be making her i begorra would i and a sugar stick to stir it with joanna's vision of the millennium was broken in upon querulously by thady should i know all about god almighty and the devil he said comprehensively i was only axin what was in it before the beginning of everything and you're not tellin' me that there's a deal of things like spalpeens like you wouldn't be told the rights of at all said peter loftily being rather annoyed at the interruption he would have liked to hear some further details about the felicity to be inaugurated by that exquisite cup of tea go on romance and han but joanna who felt that this assumption of superior knowledge was an uncandid subterfuge and yet had not magnanimity enough to disclaim it on her own part remained uneasily silent for a moment and then only said sure it's time we was getting home this they accordingly proceeded to do and had gone most of the distance before it occurred to anybody that little terence o'driscoll was not with them then after a superficial and unproductive search among the scattered stones and bushes they thought it expedient to run back in a fright and report that the child had gone and got lost unless by any odd chance he'd come home along with himself thus it was that when terence wakened from his nap he found himself deserted and thrown completely upon his own resources as he had not been quite three years in amassing these they were on the whole but scanty in fact he was helplessly unable to realize a world with nothing in it except endlessly swelling up slopes of furzy grass no molly no mickey for him to trot after and to carry him wherever they were going whenever he intimated the desirability of that step by abruptly plumping down on the way so he set off in a great hurry to escape from such a wilderness he still walked with a wobbling stagger and his long frock of whitey-brown homespun kept on tripping him up which retarded his progress but he was not at all long in mentally reaching the precincts of a wild panic which rose up and seized him in a grip never to be quite forgotten though only a few desperate minutes ensued before he stumped blindly against con's legs it was so unutterable a relief to have come on somebody who could hear him roar that terence ceased roaring immediately and let con pick him up without demur the appearance of molly or mickey would no doubt have been more satisfactory but this stranger man might serve well enough at a pinch to carry him home which it was inconceivable that anybody of such a size could be unable or unwilling to do as for con the inference he drew from terence's dimensions was that his family and friends were probably not far to seek and he recognized the shrewdness of the conjecture when he presently espied a shawled figure coming swiftly towards him over the edge of a slope with the amber of the sunset glowing behind her and her long shadow sliding on far below her as if it were in an even greater hurry than herself mrs o'driscoll's head was among the golden sunbeams but her heart had gone down to the very bottom of the blackest and deepest hole in the bog for towards that dreadful goal she had seen a small form toddling ever since the other children came home alarmingly late with the news that terence had got lost on them and they couldn't find a bit of him high ways or low ways she was so overjoyed at her rescue that her delighted gratitude cast a sort of glamour around con which never faded wholly away ever after the appearance of his queer figure called up in her mind a dim reminiscence of the moment when she had seen it for the first time come into view laden with what she well knew was terence sitting bolt upright in a manner that betokened him to have experienced neither drowning nor any other disaster as con put the child into her arms would it seem to fit into a niche specially designed for it he said sure now ma'am 
when I seen him stumpin' along his loan, and he about the length of a sizable bohalon, that is, ragweed, says I to meself, there was apt to be somebody lookin' after him. For bedad, it seems to me, most wise, the littler a thing is, the more people they'll be conceitin' they can't get on without it. And that's lucky, belike, or else it might easy get lost entirely, like a threepenny bit rolled away into a crack. But if you come to consider, Con said, hurrying on lest his allusion to the coin should be construed as a hint that he thought of payment for his services, most people's looking out for somebody, or else somebody's looking out for them. It's only the few odd ones, like meself, that makes no differ here or there. I wonder now, it's the reason that it's after losing ourselves we are in a manner. I've... I've me notions about that. For first, I think I do not know if anything's rightly lost that nobody's looking to find. And then I think I do not know, but you might as well say you couldn't find anything you weren't after losing and looking for, and that's not the truth by no manner of means. And you after finding the child, said Mrs. O'Driscoll. Sure not at all, ma'am, said Con, modestly deprecating not the statement but the implied praise. Small thanks to me for that, when the woeful balls of it you might have heard a mile aground. You could as easy have missed a little clap of thunder if a one was to be chance comin' taterin' along between the fuses with the head of it bobbin' up now and again and makin' all the noise it could contrive. Troth, it's the quare balls. I might be lettin' these times afore the rest of them would hear me, or if it's lost I am, I'm strayin' a terrible long while. They're apt to disremember they ever owned me. I do be thinkin', ma'am, that if you forget what you've lost, it's maybe all the one thing as if you'd found it. And after that again, I do be thinkin', maybe twould be liker losin' it twist over. It's queer the different notions there is about most things, and a good job too, or else what would you be considerin' in your mind when you was trampin' round? Deed now, if you couldn't be supposin' they were this way and that way and argufying over them wid yourself in your mind twould be like as if you took and swallowed down a lump of baccy instead of chewing it and what sort of benefit or pleasure you'd get out of that this was con's first bit of philosophizing at lisconnel and it was not his last by many as the place became one of his favourite resorts his liking for it was perhaps partly due to the fact that its inhabitants received him on more equal terms than were generally accorded to him elsewhere, and this again may be largely attributed to the influence of Mrs. O'Driscoll, for her grateful feelings towards the restorer of Terence made her loathe to recognize any deficiencies in him, and her neighbors soon perceiving that she seemed vexed if Con was spoken of as cracked or crazy or wanton a corner, were ready enough to modify their language and even their judgment in accordance with her view. Still it was convenient to distinguish him from another resident, Con, about whom there were no very striking features. Therefore, her little Rose, having been heard to say that she was after seeing Con, not Con Ryan, but the queer one, they caught up and applied the epithet, which in Lisconnel is regarded as a safely colourless term, not likely to hurt the most sensitive feelings. Con, on his part, formed the highest opinion of Mrs. O'Driscoll, and often took counsel with her about perplexing points which had presented themselves to him in the course of his meditations. In one practical matter, however, he showed an obstinacy that did not further her in her wish to uphold him on a footing with quite sensible people. This was his fancy for adorning the band of his broad-brimmed cowbean with a garnish of feathers and flowers. Mrs. O'Driscoll disapproved of the freak, rightly judging that it often created irrevocable first impressions, and fixed his standing in a glance. 
in this age and clime the seven sages could hardly maintain among them a reverend aspect under the frivolity of a single flaunting blossom much less the gaudy bunches and fantastic plumes upon which con recklessly ventured so at last having hinted and remonstrated ineffectually she contrived somehow to find time and stuff among her laborious days and scanty stores and fashioned for him a round cloth cap of a severely plain design which she thought would give no scope for any unseemly appendages upon being presented with his headgear con dutifully assumed it and went about wearing it for a day or two in a depressed frame of mind then he appeared in the morning at the old driscolls cheered and crested with a remarkably long gannet's feather stuck upright in the crown of his cap through which he had bored a hole to admit of the insertion he was resolved to brazen out the matter so he presently took off his cap and twirling it round with an unconcerned air as he leaned against the door said to herself well ma'am what do you think of that to tell you just the truth con said herself whose countenance had fallen as she saw the failure of her little plot i was thinking it looked a deal better before you cocked that old gazebo on top of it deed now it gives you the appearance of a head of cabbage that's sprouting up and going to seed sure you never see the other lads traipsing about with the like on them con who seemed rather cast down by this criticism was about to reply when young ned keogh took the cap out of his hand and affected to examine it closely saying glory be to goodness what sort of a thing is it at all at all bedad it's the wonderful contrivance ah to be sure i see what it is it's about growing a pair of wings for its wit to fly about wit but musha good gracious he needn't a troubled himself to be getting them that sizable something the bigness of a hedge sparrows or maybe a weeny white butterflies would have plenty strength enough for the job if it was all they had to do ned meant no harm but his witticisms did not fall in with con's humour so he snatched back the cap and went off affronted nor did he call at the o'driscolls again for some weeks the next time he came however herself had espied him a bit down the road and was standing at the door to receive him with his discarded caubeen in her hand you'd be better wearing it con after all she said for the eyes are scorched out of your head under the sun without e'er a scrap of brim and as con took it he observed with glee that she had fastened into the band a dove-coloured kittiwake's wing feather a somewhat cherished possession of her own which she used to keep over her best picture on the wall thus did she seek to make amends for the speech about the sprouting cabbage head which had been weighing heavily upon her conscience the kitty wake's feather had to weather rain and sunshine for many a year in con the queer one's old cow bean but it is now on a room wall again the kilfoyles this time con brought it to mrs kilfoyle one autumn evening in the year mrs o'driscoll died it was much longer than usual since he had wandered into lisconnel illness and one thing and another having detained him in the north for the last twelfth month and more all her blackest days of childless widowhood so that this was his first visit since the departure of his earliest friend could you be keeping it somewhere safe for me ma'am he said showing the soft grey feather to mrs kilfoyle who was sitting by the fire with her sons and her future daughter-in-law and old rafferty's aunt and the widow mcgurk i'll be wearing it no more twas herself stuck it in for me but sure i knew well enough all the while she'd leave her i wouldn't be going about with such things on me head and sorrow a bit of me will again whether now but yourself's a queer man con said oddy rafferty's aunt to be taken up with that notion these times when e'er a different it'll make to her 
there might have been some sense in it if you'd done it to please her but now you're more than a trifle too late with that a day after the fair you are sure she'll never set eyes on you or your old cowbean again she said as if announcing some unthought-of discovery of her own no matter what old trash you might take and stick in it you might be wearing a young haystack on your head for anything she could tell that may be or mayn't be said con but at all events the next body that goes there out of this countryside'll be very apt to bring her word this course and together they'll be of all the news and as like as not he or it might be she'll say to her i seen con the queer one go on the road a while back and he would ne'er a thraneen of anything in his hat good or bad the same way the other boys are lookin' real decent and sensible belike she might be axin after me herself and that it put it in the other body's head yourself it may be moggy fay now i wouldn't wonder a bit if it was for there must be a terrible great age on you these times sure you looked to be an old old woman the first day i ever beheld you and that's better than a dozen year ago troth then there's plenty of older old people than me let me tell you protested moggy who was about ninety that you need be settlin i'm goin anywheres next musha cock you up and your own hair turned as white as sheep's wool on a blackthorn's bush she seemed so much put out by con's statement and inference that young daddy kilfoyle always a good-natured lad sought to soothe her sure there's no settlin any such a thing and for the matter of goin the young people often enough get their turn as fast as anybody else it's meself he said might be sooner than you bring a news of you's all and con's old cowbean and everything else to heaven the way he says i don't know if you've any call to be talkin that fashion said the witty mcgurk disapprovingly as if you could be walkin promiscuous into heaven without wit your leave or by your leave maybe it isn't there any of us'll be bringin our news might you know of e'er a better place than ma'am said con heard you ever the like of that said old rafferty's aunt not unwillingly scandalized i should suppose nobody unless it was a born heathen would know of any place better than heaven that's where she is then said con stroking his feather for the best place ever was is none too good for her god knows well and true for you man said widdy mcgurk but she's one thing and we're another it's not settin ourselves up we should be to have the same chances ah well sure maybe we're none of us too outrageous altogether said mrs kilfoyle looking hopefully round at her company and if they can put up with us at all at all they will we'll get there yet please god and anyway i'll be takin good care of your feather con ay will i so same as if it was dropped out of an angel's wing so good night your kindly ma'am said he i'll be steppin back to lowrig manor i only looked in on you to bring you that and give you news of teresa and i question will i ever set foot again in lisconnel he did not however leave it quite immediately a little later when brian kilfoyle was escorting nora finnegan home they saw him sitting on the bank near the O'Driscoll's roofless cabin. Its mud walls were fast crumbling into ruin. Already the little window square had lost its straight outline and would soon be as shapeless as any hole burrowed in a bank. Con sat with his back turned to it until the dusk had muffled up everything in dimness, and then he stole an armful of turf sods from the nearest stack and groped his way in through the deserted door the shadows within were folded so heavily that he could scarcely more than guess where the hearth had been one of con's peculiarities was a strange horror of a fireless hearth at the sight of its horribly sprinkled blackness he always felt as if he were standing on the verge of some frightful revelation a vague reminiscence no doubt from the scene of his life's tragedy all distinct memory of which had been blurred away by his illness 
now he piled and crumbled his sods with practised skill and set them alight in well-chosen places but he stayed only for a minute or so till the little fluttering flames had fairly taken a hold and were sending golden threads running along the netted fibres then he groped his way out again and returned to his seat on the bank presently as he watched he saw a red light beginning to flicker through window and door and growing steadier and stronger when it was at its brightest he got up and turned away that's the very way it would be shinin', he said and i come along the road to see herself and himself and the childer god be good to them all wherever they may be and that's the notion of it i'll keep in me mind and conned the queer one came no more to lisconnel end of section seven This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 8 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8. Chapter 11. Mad Bell. Not so very long before the sound of Con the Queer One's fiddle ceased to enliven lisconnel any more mad bell's singing had begun to be heard there occasionally as it has been at intervals ever since she arrived with her two housemates big Anne and the dummy and took up her abode in the last of the cabins that you pass on the left hand going towards sullenbeg perhaps lisconnel should not reckon her among its residents so much of her time is spent on the tramp as an absentee still she sometimes has tarried with us for a long while and she is understood to have some property in the house furniture so it seems natural to consider the place her home from the first it appeared obvious to all that the dementedness which characterized the little wizened yellow-faced woman was of a much more pronounced type than con the queer ones any attempt to spare people's feelings by ignoring the fact would have been very futile and it was therefore lucky that the three newcomers mad bell herself included were quite content to accept the situation the neighbors were at first inclined to commiserate big anne who was pronounced to be a decent sensible poor woman for the oddities of her household the incalculable flightiness of mad bell and the impenetrable silence of the dummy but to their condoling remarks she was wont to reply in effect ah sure ma'am that's the way i'm used to them the creatures why if mad bell said anything over sensible or poor winnie said anything at all it's wonderin i'd be what was goin to happen us next and big anne evidently looked upon this as an uncomfortable frame of mind at first too they speculated much about the circumstances which had brought the curious trio together beneath one thatch and found it especially hard to conjecture how the daft little vagrant had come into possession of sundry tables and chairs all its members however being in communicative persons no satisfactory elucidation of these points was arrived at in lisconnel the coalescence of big anne's and the dummy's fortunes is a simple history enough and feignin while yet a youngish woman was left alone in the world to do for herself in her little wayside cabin without a dowry to recommend her rough-hewn features and large boned ungainliness she never had any suitors and she found it as much as she could contrive to make out her single living by means of her bit of poultry and her pig nevertheless when her nearest neighbors the gulligers died leaving their daughter winnie who had never got her speech the creature to live on charity or the rates 
what else was a body to do except take her in and would have put this question to you with a sincere want of resource so winnie gulliger transferred to anne fanin's house herself and all her worldly goods which consisted of the clothes she had on and a prayer-book and a lame duck and thence forward the two got along the best way they could mad bell's history has more complications in it they began one pleasant april day when she was only a slip of a lass who had taken a little place at the hunt's farm near her home for the purpose of saving up a few pounds against her marriage with richard mcburney she had been given an unexpected holiday and was running home across the fresh spring green grass fields thinking to take her people by surprise when she came to a hedge gap whence you look down into a steep banked lane and at the foot of the bank richard mcburney was sitting with his arm round her sister lizzie's waist to a dispassionate observer this transference of his attentions might have seemed a matter of small moment most of their acquaintances for example were just as well satisfied that he should court eliza as isabella but the sight turned all the current of her life awry for it set her off rushing away from it across the same sunny green fields and she never came home again nor ever again would she settle down quietly anywhere she had a strong clear voice and a taste for music and this led her to take to singing ballads about the country at markets and fairs the harder she was thinking about fickle richard mcburney the louder and shriller she sang a very few years of such wandering shriveled up her plump pig beauty so that in her little sallow weather-beaten face her own mother would scarcely have recognized pretty isabella reed then after a long spell of illness in a union infirmary she began to grow noticeably odder and stranger in her looks and ways until at length the children shouted mad bell as she passed and that became her recognized style and title such briefly had been her experience of life when one september evening she came by chance to big anne and the dummy's door she had got a very bad cold and felt hardly able to drag herself along between the buried hedges and was so hoarse that she could with difficulty ask for the night's lodging which they granted without demur their times had been unusually bad of late in fact their room was looking several sizes larger than they were accustomed to see it because they had sold any articles of furniture for which ere a price at all could be obtained but to whatever accommodation this bareness permitted they made mad bell kindly welcome the creature being sick and crazy and she stayed with them for three or four days by that time finding herself recovered she resumed her journey setting off early in the morning with the abruptness and absence of circumlocution which as a rule distinguished her proceedings a friendly nod and grimace she made serve for announcement of departure and leave-taking all in one as her hostesses watched her out of sight down the road big anne said well now i never seen that queer little body in this country before and we're very apt to not set eyes on her again god be good to us all but the likes of her is to be pitied she's worse off than the two of us but bedad winnie if them hens there don't presently take to layin a trifle it's in a tight hole we'll be ourselves i don't know what's bewitchin them and the sorter an old stick have we left in it that man or mortal would give us the price of a pullet's egg for and small blame to him unless he was as demented as herself that's quittin mad bell's tramp that day was all along a sequence of lonesome winding lanes where few dwellings were dotted among the green and gold of the fields the bustle of the harvest its reaping and binding was over in them and they lay without stir or sound in some of them the strooks were still encamped but some were smooth stubble 
empty except where a flock of turkeys filled it with dark bunchy shapes she walked steadily on the whole day without any adventure but when the dew was beginning to fall through the twilight she came to a short shady reach of lane at the end of which stood in a green nook a small prim white cottage with two peaked windows and a door to match that at least is how it would under ordinary circumstances have presented itself to a passer-by just then however nobody would have noticed anything about it except the fact that out of the open door thick coils of woolly black smoke were rolling and rolling stabbed through every now and again by thrusts of flame which even in the lingering daylight gleamed strongly fierce and red the house was evidently on fire as mad bell drew nearer she became aware of a wheaten coloured terrier standing in the front of it and when he saw her he began to bark vehemently she was used to being barked at though not in this way for howls were interspersed and it was clearly meant not for a menace but an appeal no other live creature was visible about the place until she had come quite close to the surging door when a small gossoon jumped out of the ditch on the opposite side of the road and rushed across to her what'll i do at all then he said whimperingly catching hold of her shawl if them childers burnt up within there mr wogan will be in a fine way it's for killin the whole of us he'll be and it wasn't me set it afire sort of the match was i meddlin wit i could swear it i wasn't out of it any time gettin a few ripe berries to pacify them childer again they would be wakin and roarin and when i come back there it is all a smother of smoke devil a thing else was i doin only mindin them children and not meddlin with the matches and goin after a couple of blackberries and mr wogan himself's away at ballymacartrican wid his boxes in the ass cart and all of them goin to quit out of it to-morrow if it wasn't for them children being burnt up inside or maybe it's smothered they are it's as unhandy as anything it went a fire of itself and he'll be ragin he bawled all this louder and louder in competition with the clamour of the dog who kept on jumping up at each alternately and evidently considered his remarks better entitled to a hearing but mad bell merely replied wished gabbin and hold that thrusting as she spoke her little handkerchief bundle into his arms and thereupon making a sudden dive she vanished among the flame sheathing smoke scarcely had she disappeared when an empty donkey cart came round the turn of the lane led by a rather dejected looking middle-aged man whose countenance nevertheless had for some time back been gradually clearing up at every wind of the way that brought him nearer to this particular point of view but as he caught sight of the black smoke drifting and rolling his aspect of reasonable melancholy changed to one of a despair that could not have been wilder if the reek of hell-mouth had blown into his face he dropped the bridle and hurled himself down the road like the distracted body that he might well be for a twelvemonth ago he had lost his wife and both his elder children in one week and his pair of two-year-old twins were now all that stood between himself and world-wide desolation at the front door his frantic rush was met and baffled by a choking puff which sent him fleeing round in hopes that entrance might be more possible through the back and on the way he came face to face with the wrathful visages of his son and daughter whom mad bell was carrying in the disregardful manner that betides a cumbrous load snatched up in a mortal hurry she had escaped by the back door if the most radiant of guardian angels in snowy plumes and golden tresses had restored his children to him with a befitting speech poor matthew wogan could not well have been more joyfully relieved from his terror than he was when this odd little yellow-faced woman with a red handkerchief wisped around her head and a singed grimness generally pervading her handed over to him 
Minnie and Tom casually remarking, Bedad, it's the big heavy lumps they are. Minnie and Tom both were crying and coughing loudly, because the smoke had got into their eyes and throats which they resented. And when their father returned with them to the front of the house, this noise was swelled by the gleeful yap-yapping of the terrier, and the voices of a few other people who had appeared upon the scene, a matronly-looking woman, and two or three sunburnt harvest men. From Mrs. Massey's observations it could be gathered that she had been minding the Wogan twins by deputy, and further that she entertained the gloomiest views about the mental and moral qualities of her son, little Larry, who replied to her animadversions with overreaching protestations about matches and theories of spontaneous combustion. While they wrangled in the background, the young men inspected the conflagration, which proved to be less extensive than it looked, though undoubtedly serious enough to have soon put the sleeping children past waking if rescue had not come. A heap of blankets and other bedding that smouldered and blazed near the front door was the source of the most stifling smoke, and when it had been subdued by many buckets of water, everybody began to drag what bits of furniture they could out of harm's way. There was not much, because, as Wogan explained, he had sent the marrow of it to his sister at Ballymacatrican, and the legs of the largest table were charred so badly that it collapsed with a crash. The instant minute it set its four feet on the ground, as Mrs. Massey said. However, there were two smaller ones, not much the worse, and three or four chairs, and a couple of stools, and some pots and pans, and a small clothes horse, and a wagging clock, whose round white face glimmered through the dusk like a fallen moon as it lay flat on the grass. All these things made a little crowd on the plot of sward by the door. "'And what will you be doing with them now?' said Mrs. Massey. "'There's my place below. You'd be welcome to stand them in as long as you please. "'Deed would you, sir. The dear knows I'm not troubled with too many sticks of furniture. "'That's a very handy-sized washing-tub Larry's after carrying out for you. "'I was noticing to-day ours has a leak in it this long while back that drips over everything. "'I must get himself to try mend it.' "'That's a lovely table,' suddenly said Mad Bell, who had hitherto made no remarks. "'A real grand one it is,' she repeated, in a wistful sort of way, smoothing the leaf fondly with her hand. "'And very welcome you'd be to have it in a present, ma'am, if you've ever a fancy for it. Ay, or for the matter of that to the whole lot of them altogether,' said Matthew Wogan, who, with his arms full of the smoky twins, felt a weight of gratitude which he would gladly have expressed in deeds. Little valley there is on them. It's a small thing after what you're after doing for us. I wouldn't like to be paying away me bit of money from the childer or else. But if I auctioned them things off the way I was intending, it's only a trifle of a few shillings they'd be bringing me. Welcome you are to them, ma'am. "'Sure what use at all would such things be to the likes of her?' put in Mrs. Massey. "'It's only annoyed you to be, woman, with tables and chairs, and she trampled about. "'You may depend, would ne'er a place to be bringing them to, if she had them twist over, "'let alone any way of moving them. "'It's very convenient we are, just round the turn of the road.' "'She might take the little cart and the old ass along,' said Matthew Wogan, looking at his equipage which was straying towards them intermittently, as the beast grazed the green border of the lane. They're no use to me now. Then there'd be nothing to lay in her that she couldn't be cleanin' out of it with them right away. You needn't trouble yourself to be liftin' the little stool, Mrs. Massey. What would fire and water, that'll be no place to sleep in, he said, pointing to the still-smoking door. The Mahonies would take us in for tonight and tomorrow early we're off to me sisters and next day to queenstown twill be a grand thing for the childer to be settled near the uncle tom that's doing right well in new jersey 
in case anything happened me so i'd as lief be shut of all that collection supposin they'd be any benefit to this creature saints bless us but you're givin away all before you mr wogan said mrs massey with a discomfited laugh have you e'er a house you could be puttin them in one of the harvest men asked of mad bell ay be dad she said and with that she picked up a chair and dumped it down into the cart which had come to a halt at the door this promptitude on her part seemed to settle the question without more ado the rest of the salvage was loaded in all except the handy sized washing tub which by means of an adroitly taken up position mrs massey contrived to have overlooked and left behind when mad bell drove away with her newly acquired property on through the gloaming she drove till the white dust flakes gathered up by the wheels grew damp and fragrant with dew and till the moonlight was glimmering among the golden sheaves silverly and till live embers were found out of the ashes low in the east the small hours had a frosty chill and old ned's short steps were leisurely and his halts for refreshment frequent still mad bell continued to sit with serene patience she was retracing her route the day before but at so much slower a rate of progress that the sun had been up for more than an hour when she stopped in front of big anne and the dummy's little house they were disturbed at their breakfast by the sound of the arrival and when they came to the door saw their visitor in the act of depositing a second chair upon the ground beside the cart weather now and is it yourself back again said big anne and what at all have you got there inside they're going said mad bell pointing to the cart load with an elated air it's a deal handier to have some chairs and tables this was a fact which big anne might well have admitted considering that she had just been squatting on her heels to eat a plate of stirabout however she only continued her perplexed catechism where at all was you after bringing them things from and who might be ownin them out of a house burnin down said mad bell och between us and harm what house is it then and how did it get burnin sure it's easy enough settin a house on fire said mad bell with a grin which to big anne who at this time was not familiar with her manners looked rather sinisterly significant flaring up real strong she said pushing towards her as if in confirmation of the statement the little wooden clothes horse whose rails were blackened and charred easy it may be big anne said looking aghast at it but dreadful devilment it is to do such a thing with the misfortunate people very apt to lose their lives let alone everything else there was nobody in it only a couple of fat little children said mad bell the saints be among us woman said big anne what sort of talk have you it's not strailin about the country you are with them old sticks of furniture and leavin the little children in the house blazin up the lord pitied the creatures that had become of them if they were left that away burnt to cinders be now very belike suffocated said mad bell with a complacent nod big anne and the dummy stared at one another in great horror the dummy could express her feelings only by crossing herself and gasping but big anne spoke volubly may god forgive me for opening my lips to the likes of you och but you're the unnatural wicked woman to do such a thing if you were twist as cracked and crazy itself get along out of this yourself and your old cart afore the police comes after you och the misfortunate little creatures and don't be offering to darken our doors again with the hideous sight of you give me a hand with liftin in them two tables said mad bell whereupon big anne whisked away from her and banged the door in her face mad bell however did not appear to be discouraged by this reception she finished unloading the cart of all except the tables which she found unwieldy single-handed then she unharnessed old neddy and went and seated herself on the low wall beside the house 
she was seemingly quite content with the situation but to the two women indoors it was a dreadful experience their minds were firmly persuaded that the daft little woman had designedly set fire to some dwelling and made off with what household gear she could lay hands on leaving the hapless children to perish amid the flames it shocked and enraged them that their premises should be infested by the presence of such a criminal and that her ill-gotten goods and chattels should be brought to their very threshold not to speak of her outrageous proposal to harbour them under their roof began declared that with the legs of them chairs and tables glimpsing through the doors as if they were only turned out to be airin a bit she and the dummy seemed as good as a pair of murderers every now and then they went to the door and peered out and the incendiary always greeted them with cheerful nods on these occasions big anne sometimes said oh very well me good woman just you sit there brazen and there till the patrol comes round this way and then if i don't give you in charge as soon as the sun's shining crooked over our heads be gone out of that and take them things out of littering about our place or she would remark loudly to her companion just stop a minute winnie till i sling me old shawl over me head and run down to the barracks it's not very long they'll be puttin her out of it and bundlin her into jail instead of to be sittin here wid ne'er a spark of shame in her annoyant decent people but neither mode of address produced any effect the morning sunbeams still slanted down on the small pile of furniture and old neddy went on munching the blades off which they were drying the dew and mad bell continued to sit upon the wall as if placidly waiting for events such was the posture of affairs until towards noon when an outside car came trotting quickly down the lane on one side of it sat a black whiskered man in his best clothes with each hand tightly grasping a small fat wrigglesome child and the three were matthew tom and winnie wogan on catching sight of mad bell he made the driver pull up well ma'am he called to her so you're after getting home bedad it's the fine long step you've took the old donkey one while he'd be doin it and you're about gettin in the few things very welcome she is to the whole of them he continued to big anne who had now emerged and begorra nobody else had a better right to any trifle might be saved out of it she'll have told you ma'am the way the place was set on fire on me last night some little devil of a spalpeen playin with matches it seems but anyhow there it was in blazes and me gallopin home like a demented cow conceitin these two imps of the mischief here would be smotherin inside it and truth if herself over there hadn't them fetched out safe into the yard when it was as much as your life as worth to put your head in at the door for the stifler of the smoke i don't know how she contrived it maybe the creature isn't altogether very sensible he said in a confidential tone but if she had all the wit ever was thought of she couldn't a done better be the childer so it's kindly welcome she is to the bits of furniture and the old beast and drive it on we must be good morning to use all mad bell listened to this praise with the same equanimity as to began's threats and reproaches but when the car had trotted on she came up to her saying just as before give me a hand with liftin in them tables and matthew wogan jogging down the long lane may have caught the last glimpse of one of them as it vanished in at the doorway thus it was that mad bell came to be domiciled with big anne and the dummy in the pauses between her wanderings the arrangement seemed equitable in view of her substantial contribution to the plenishing of the house the donkey cart likewise was found very serviceable enabling them to turn a penny occasionally by fetching and carrying and the coalition worked well upon the whole but after a few years of such prosperity that 
they were seldom without a bit of food in the house and sometimes had bacon on sunday things took a turn for the worse old ned died under the burden of his many years and a sort of moraine among the fowl cut off several promising pullets in the heyday of their youth then arose difficulty about rent while their landlord who was new to the property had a natural zeal for sweeping it clear of encumbering tenants and the end of it was that the three women transferred themselves to lisconnel where they became not the least respected of its inhabitants but these particulars about their antecedents were never learned by the neighbors there and the joint ownership of the furniture still presents itself as one of our unsolved problems another of them was propounded somewhat later when mad bell returned from an unusually long ramble during which she had crossed the leafy by the spacious o'connell bridge and had heard the boom of the big college bell and with her wizened lemon face had half scared the smallest sized children in villages round about dublin for she was wearing an elaborately fantastic piece of headgear which moved everybody's curiosity so strongly that it cannot have been for want of wondering if we failed to find out how she had come thereby strangely incongruous it did undoubtedly look yet the stages by which it had descended from its stand in the milliner's showroom and alighted upon the head of the little wandering witted tramp were much fewer than might have been supposed probable one blustery march morning when mrs mcbean was on her way along by the low sea-wall to buy a bit of bacon at donnelly's shop in kilclone the east wind did her the shrewd turn of whisking off her hat and dropping it into the water it was a most shabby old black straw rusty and battered and torn yet mrs mcbean a laborer's wife who had nothing at all handsome about her seemed to think it worth a serious risk for she mounted on the broad wall-top and thence made so unwary a snatch that she overbalanced herself and splashed headlong into the heaving high tide where she could very well have perished beneath the cold olive-gray swell had not the brothers denny fishing for bass hard by noticed the perilous accident and pulled timely to the rescue when they disembarked her gasping and dripping at the nearest landing-place she was understood to say sure me heart's broke a remark which police sergeant young who formed one of the group gathered by the disaster considered sufficient grounds for marching her off to the handiest j p on a charge of attempted suicide mrs mcbean vehemently repelled the accusation she explained that she had said her heart was broke only because she had lost her old hat and every thread of a rag on her had been drenched and ruinated with the salt water how could she go for to do such a sin as destroy herself she urged and she would a house full of little children waiting for at home the creatures her arguments proved convincing and the charge was summarily dismissed not without strictures upon sergeant young's excessive zeal by which he reckoning nothing of talleyrand's maxim felt himself puzzled and aggrieved the incident however brought some more agreeable consequences to mrs mcbean as the j p s ladies commiserating her half drowned plight sent her that same evening a goodly bundle of cast-off clothes over which her eyes grew gleefully bright in her careworn face at one of the articles included they widened with almost awe this was an enormous hat made of white fluffy felt with vast contorted brims and great blue velvet rosettes and streamers its fabric was very stout and substantial and withal quite new for its original owner had speedily found it so stiff and heavy that to wear it gave her a headache and a crick in her neck mrs mcbean for her part 
could not entertain the idea of carrying anything so sumptuous upon her grizzled head and when she tried it on her eldest daughter it totally extinguished and nearly smothered the child so she stowed it away in a corner where it remained unseen for several weeks but next month on the afternoon of easter day mrs mcbean had two visitors over from ballyhoy annie cassidy elderly and rather grim with her young friend nelly walsh nelly's bound to be having bad luck this year for her life annie observed in the course of conversation for not a new stitch has she put on her to-day at it easter that's an unlucky thing according to the sayin ne'er a bit am i afraid of me luck averred nelly cheerful and threadbare not to say ragged but mrs mcbean was pricked by a sudden thought up the ladder to the little attic loft whence she cracked down again bringing with her the great white hat there nelly she said just clap that on your head and then nobody can pass the remark that you didn't get the wear of something new anyway nelly took the hat which struck her nearly dumb with admiration but as she tried to catch a glimpse of it in the shred of looking-glass on the wall her delighted expression waxed so eloquent that mrs mcbean was impelled to say you're to keep it girl alive if you're e'er a fancy for it sure it's fitter for you than likes of me that it'd look a queer old scarecrow if i offered to go about in such a thing she had not at first intended this generosity her worldly goods being so few that she could not lightly part with even a very unpromising possession nelly on her side could hardly believe in her high fortune when after some polite demur she found herself carrying off the splendid hat to wear it on an ordinary walk would have seemed profane so she held it under her old shawl all the way home to her cabin on the shore at the foot of the black banks a good step beyond ballyhoy but when she reached the door she could not forbear the pleasure of making her entrance in the glory of her new adornment her reception was altogether disappointing for her mother's and grandmother's voices rose up shrill and shriller demanding what at all hideous gazebo she'd got on her billy her eldest brother said musha she's put on a pair of blinkers on her like an old horse and larry his junior remarked with terse candor och the fright more mortifying still joe tierney her sweetheart who had called to conclude arrangements about the morrow's holiday said in a disgusted tone tear and ages i hope to goodness nelly you're not intending to make that shoulder yourself at the circus tomorrow bedad i never seen such a contrivance you might as well be walking alongside some sort of demented mushroom this rather aptly described the effect of the huge white brim upon nelly who was small and short of stature but it hurt her feelings badly the only upholder of the hat was annie cassidy who is fond of controverting the opinions of other people and who despises men she said don't be letting them put you out of conceit with it nelly it suits you lovely sure if anyone doesn't think your appearance is good enough for them you needn't trouble them with your company circuses to my mind is trash to be watching folks figure a dyin on a pack of old horses backs there's a lot of us goin over tomorrow to rathbeg where there are merry-go-rounds you can ride in yourself and all manner if you just step down to the junction station and come along with us on the early train deed that i might said nelly not that she had the least intention of doing any such thing but because being somewhat of a bell she was unaccustomed to uncomplimentary criticisms and much affronted by them furthermore for the same reason she escorted annie home and stayed so long talking that joe before she returned had to go off about his milking which annoyed him a good deal however he had quite forgotten his vexation next morning as he hurried through his early tasks with a day's pleasuring before him he worked at the kellys 
whose land is bounded north and south by the junction lane and the sea and as he walked about the fresh april fields he was in view of howth dark pansy purpled against the eastern amber confronting the sweep of the dublin mountains outlined in wild hyacinth coloured mist across the dancing silver of the bay the calves had been fed so expeditiously that joe found he could spare time to stop at the starred bank under the hedge and pick a bunch of primroses some of which nelly's mother would proudly keep in a jam pot on the window stool while nelly herself might like to wear a few at the circus brightening up her brown striped shawl but when he was compressing a thick sheaf of the cool soft stalks in one hard hand he chanced to look up and saw what thrilled him with dismay bobbing along over the jagged edge of the wall a short way down the lane went a glimmering white object which he at once recognized as nelly's new hat he ran aghast to look through the gate and despite intercepting road curves and obstructive hedges the hat it unmistakably was making for the junction station so nelly intending a serious quarrel had thrown him over and joined the rathbeg party a pleasure hoarded in anticipation for many a month shriveled into dead leaves suddenly like fairy gold as he perceived how certainly this must be the case his first angry impulse was a resort to haskins public at port brendan where he might spend his spoiled holiday taking drinks and making bets in the society of some cronies what hindered him from immediately acting upon it was a compunctious forecast of the concern which would prevail in his family if he absented himself contrary to expectation there's me mother's never easy he reflected unless she's persuading herself some of us are kilt on her this made him resolve to postpone port brendan till after breakfast and he turned loathfully homewards as he passed along kelly's yard wall he relieved his feelings by tossing his nosegay over it at the place where he heard the grunting of their pigs who on that occasion fared almost as delicately as marvel's rose-lined fawn it was early still when he reached his cabin one in the walsh's row and he sat down listlessly on a bank to wait for nothing in particular presently mrs walsh senior came by with a twinkling can of water och there you are joe she said nelly's been looking out for you this good while weatherin it's queer lookin out she had said joe and she took off wid herself to old annie cassidy bad manners to her for her interferin what's the lad talkin about at all said mrs walsh standing amazed nelly's within there this instant of time readyin herself up maybe you'll tell me said joe that i didn't see her streelin down the junction lane afore i was leavin kelly's and maybe you'll tell me said nelly's grandmother that she wasn't just now callin to me they were wantin water it's a fine ball she'd had a had let out of her if i was to be hearin her and she up beyond kelly's there she was anyway said joe doggedly wouldn't i know that dad fetched looking old new cowbean she stuck on her a mile aground you great gomeral said mrs walsh if that's all you might easy enough ha seen the big hat goin down the road but have you the notion it's growin on nelly's head why you omadon you hadn't quit ten minutes last night and nelly was just after gettin back when who should come by but poor mad bell och now the ragged object the creature was with nothin over her misfortunate head but an old wisp as full of holes as a fisher net so little larry says jokin like look here nelly says he you'd a right to be lettin mad bell have a loan of your grand nappy hat to keep the sun out of her eyes but be like nelly'd took a turn agin the thing wit the way they'd all been makin fun of it will you have it bell says she holdin it out to her and if she did 
Mad Bell grabbed it in her two hands. It's not often she'll have a word for anybody, and no more talk about it, but cocked it on, and tied it firm under her chin with the streamers as tasty as you please. Musha, good gracious, to see the length she drew the bow out on each side of her bit of a yellow face, and the nod she gave her old head when she got it done. So that's what's gone with the hat, goodness guide us, if she wasn't the crazy poor witted body she is, twouldn't be a sin to let her go makin' such a show of herself. But sure no one would think to mind anything the likes of the creature might have on her. The saints may pity her. I be dad them kind of queer constructions do be fit for nothing unless quality and mad people, old Mrs. Walsh continued without malice, soliloquizing as Joe had caught up the can and was hurrying it with prodigal splashes towards his sweetheart's door. The circus, with its flaring lights and whirl of tinseled prancing marvels, was so rapturous an experience to Nelly that she had not a regret for her discarded hat, which at this time was moving on beneath a soft dappled sky between greening hedges westward along quiet roads and lanes. It found shelter for the night under the lay of a tall hayrick near Santry, thus ending the first stage of Mad Bell's tramp home to the wide brown bogland of Lisconnel. CHAPTER Twelve, A FLITTING Among the latest of the strangers that have visited Lisconnel were some who came at a time when the neighbors stood rather in need of distraction. For the summer following Mrs. Kilfoyle's death was, between one thing and another, a drearyish season with us. That little old woman had left a great gap, and then there were many long spells of gloomy bad weather which seemed to beat people's troubles down upon them as the damp drove the turf wreck back through their smoke holes into the dark rooms where they could scarcely see how dense the blue haze was growing stacy doyne's marriage also had removed something young and pleasant and at times when the thatch dripped without and within neighbors were apt to talk about her in tones of commiseration and say sure her poor mother's lost entirely so that towards autumn the diversion of some new resident's arrival happened opportunely enough it was made possible by the fact that big anne had given up her holding and entered into partnership with the widow mcgurk thus leaving her late abode empty for another tenant who appeared much sooner than any one might have anticipated from the aspect of the cabin. Except as a fresh topic of conversation, however, the strangers gave small promise of proving an acquisition to the community. Liss Connell did not like their appearance by any means, and further acquaintance failed to modify unfavorable first impressions. These were mainly received in the course of the day after their arrival, which took place on a night too black for anything beyond a shadowy counting of heads and a perception that the bulk of the newcomer's household stuff had jogged up on one donkey and must therefore be small. A portion of Big Anne's furniture had remained behind her in the cabin, owing to certain arrears of rent. Her heart was scalded, she said, with the prices she'd only get for her early chuckens, and they the weight of the world, if you'd feel them in your hand, and poor Mad Bell, that it mostly bring home a few odd shillings with her, was away since afore last Christmas, and might never show her face there again, the creature, and the poor dummy gone, that was great at the knittin' if he got the chance, a bit of narration which would look funny enough in anybody's rental. Mrs. Quigley, who went to the door with the offer of a seed of fire, found it shut, and a voice inside called, as unmannerly as you please, No, we've got matches, whereupon another voice, further in the interior, quavered, Thank ye kindly, ma'am. So she departed, little wiser than she had come. 
but daylight showed that the party consisted of an old man and his son and his son's wife and her sister and three small children besides some choking china fowl and a black cat with vividly green eyes this much was apparent on the surface also that the old man was frail bent shriveled and civil-spoken that the son was a big soft gomeral of a fellow that both women were sadly flaxen-haired with broad flat cheeks and light eyes and that two of the children resembled them while the third a girl a trifle older was a dark-haired disconsolate-looking little thing with her face said mrs bryan not the width of the palm of your hand and the eyes of her sunk in her head as for the fowl there could be no doubt that their unnatural long fluffety legs were fit to make a body's flesh creep and the cat looked as like an old devil as anything you ever witnessed sittin blinkin atop of the turf stack other less self-evident facts came out by degrees more slowly than might have been expected as the strangers were generally close and chary of speech they came from the north where their affairs had not prospered in fact they had been sold up and put out of it as the young man divulged one day to brian kilfoyle they were a somewhat intricate connected family by the name predominantly of patman the sister-in-law was tishy mccrum which seemed simple enough but the two light-haired boys were greens mrs patman having been a widow while the little girl was the child of a wife whom tom patman had already buried for though he looked full young to have embarked upon matrimony at all this was his second venture and it's a queer comether she might have been puttin on him quoth mrs quigley afore he took up with herself that's as ugly as if she was bespoke and half a dozen year older than the young bashtoon if she's a minute it is true that at the time when mrs quigley expressed this unflattering opinion she and her neighbours had been exasperated by an impolite speech of mrs patman who had said loudly in their hearing well for certain if i had a notion of the blamed little dog hole he was bringing us into sorrow the sole of a foot that i had set inside it and had then proceeded to congratulate herself upon having prudently left all her decent bits of furniture up above at her mother's so that she needn't be bothered with cartin them away out of a place that didn't look to have had ever a air a thing in it worth the trouble of movin not if it stood there until it dropped to pieces with dirt mrs quigley rejoined to judy ryan that if it would be a great pity if any people stead in a place that wasn't good enough for them supposin all the while they were used to anything a thrinine better maybe they might in course and maybe they mightn't it was wonderful to hear the talk some folks had and they would every old stick they owned an easy loadin for riley's little ass but judy ryan with a flight of sarcastic fancy hoped that mrs patman and her family were about goin on a visit presently to the lady lieutenant because it was much as if they'd find any place else where they'd be grandeur accordin to their high-up notions skirmishes such as this however were a symptom rather than a cause of the patman's unpopularity that sprang from several roots for one thing both the women had harsh scolding voices and it was even chances that if you passed within earshot of their cabin you would hear them giving tongue their objurgations were as a rule addressed to the young man or the old the latter of whom soon grew into an object of local compassion as a harmless decent poor creature while his son came in for the frank-eyed looking down upon which is the portion of an able-bodied man shrew-ridden through sheer supineness and palthroonery but what lisconnel often said that it thought badder of 
was the stepmotherly treatment which seemed to be the lot of the little girl katie of course the situation was one which under the circumstances would have made people believe in such a state of things upon the slenderest evidence still even to unprejudiced eyes it was clear that katie's rags were raggeder than those of her small stepbrothers and that she crept about with the mean of a creature which has conceived reasonable doubts respecting the reception it is likely to meet in society when the autumn weather began to grow wintry little katie patman perishing about out there in the freezing wind became a spectacle which was viewed with indignant sympathy from dark doorways whence she received many an invitation to step in and be warming herself her hostesses opined that she was fairly starved just for the taste of the fire and didn't believe she was ever let next or nigh it in her own place often too the consideration that she had no more flesh on her bones than a marsh chicken led to the bestowal of a steaming potato or a piece of griddle bread but the result of this was sometimes unsatisfactory to the giver katie being apt to dart away with her refreshments which she might presently be seen sharing among bobby and stevie for whom she entertained a strong and apparently unreciprocated regard i wouldn't go for to be saying anything to set her again them mrs brian kilfoyle remarked on some such occasion but goodness forgive me i've no liking for them two little brats i'd mistrust them ah sure they've no sense said biddy ryan where'd they get it and the biggest of them i'd suppose under four year old sense said mrs quigley bedad then if sense was all that held them the pair of them is as cute as a couple of young foxes i mind only a day or so after they'd been in it i met the last one on the road and i comin home wid be chance a sugar stick in me basket so just to be makin friends like i gave it a bit for itself and a bit for the other that i seen comin along well now ma'am if it had took and ate up the both of the bits i'd a thought ne'er a pin's point of harm twould a been natural enough to the size of it but i give you me word when it seen it couldn't get the two of them swallowed down afore its brother come by what did it go do but clap the one of them into a crevice in the wall and cover it under a blackberry leaf and wit that down it squats and begins saying creely crawly snail where's the creely crawly snail i'm after huntin out of its hole lettin on to be lookin for something creepin in the grass and a while after it comes slinkin back when it thought nobody was mindin to poke the bit out of the wall where i was gatherin dandelions under the bank so while i was fumblin about missin the right crevice says i poppin up thinkin to shame it maybe the crawlin snails after eatin it on you says i och is i seen it says the spalpeen as brazen as brass give me another bit instead there's a schemin young rapscallion for you they're too like their mother altogether to please me said judy ryan the corners of their eyes do be as sharp as if they were cut out with a pair of scissors not that i mind if there e'er a streak of good nature in them but i misdoubt they have the little girl now is as different as day and night if she takes after her father she's a right to want the wit powerful misfortunate little imp said mrs brian for if he isn't a great stupid gomeral and ass just get me one why if he was worth the dust blowin along the road he'd prevent of his own child bein put upon och they have him frighted said mrs quigley with scornful emphasis they will let him take an atom of notice of her they're that jealous sure if he gets talkin to her outside the house there one of them would let a ball and send him off to be carryin in turf or water i've seen it times and again if he'd take and sling it about their ears some fine day he'd be doin right and it might learn them to behave themselves said judy but the old man would disgust you pursued mrs quigley 
with the romancin he has out of him about his son tom you'd suppose to listen to him that the omadon's equal never stepped he'll dive you wid it till you're fairly bothered troth he thinks the young fellow's doin something out of the way if he just walks down the street and expects everybody to stand watchin him goin along it's surprisin the foolery there does be in people oh murder woman alive said audie rafferty whose pipe went out at this moment there's no content in yous at all it's too cute they are and too foolish they are musha very belike they're not so much off the common if you'd a trifle more experience of them there's nothing to match that for even in people bedad now there's some people i know so well that i can scarce tell one from the other lisconnel however generally declined to fall in with audie's philosophical views and the patmans whether suspected of excessive cuteness or folly remained persistently unpopular there was only one exception to this rule the widow mcgurk had a certain fibre of perversity in her which sometimes twists itself round unlikely objects for no apparent reason save that they are left clear by their neighbours and this peculiarity renders her prone upon occasion to undertake the part of devil's advocate when therefore she had once delivered herself of the opinion that the newcomers were very decent folks she did not feel called upon to abandon it because it stood alone as grounds for it she commonly alleged that they were real hard-working and industrious which was obviously true enough since mrs patman and her sister might constantly be seen tilling their little field with an energy far beyond the capacity of its late tenant her neighbours unimpressed rejoinder well and supposing they are itself did not in the least disconcert the witty nor yet their absence of enthusiasm when she stated that it was a sight to behold tishy mccrum diggin over a bit of ground she'd lift as much on her spade as any two strong men as for little katy she'd never seen anything doin anything against the child it might happen by nature to be one of those little crowls of childer that would always look hungry like and pinin the creatures if you were able to keep feedin them with the best as long as the sun was in the sky in short something more than talk was usually needed to put the widow mcgurk out of conceit with any notion she had taken up perhaps the comparative aloofness of her hillside cabin helped to maintain the patmans at their original high level in her estimation at any rate they had not sunk from it by the time that they had been nearly three months in lisconnel and when mrs patman and her sister were on terms of the very glummest civility with all the other women in the place even towards the widow mcgurk they were tolerant rather than expansive she said they had done right enough to not be leapin down people's throats end of section eight This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 9 of Strangers at Lisconnel by Jane Barlow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9. One morning, not long after Christmas, the widow, being bound on an errand down below, called in at the patmans with a view to possible commissions mail was wanted and while tishy mccrum stitched up a rent in the bag mrs mcgurk noticed where little katy who had been took bad wid a cold these three days rustled uncomfortably among wisps of rushes and rags in an obscure corner fever made her bold and self-assertive for she was wishing nothing less than that her daddy would get her an orange an orange with yeller peel around it 
Katie laid stress upon this point, like the one her mammy got her a long time ago, and daddy'd be a good daddy and get her another now, and she'd keep a bit for Bobby and Stevie and all of them, a big yellow orange. Katie's eyes blazed with excitement as she reiterated these extravagant desires. "'She's got an uncommon fancy for one,' said her daddy, looking wistfully from the child to his wife. "'They have them down below,' suggested the widow, pence apiece. Mrs. Patman's hand was slipping toward her pocket. "'If it was just for once, she had begun, when Tishy tweaked her sleeve viciously and interpolated a rapid whisper. "'It won't be. There'll be no end to it if you begin humoring them.' so the sentence was badly dislocated she'll do a deal better without any such trash mrs patman concluded and walked off to throw sods on the fire just then the widow became aware that old joe patman was grimacing at her from a corner fast by in a way that might have startled her had she not been familiar with such modes of beckoning but when she obeyed his summons what she saw did astound her outright for joe was stooping low over a leathern pouch which he had drawn from a wall cranny and which seemed to contain marvellous depths of silver money with here and there a golden gleam among it as he warily stirred it up circling a hurried forefinger she had only the briefest glimpse ere he shoved back the pouch and thrust a sixpence into her hand, muttering, Get her the orange, don't be let on for your life. As she turned away with a reassuring nod, she perceived that Tishy McCrum was standing unexpectedly near, and looking towards them over the top of the meal bag. Tishy was biting off a loose end of thread, which gave her a determined and ferocious expression, but whether she could have seen anything or not, the widow felt uncertain. She thought not. About ten days after this, Mrs. McGurk was roused at a very early hour by thumping on her door. When she opened it, she found some difficulty in recognizing her visitor, as the dawn had scarcely done more than dim a few stars far away in the east, which is an ineffective form of illumination. "'Whither now, Joe Patman, is it yourself?' she said peeringly. "'And what's brought you out at all?' afore you can see a step or a stim is the little girl took worse for katie's illness still continued and had grown rather serious sure no said the old man katie's just pretty middlin but it's waitin i've been the length of the mornin till twould turn broad daylight before i'd be disturbin of you ma'am to tell you the queer sort of a joke they're after playin on me down yonder saints above man what talk have you of joking at this hour of the day or night said mrs mcgurk feeling the unseasonableness acutely as a bitter gust came swooping up the slope and indiscriminately ruffled the rime dusted grass tufts and her own grizzled locks och be jabbers it's a great joke they have again me whatever said old patman who was shivering much with cold partly and partly perhaps with amusement you see the way of it was last night no great while after we'd all gone asleep i woke up sudden like as if wit the creak of a door or something but whatever it might be twas slipped beyond me hearin afore i'd got a hold of me senses rightly so i listened a goodish bit and somehow everything seemed unnatural quiet till i heard katie fidgetin and i went over to see would she take a drink of water the lord preserve us and keep us ma'am if all the rest of them hadn't quit quit out of it they have and left us cliver and clean ah now don't be romancing ma'am said the widow remonstrantly what in the name of the nation it bewitch any people to go roving out of their house in the middle of the black night with the frost thick on the ground quit they are said the old man tom's gone and the wife and every man jack of them they've took the couple of chickens i noticed trishy killin of yesterday begorra i believe they took tib the cat for ne'er a sign of it i see about the place that would 
mostly be sittin' cocked up atop the dresser. Goodness guide us, sorrow a soul there is in the house but the two of us, me and the child, and she's real bad. It's a queer old joke. It'd be a joke of a set of ravin' mad people, said the widow. But the rest of it is, he went on, do you mind, ma'am? He looked round him suspiciously and lowered his voice. The leather pouch you might have seen would me the other day? Ooh, said Mrs. McGurk, are they after taking that on you? Sure, man, I thought you had it unbeknownst. Aye, it's took, old Patman said, but how she grabbed it I dunno. Unless I was thinking be any chance you mentioned something about it? Divil a bit of me did, the widow averred with truth, which her hearer accepted, and how much might you have had in it at all? Truth I couldn't be tellin' you, he said. I never thought to count it. Tis just for a pleasure to meself I keep it. This long while back I've put ne'er a penny in it, but when we used to be livin' up in Port Nefoil, I'd slip in the odd shillin's now and again, and sometimes I'd think twould be handy for buryin' me, and other times I'd think I'd give it to Tom as soon as I'd gathered a trifle more. Only some way the thought of partin' with it would seem to go again me, and since poor Tom made a match with Martha McCrum, tis worse again me it goes. Tis that good for naught weasel of a Slavine Tishy's after contrivin' it on me, I well know. And bad luck to her, quoth the old man with a sudden spasm of resentment. Tom would never play such a trick. I mean, it wasn't he invented the joke. He doesn't trouble himself with much joking. He's too sensible and steady and perspicuous and uncommon set on me and the child all the while. There's no better son in Ireland. Och, but the rest of them mean no harm with it. They're just scheming to drop in presently and be rise a laugh on me. Steps which were promptly taken to verify old Joe Patman's strange story proved it to be correct in every particular. The only fresh fact which investigations brought to light was the presence of a five-shilling piece lying on the dresser, where Joe had overlooked it in the early dusk. All the other inmates, chickens and cat included, had disappeared, and with them most of the few movables, the old man and the sick child being left as forlorn fixtures. Lisconnel at large was neither slow nor circumlocutory in forming and expressing its opinion as touching the nature of the joke, a firm belief in which old Joe resolutely opposed to his troubles as they thickened around him. For no tidings came from the absentees, nor were any heard of them while Katie's fever ran so high that it seemed likely her grandfather would be at small further charges on her account, a prospect which, however financially sound for a capitalist of five shillings or under, nonetheless filled his soul with grief. Then one night, when Katie was at her worst, a great gale came rushing and roaring across the bog, and when the day broke it discovered the patman's brown thatch slope interrupted by a gaping crevasse over which a quick plashing rain-sheet quivered the widow mcgurk had less spare room than heretofore at her disposal now that she harboured a co-tenant with a slight accession of tables and chairs yet she made out a dry corner for the child and her grandfather who accepted these quarters in preference to any others because the widow whatever may have been her private views, was prevented by a mixture of contrariness and magnanimity from joining in the general denunciation of her former allies, compromising as were the circumstances under which they had elected to take their departure. In her society, therefore, he was not obliged to overhear trenchant criticisms upon his Tom's behaviour, and could dilate, at least uncontradicted, upon those gifts and graces in the young man, which recent events had certainly placed in some need of exposition. Other disquieting voices there were, however, which he could not dodge, and they spoke louder every day, for his five shillings were melting, dwindling had vanished, and Liz Connell, 
with the best will in the world could ill brook a burden of two incapables more laid upon its winter penury no word on the subject had reached the old man's outer ears but as katie struggled slowly and fractiously toward convalescence it became clear in his mind that unless something happened she must when well enough to be moved seek change of air away at the big house perhaps this prospect was now more constantly before him than even the thought of tom's filial virtues as he sat drearily on the bank by the widow mcgurk's door he might often be seen to shake his head despondently and then he was probably saying to himself belike he thought bad of me keeping the bit of money unbeknownst by that time he had abandoned the joke theory and fixed his hopes upon the arrival of a letter to explain the mysterious nocturnal flitting and say whether they had betaken themselves after passing through Duffclane, the furthest point to which the detective forces of the district had tracked the party young dan o'beirne whose work brought him daily up from down below to the forge a long way on the road toward lisconnel had safely promised to convey this letter so far whenever it came and on many a day the neighbors nodded commiseratingly to one another as they saw the old creature goodness may pity him setting off with himself in quest of it the prompt january dusk would have already fallen before he struggled up the knockhorn to be greeted by the widow in the tone of marked congratulation which our friends sometimes adopt when all reason for it is conspicuously absent well man alive there wouldn't be e'er a letter in it this day anyway och to be sure not at all he would answer cheerfully i would look to there be an e'er a one sooner than to-morrow i hadn't the notion of expectin a letter whatever twas just for the enjoyment of the bit of a walk i went why to be sure it was but be comin in man for you're fit to drop and be gettin your old brogues dried och man you're drowned entirely tis a mighty soft evenin it's turnin out and here's katie lookin out for you this great while big Anne would say she's finally this evenin glory be to goodness chapter thirteen a return affairs were much in this posture when the widow mcgurk was one day perplexed by the occurrence of two small incidents in the first place as she was starting on an expedition to the town she saw at a little distance something run across the road which looked uncommonly like the patman's black cat tib lisconnel owns no other cats for which she might have mistaken it still as she was puzzled to think how the creature should have hidden itself away for more than a fortnight she concluded that she had been deceived by some fluttering bird or glancing shadow in the next place she happened in the town upon one larry donnelly who in the course of conversation remarked so you've that young patman back would use again what took him to be leggin off with himself that way and what put that in your head at all said the widow light nor sight we've seen of him or a one of them or likely to it's off out of the country he is belike and he after robbin his old father that's never done talkin foolish about him and leavin his innocent child to go starvin into the union bad luck to him she found a free expression of her sentiments rather refreshing after the restrictions under which she was placed at home well now said donnelly i'd a bet me best brogues i seen that chap a couple of nights ago streelin along the road down about our place but twas darkish enough and i might easy be mistook the widow pondered much over this statement on her homeward way but had the forbearance to say nothing about it she was still undecided whether or no she would communicate it to anybody when next morning on her way for a can of water she saw the black cat unmistakable this time run across the road and as on the day before make off over the bog towards the little river widow mcgurk stood staring after it for a few minutes and came to a resolution then she looked about her and was aware of andy sheridan's head leaning against 
his doorpost of andy her opinion was as we have seen rather low but she could descry no other person available for her purpose so she called to him andy lad i'm goin after me two pullets that strayed on me come and be givin me a hand andy lounged over to her good-naturedly and they turned into the bog where oddy rafferty presently joined them the widow thought her fowl might be among the broken ground where the stream runs at the back of the knockhorn and the three went in that direction it was a mild soft grey morning and they met with neither stir nor sound till they came abruptly upon a grassy hollow shut in by furzy banks and fronted by the running water and then the widow who alone had been expecting the unexpected uttered a surprised screech and said och boys dear goodness gracious guide us what they saw was the figure of a man in a long grey coat crouched out of a heap under the bank near him were ranged in a row half a dozen oranges striking up a wonderful golden glow a small grimy scrap of paper was spread out near them covered with several piles of shillings and pennies and a silver thimble beside these tabby the cat sat severely tucked up apparently dissatisfied and irked by the situation at the widow's exclamation the man raised his head and was seen to be tom patman looking haggard and dazed and as hollow-eyed as little katie herself widow mcgurk and oddy and andy stood in a line facing him whither now tom patman said oddy and what might you be doin wid yourself i'm sittin here said tom och musha tell us something we don't know then sittin there you are sure enough but what the mischief are you after might i politely ax and what do you mean by it at all at all i'm sittin here said tom again and starvin i am and sittin and starvin i'll be more betoken till the ind of me old life sure what else ud i be doin and meself to thank for it wid never a soul left belongin me in the mortal world nor a place to be goin to well to be sure said mrs mcgurk if that talk doesn't beat all that ever i heard and himself after traipsin off as permiscus as an old hen that won't sit on her eggs and leavin his own flesh and blood behind him as if they were the dust on the road and then he ups and gives chat about never a soul bein left him twas tishy bad cess to her said tom och but it's the mischievous old devil skins is tishy mccrum and it's herself stirred up martha that wouldn't be too bad altogether if she'd be let alone till the two of them had me tormented wid tellin me the old man had pots of money he never spent as long as he had us be livin on and that we'd all do a deal better if some of us slipped away easy widout raisin a row and left him for a bit while we'd be sellin martha's things and singin about gettin into a decent little place instead of the whole of us to be starvin alive up at lisconnel that's nothin more than a bog bewitched and he after lettin us be sold up they said and all the while ownin mints of money so that we'd no call to be over particular about leavin him to make a shift along wid the child if twas a convenience only he'd be risin a queer wallabaloo if he knew we were goin off anywheres troth i couldn't tell you all the gabbin they had day and night and showin me the place he kept his bag hidden in and this way and that way och be dad themselves persuade the hair on your head it grew wrong side out if they'd a mind to it they might so said oddy supposin i was great gomeral enough to be mindin a word they'd say or the likes of them in his subsequent reports of the interview oddy always alleged that he had replied i very be like supposin it grew on the head of an ass which was certainly neater but oddy rafferty's repartees like those of other people are occasionally belated in this way so the end of it was tom went on nothin else ud suit them except gettin all readied up for us to be slinkin out in the evenin late faith i'd twenty minds in me heart again quittin little katie and she that bad however they swore black and white that me father 
be spending all manner of money on her when he got us out of it and we were to be writing for them to come after us as soon as we were settled and everything agreeable so i went along but if i did ma'am sure when they'd got the bits of furniture sold the only notion they had was to be settin off to make fortins in the states and ne'er a word about katy and the old man och they had me distracted outrageous they were and that old thief of the world tishy allowin me sorra a penny so as i mightn't have been bound to stop wherever they was but one day they thought they had me asleep in the room corner and the two of them was colloguin away at the table so all of a sudden tishy whips out me poor father's bag that i knew the look of right well when he used to keep his baccy in it and down she slaps it and it jinglin with money what's that for you says she and the laws bless her says martha is it after taken that you are and what's to become of them creatures up at lisconnel och blather said tishy you needn't be lettin on you didn't well know all this while i had it sure the old one might a had plenty more hidden away on us anyway i left them something to get along wid says she the five shillins said the widow och but that one's a caution real hard workin and industrious she is observed andy tom resumed his narrative them two will do as well inside as out says tishy i'll just be countin the bit of silver says she but bedad i was fairly past me patience and up i leaps and grabs a hold of the little bag och it's a queer fright i gave them that time and they not thinkin i was mindin real terrified they were said tom sitting up more erect and recalling this rare experience with evident complacency and leave that you omadon said tishy with the look of a devil on her what foolery are you at now you thievin miscreant says i to her it's shankin off to the police i'll be and layin a heavy charge agin you for robbin and stealin and you after leavin the innocent child there and the old man to starve without a penny to their names says i fog says she for that matter the fever is like a to have took her off again now with no trouble to be starvin and maybe a good job too for everybody and be this and be that says i if i thought there was e'er a fear of it tis ringin your ugly neck round i'd be this instant let go of the bag says she sweepin up some of the shillins that was spilt the police says i and a heavy charge if there's another word out of your hideous head i vow and declare says martha i believe twould be the cheapest thing we could do wid him to let him take it and go sure he'd be divil a hapworth more use for an immigrant than the old cat there i was ape enough to bring along to pacify the childer so then tishy gave some more impudence but the last end of it was we come to an agreement that i'd take the note and the silver and they'd keep what bits of gold was in it and they'd go off with themselves wherever they pleased at all and i'd tramp straight back here to be lookin after the child and the old man ay bedad we settled it up civil enough and afore i went martha handed me the old thimble and bid me bring it to katy twas her mother's says she i was keepin for her and thick it is wid holes be the same token but don't say i'd be robbin it off for her and they told me to take tib along or else they'd be leavin her to run wild so i put her in the basket begorra i believe bobby had a notion to be comin wid me and the cat for he was lettin sorrowful balls the last thing i heard of him so away i come wid the best of me haste och i knock the queer walkin out of meself entirely and i stopped at the last big place i was passin to get katie the oranges and i was trampin it all the night after till just when there was a streak of the mornin over the bog i come into lisconnel but och where where the roofs off of the house och the look of the black hole wid the rafters stickin through it and ne'er a breath of smoke till me heart was sick watchin to see might there be an odd one and the door clap clappin sure be that i well knew the child was dead 
me father quit out of it or maybe buried himself and i after leaving them dying and starving so for afraid somebody be coming out and telling me off i run away into the bog till i was treading here in the cold water and then i tumbled the old cat out of the basket that was scrawling and yowling disparate and i took and slung the basket into the stream there's the handle among them rushes and down i sat under the bank i don't know how many nights and days it is at all but here i stop never a foot i'll stir to be lookin for bite or sup or lettin on i'm in it and anybody may take the bit of money and welcome i'd as lief be pickin up the dirt on the road for i'll just give me life a chance to ind out of the world's misery and desolation now may goodness forgive you said the widow mcgurk it's a poor case to want the wit troth and yourselves the queer old child desert mean-spirited easy frighted slavine of a young bestoon but what sort of a contrivance is it you have on you at all at all be way of a head that you couldn't have the sense to consider the roof blown off a body's house would be the reason enough for them to be quittin out of it and no signs of dying in the matter do you think the wind was apt to be waitin till there happened to be nobody within afore it got scatterin the thatch god help us all you've little to do to be squattin there talkin about desolations and miseries with the two of them this instant minute sittin be the fire up at my place and sorra a hand's turned ailin em for my katie's a trifle contrary now and then through not bein entirely strong yet and bedad at that hearin reports of the occurrence used to proceed from this point the leap he gathered himself up wit and the rate he legged it off mushy he was over the hill while we were pickin up his things for him and as for the old cat that he tripped over it rolled three perch of ground before it got a hold of its four feet sure we were sittin there as quite as could be conceived the conclusion of this precipitate rush was thus recounted when all of a sudden we couldn't tell what come bouncin in at the door as if it had been shot out of the ends of the earth and had us all jumpin up and screechin till we seen it was only tom patman and he in such a takin you might suppose he thought somethin would swallow up old joe and the child on him before he could get at them liz connell's opinion was divided as to whether tom would actually have stayed and starved in his hiding-place had he not been discovered mrs mcgurk thought it likely enough the cat goin back and forwards that way she said give her an idea there was something amiss in it and that was why she took andy along deed and she got a queer turn when first she spied the chap crouchin under the bank she couldn't tell but he might have been a corp brian kilfoyle's view was devil a much sure if he'd had e'er a notion to be doin anything again himself there was plenty of deep bog holes handy for him to sling himself into and have done with it whereupon mrs sheridan crossed herself and said deprecatingly ah sure be like the creature wouldn't have the wickedness in him to do such a thing a husband didn't know but he might them soft sort of fellows that sometimes stick to anything they took into their heads the same as a dab of mortar agin a wall and oddy rafferty supposed the fact of the matter was that if be any odd chance they got a notion of their own they mistook it for somebody else's on one point however the neighbours mrs mcgurk not excepted were practically unanimous the utter flagitiousness namely of tishy mccrum there was a tendency to begrudge her the trivial merit of having voluntarily left behind her the five shilling piece for this marred the perfect symmetry of iniquity which is so pleasant to the eye when displayed by people of whom we have no opinion only mrs bryan said it was a mercy she had that much good nature in her itself but even she added that the fewer of them kind of folk she saw comin about the place the better she'd be pleased and she hoped they'd got shut of them for good and all this aspiration seemed the more likely to be fulfilled when within a week or so the patmans heard from the family of tom's first wife 
who held out prospects of work for himself and a home for katie and his father a proposal which was gladly accepted their departure left as the single trace of their sojourn to lisconnel tib the cat which remained behind a somewhat unwelcome bequest to the widow mcgurk indeed i fear the creature became a source of some annoyance to her because andy sheridan contracted the habit of addressing it by the name of tishy and bestowing upon it the same laudatory epithets with which the widow had been wont to justify her admiration for the energetic sisters it was on a hushed february morning that the patmans finally departed the smell of spring was in the air and filmy silvery mist had begun to float off the dark bogland in vanishing wreaths soft and dim as the frail slow blossom already stolen out over the writhen black branches up on the ridge a jewel had been left in the heart of every groundling trefoil and clover leaf and the long rays that twinkled to them were still just tinged with rose here and there a flake of gold seemed to have lit upon the clump of sombre green firs bushes by which neighbors in a small knot stood watching the three generations of patmans dwindle away down the road with its narrow dewy grass border threading the vast sweep of sky-rimmed brown father and son walked while little katie bobbed along balanced in a swaying donkey pannier the widow mcgurk who felt a good deal of concern about the destiny of her late lodgers hoped they were going to decent people for there wasn't as much sense among the three of them as you'd put on a fourpenny bit and mrs quigley thought twould be hard to say which the young man or old one was the foolishest for the blathers old joe talked about tom and the gabby tom made of himself over the child now that he had his own way with her was past belief and i can tell you said oddy rafferty there's folks goin about that you'll want all the wits you ever had and maybe a trifle tacked on to get the better of rightly ah i question will they ever do any great things goodness help em said mrs sheridan twill be much if he keeps them outside the house well anyway said biddy ryan i'd liefer be in their coats for fortin or no fortin than like them two ugly tempered women settin off to the dear knows where after robbin and plunderin all before them true for you then biddy said mrs bryan turning away from her wide outlook we're none so badly off when we're stoppin where we are instead of streelin about with the notion of such black villainies in our mind for sure enough she said as she faced round towards the grey peaked end walls and smoke plumed thatch of lisconnel the world's a queer place to get travellin through take it as you will chapter fourteen good luck although larrigmena is no great distance from lisconnel as the crow flies but little intercourse takes place between the two hamlets for the crow's flight would be over a rugged mountain ridge sinking into a trackless expanse of bog which often spreads rough and wet walking before wayfarers who have to experience it at closer quarters than those who merely throw down a flapping shadow as they pass and round by the road is a good long tramp not to be lightly undertaken so it does not happen half a dozen times in the year perhaps that anybody comes from thence to lisconnel and our visits thither are fewer still the neighbours say that the people up there do be very poor entirely and are wont to use a commiserating tone when speaking of them but their knowledge of the locality and its inhabitants is by no means intimate and would be even less so were it not that theresa joyce and her brother mick the remnant of mrs kilfoyle's family are now living there which makes a connecting link larigmena is scattered rather wildly over the slopes of a grey mountain that shoulders the sea at the point where its foam comes nearest to lisconnel some of the cabins 
stand so low along the shore that the shingle knocks clattering at their doors when the tide is full and rough and other some are perched so high up on the hillside that they constantly disappear from view behind a curtain of the pale mists which haunt its summit creeping to and fro when one of these little white dwellings with its field fleck beside it emerges from the clouds you feel as if the slightly improbable had happened since at such a height you would have expected nothing but the appropriate rocks and swampy patches there was once a french princess who would no doubt have wondered why on earth any people should choose to live and farm in such unchancy places rather than that she would have ploughed herself up a little bit of the rich green land which spreads its broad tracks round about with sometimes sheep nibbling over it and here and there a few deer but the views of this young lady are represented as having been so far in advance of her age that she seems hardly possible as an historical personage and withdraws into the myth mists to that region certainly belongs the ancient chronicle in which we read how the irish nemedians revolting against the intolerable deal of cream and butter and wheat and meal exacted from them by their oppressors the fomorians those ferocious african pirates emigrated to hellas in hope of better things but were at last driven back home to escape the heavier yoke of the athenians who compelled them to dig clay in the valleys and carry it in leathern bags to the top of the highest mountains and the most craggy rocks in order to form a soil upon those barren places and make them fruitful and able to bear corn that history should repeat itself is of course to be recognized as merely a commonplace fact but a myth reproducing itself in the shape of events happening visibly before our eyes is a rarer phenomenon and it seems to be occurring whenever a string of lagermenians come plodding up their winding mountain path under the burden of heavy creels filled with earth or oftener with slippery brown sea-rack and leathery weed for it is in this way that whatever scanty foothold their starveling crops may find has been fashioned and maintained in the stony little fields year by year as the blustery days of late autumn darken into winter the steep ledged path is wetted all along with sea-water and bestrewn with dark trails and tough tawny pods out of the dripping creels until it grows as sharply ocean odorous as the beach while the many bare feet are continually toiling slowly up and quickly pattering down it yet their efforts are rewarded by only meagre and stunted growths so intractable is the material upon which they are expended mickey joyce has been heard to declare as he took a despondent bird's eye view of his holding that you might as well be trying to raise crops in the crevices of the stone walls however as we were just now shown these dwellers at laragmena have another resource to fall back upon in fact they have nothing less than the wide sea as a supplement to their bit of land the queer small boats hauled up on the sand and dark brown net festooning the rafters betoken that as does also the bit of salt fish hung against the wall pallid and juiceless a shadowy wraith-like looking viand but the bounty of the sea has limits it does not yield up its stores for nothing but takes as well as gives and it helps itself sometimes on a liberal scale some years ago for instance it took poor thady joyce and several of his companions who had gone off in a couple of luggers after the herrings the event is remembered with awe at la rigmena because in that wild march gloaming con the queer one had met daddy himself face to face stepping up the winding path and had given him good evening 
and asked him how he had got all dripping wet just at the very time when the unlucky lad must have been lying drowned miles and miles from there among the surges of galway bay other such toll has often been levied since then for the carras and pucons in which larigmena goes to sea our frail craft to cope with the billows come rolling maybe from the fog banks of newfoundland and blasts that have cooled their breath among hills of ice before they sweep across the atlantic now and then a boat comes to grief even in the short voyage made for the purpose of cutting rack from the shells of the black reef that lies a bit off the shore so on the whole the inhabitants of larigmena may be considered to pay dearly for their supplies of fish and seaweed and we at lisconnel though we lived beyond reach of such things and have few substitutes for them are not far wrong in speaking of the people up there as real poor entirely yet they themselves would not by any means have it supposed that they think bad as they call it of their fortunes and habitation on the contrary whatever their private opinion may be they are disposed to uphold the merits of the place in public and to prove themselves sudden and quick in resentment of any outsider's disparaging criticism the most deadly insult that can be offered to a larigmenian as such is an allusion to the libelous report that has somehow become current to the effect that his reverence at drumrow the nearest parish always sends out a special messenger on saturday night to remind them of the morrow's mass the innuendo being that larigmena's out-of-the-way situation and general want of culture preclude its inhabitants from knowing the day of the week this is why an innocent seeming remark such as well boys it's tuesday this morning has been known to set blackthorns whirling wildly something of the sort occurred at salinmore fair one day in last september when matt doyne and andy sheridan from lisconnel fell in with their acquaintances larry sullivan and felix morrow from larig manor after they had fought as long as seemed good to them they exchanged what news they had the most important piece was that larry and felix were presently setting off to the states they were rather urgent in advising the other two lads to join their party but andy said that everything would go to sticks at home if he was out of it and matt averred that his mother would be of the opinion she was lost and kilt entirely if he so much as mentioned any such an idea and herself with your brother terence at home to be keepin her company objected felix sure there's me mother with ne'er another creature in the world you may say but meself and she's never done this last six months persuaded me to go along then it's the queer woman she must be bedad said matt unless it's yourself the queer bastoon on her entirely and maybe that's like her a rejoinder which brought on a renewal of hostilities just at this time a spell of fine weather very bright and serene had been brooding over lisconnel it was the early spring of autumn when leaves and berries here and there are taking a blossom-like vividness the frost touched briar sprays seemed to have found and dipped in the same red that had dyed the young buds and shoots of april the air was so still that the seeded dandelions stood day after day with their fairy globes unbereft of a single downy dart like little puffs of vapour among the grasses a soft mist rounded off all the bogland holding in it rows the sunbeams that steeped it and letting them waken to their full golden glory at the very heart of noon but one morning the haze began to thicken and darken on the horizon as if wafts of murky smoke were blown through it and towards evening massy shapes of black clouds came slowly lifting themselves up some with outlines curved like bosky clumps of wood some ruggedly ledged 
and angled like a drift of begrimed icebergs by sunset the far west was all a sullen gloom veined with lurid tawny streaks and mottled with deeper stains old peter sheridan who is reputed to have a great eye for the weather turned it forebodingly upon the prospect and said the sky was the moral for all the world of the back of an old brindled bull and he'd never known any good come of that manner of appearance and true for him before sunrise next morning lisconnel was roused by the revelry of a crashing thunder peal which preluded a violent storm it is seldom that one booms and rattles so loudly over our bogland or glares with so fierce a flame brian kilfoyle taking a rapid observation through his door said be the powers of smoke i never seen the equal of that you might think they was after whitewashing the whole place with blindin fire here's out of it says i and he retreated blinking to his dark corner at the height of it even auntie sheridan who is probably our freest thinker felt secretly relieved to know that his stepmother and his sisters were saying their prayers the arrangement seemed to give him a sense of security without claiming any concessions from his superior strength of mind but in the end the perilous clouds rolled away growling and gleaming towards the mountains and the sea leaving only one victim behind the quigley's little goat who had been struck dead by a lightning flash to the sorrow of her owners and the awe of all lisconnel in contemplation of the black and white body stretched out still on her wide grazing ground the storm however seemed to have broken up the fair weather and the days that followed were blustery and rainy on the next of them larry sullivan and felix morog were seen passing through lisconnel evidently equipped for a journey larry who had parted from no near friends was apparently in good spirits but felix looked so much cast down that his contemporaries refrained from any references to the days of the week and the pair went on their way unmolested amongst the lengthening shadows they reported the storm to have been terrific altogether up at larrig manor the witty bork's thatch was set in a blaze and it was a living miracle that the whole of them wasn't frizzled up like a pan of frying herons it may have been ten days or so after this that a good many of the neighbors had dropped in one evening at mrs doyne's she had been ailing of late and old dan o'byrne had stepped up from the forge to prescribe for her and cheer her with accounts of how finely young dan and her daughter stacy were getting on at their place down below in duffclane the rest of the party had assembled merely for company and conversation it included members of nearly all our families kilfoyles and quigleys and ryans and rafferties and the witty mcgurk and big Anne. presently judy ryan who was looking out of the door had an announcement to make whether now and who might yous be when you're at home there's two women comin along the road from sallenbeg ways i don't know the looks of at all i should say but the rain's mistin thick between me and them carryin bundles they are if they're not any of the tinkers we're right enough one of them's a little old body and the other's a good size bigger strangers they are och mercy on me have i eyes in me head at all how strange she is sure it's theresa joyce herself but we haven't seen her this great while and who she has along with her i couldn't be tellin you a feeble sort of creature she looks to be according to the way she's foosterin along when these two travellers arrived at the doyne's door nobody failed to recognize theresa joyce notwithstanding the estrangement of a long absence and she hastened to introduce her unknown companion who kept a tight clutch on her arm as if afraid to let go and looked at nobody's face but seemed to listen from one to the other she was it appeared the widow morogue from larigmena who had been struck blind by the lightning in the great storm friday was a week 
the sight of her eyes clean destroyed with one flash as she was throwing a bit of food to the fowl at her door and the last child she had belonging to her set off the next morning to the states and now she herself was going to the union down at morn alone for what else could she be doing that couldn't see her hand before her face so teresa was bringing her down and they thought they might have gone as far as duffclane against night but the creature wasn't well used yet to walkin' in the dark so they were slow comin' and they'd hardly do it such was the outline of mrs morrogue's history up to date and its rehearsal had at once the effect of arousing a sympathetic bustle about her which did not subside until she sat a wet and wayworn guest in the most comfortable hearth corner and had been provided with a cup of the tea that mrs doyne had made herself in her character of an invalid she now sat on one side of the blind woman and stirred her tea for her and on the other dan o'burn shook his head in regretful confirmation of the opinion pronounced by the drumrow doctor which was reported to be that mortal man couldn't do her a thrinning of good meanwhile teresa joyce who was likewise bedrenched and weary found a seat in the opposite corner where her nearest neighbours were oddie rafferty and her niece-in-law mrs brian kilfoyle with her daughter rose well teresa it's the long while since you've stepped over to see us oddie said starting the conversation and it's the soft evenin you've chose to be comin your shawl's dreeped take it off and i'll give it a shake above the fire be dad teresa the two of us has been wearin the dusty meal bags on our heads since the time i seen you first as black as a slow you was but now it's liker the blossom it's turned and time for it said teresa sure i'm over seventy year of age now anyway every day of it and the long days there was among them god knows but with all that ne'er a one of them was long enough for you to be finding a man to your mind in it said oddie and i declare to goodness i don't know but maybe it's the very sensible woman you are for that same sure meself was a great while afore ever i thought of axin biddy and for anything i can tell i might have done better if i'd held me tongue a bit longer and then said nothing as the sayin is i was old enough to know me own mind anyway but musha for that matter rose there'll presently be settin up to think she's old enough to know hers and it's twenty chances if she has as much wit as you and why would she said teresa or anybody be wishin it to her oh let that alone there's a deal of different sort of wit and no reason why one of them shouldn't be as good as another look at her grandmother me sister bessie it's plenty of peace and comfort she had with her marryin this was quite true as although she had been rather early widowed and her only daughter had married an emigrant her son and his wife had taken such care of her and made so much of her that the neighbors had never thought of calling her the widdy a title reserved for a woman left struggling alone and she had remained mrs kilfoyle to the end of her days and look at the poor creature there what's she's come to said oddie instancing the tragical figure of the widow morrough eh the saints may pity her said teresa but the likes of such bad luck happens few people married or single thank god it's a queer unnatural young villain her son must be said mrs brian to skite off and leave her that away sorra the bit he can be good for deed now nor a woman that's the very notion is distressing me said teresa for i don't know but it's after using him ill i am you see the way of it was the poor soul poor mrs morrogue had the great dread of the sea upon her be reason of her husband and her father getting drowned at the fishing so she's always the fear in her mind of the same thing happening her couple of boys however the eldest of them went off to california a good few years back and was doin pretty middlin well out there the last she heard of him but that's a long while ago now about gettin married he was but felix the lad she had at home wid her until the other day 
often enough he was bound to be on the water after the fish and the seaweed if he was to get his livin at all and distracted she was seemin him goin out in their old boat that leaks enough in her to sink the biggest ship ever set sail and herself with scarce the width to hold a sizable flounder says i to felix one wild evenin when we was argufyin with him that sure the little loadin he could be puttin in her would never be worth losin his life for but says he to me the bit of food they'd put in their mouths was littler again yet they might be losin their lives for want of it and ne'er a word had i said to that but one night last winter he was as nearly lost as anything in a squall and after that his mother would be tormentin herself worse than she was before so she set her heart entirely on gettin him to take off to the states and be out of the way of fishin and drownin she'd a gone with him herself only they said she was too old and spoilin his chances she'd be a long while it was before he'd hear any talk of it the whole summer she was persuadin him but at last he made up his mind he would twas no notion of his own to be leavin her i'll say that for him whether now but that was as curious a plan as ever i heard tell of for keepin a person from drownin said ody to be sendin him off over the rollin seas sailin goodness can tell you how many hundreds and thousands of miles what was she dreamin of at all at all to do such a thing ah but sure it's a different sort of sailin said teresa why they say one of them big steamers would carry a couple of our little boats along with her and you'd scarce notice she had them on board terrible safe they must be if they're that size and more betoken said mrs brian there's such a sight of ships comin and goin between this and the states wouldn't you think that again now they'd have got a kind of track line crossin over as if it was a manner of road they was followin that nothing's apt to happen them on and not strayin about promiscuous in the storms track said ody shrilly be dad then it's the queer track and the queer places it brings them into do you know that for one thing they go slap through the bay of biscayne and is that an ugly bay said mrs brian you can call it that i wouldn't be sayin so to herself over there said ody with much careful mystery for it might be only discouraging the creature worse than she is already but it's the place where the seven oceans of the world meet ay indeed ma'am but don't be lettin on to her i was speakin to a man who had a brother went through it and he said the ragin and tearin of them all flowin together would terrify the senses out of king solomon they had the great big steamer he was in whirlin round and round and round the same as if it was afloat on one of its own paddle wheels he couldn't tell how many days and nights tracks how are you it's a very ready one there is in it to the bottom of the sea still a good few people gets through it safe enough said teresa ay and comes back through it of an odd while but how many's lost in it that you never hear tell of said ody besides that the man i was talking to told me his brother was never right in his head after the tossin he got it's a poor case to be landin ravin mad in a strange country supposin you get there itself but me own notion is that if people's well off they'd a right to stop where they are and if they're misfortunate they've a chance anyway of better bad luck stayin at home ody stated his own notion authoritatively and teresa looked depressed by the dilemma in which it seemed to place the emigrant deed now maybe it's a bad turn i'm after doin the two of them she said but poor mrs morrough many a time she says to me it'd be the greatest comfort to her at all to get to get quit of the fear she was in continual whenever he went out with the old boat sure she might be a bit lonesome she'd say but after all what great company was he to her when half the time she would be drownin him under the roll of the sea like his poor father and grandfather and with the most he could do it's hard set he was to make what it keep him so she'd planned she'd be able to contrive well enough with her hens and her spriggin work 
till felix could be sendin her over a trifle a very clever woman she was at the spriggin a handkerchief corner she'd work was real elegant pence a piece she got for them and i've known her finish a dozen in three days och but i got a turn on the friday mornin when i stepped down to her place to see what way they were after the storm and there she was sittin crouched up in a corner and screechin to me to know who was comin in and i standin before her eyes in the middle of the sunbeam and glory be to god says she that it's yourself for you'll have the same sense to give me a hand wid endeavourin to keep the knowledge of what's after happenin me from felix the way he won't be prevented a goin to morrow sorra a foot would he if he knew aught ailed me and then sure he might stay at home for good and all and drowned he'd be and meself a go demented and sure i thought it may be no thing to be doin and so i said to her but it seemed that the heart of her was to be broke altogether if anything could hinder him gettin out of it and then i was mindin the father and grandfather of him the way they went and me brother poor thady and i couldn't tell but i might a reason to think bad of biddin him stay and if he did sure perhaps he couldn't be keepin her at all and she so helpless it's better able he might be to help her out in the states and sorra i ha been to disappoint the creature of the first wish she'd took a thought of sittin in the dark of her misfortune so the end of it was i settled i'd stop wid her for the day and try could we let on there was nothin amiss when the felix come in that was out somewhere since early in the mornin before the storm began this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks section 10 of strangers at lisconnel by jane barlow this librivox recording is in the public domain section ten but deed now it was the queer contrivin we had after he'd come home and where he'd been but off down to drumrow gettin her an elegant big teapot for a keepsake so the sorra a stim of it in course could she see and i done me best biddin her look at the grand gilt handle and the wreath of pink roses on it and she'd say the same thing after me but sure it no way's very easy to fall into an admiration of a teapot you've never set eyes on and i missed out the poor lad thought she wasn't so much pleased with it as he expected and then he'd be walkin in and out and axin for this and that he was to put in his bundle and she could only be tellin him where to look for them instead of readyin them for him herself and the pair of socks she'd promised him she couldn't get to finish real fretted she was with it all howsomever one way or the other we made a shift till poor felix went off in the grey of the mornin with ne'er a notion of anything says he to her you'll be seein me steppin in again one of these days and says she ay will i as sure as i'll see the sun shinin so he conceded she was well enough content but the two of them was thinkin different things ne'er a word of it we said to anybody before felix was gone or else somebody would have been safe to have told him for there's plenty of people couldn't be goin about widout tellin everything they hear any more than a wasp could fly widout buzzin its wings and then we got the doctor to her but he couldn't do e'er a hand's turn sure what could anybody do agin the lightnin that's a sort of miracle you may say unless it was wid another one and i don't know has people any call to be settin themselves up to try do them said mrs bryan we'd better leave the like to them that understands the nature of such things ah i should suppose we'd a right to be tryin whatever we get the chance to said teresa and that's little enough the lord knows plenty of things there is keep up out of the reach of our meddlin wid them ay be dad or else it's the queer regulatin we'd be givin them now and again we would so said oddy regretfully 
Och, but there's an odd few good jobs I'd give more than a trifle to be puttin' me hand to this minute if I could get a hold of them. And that's the way it is, I'm afeard, wid the lightnin' blindin', said Theresa. Howenever, up at Laurig Manor, we'd a done the best we could for her, if she'd a been content to have stayed there. We'd a contrived among us all to keep her well enough, but not a bit of her would, for all we could do or say. She wouldn't be a burden on the neighbours, she said. You see, she's proud in her mind, the creature. That's what it is, goodness help her. And when a body has that sort of a notion, said Otty, you might as easy crack an egg inwards as get it out of their head. So that's the way of it, said Theresa. But if you could be telling me whether it's wrong I done or right, you know more than meself. Felix would be for killing me, if he knew. That's certain, and small blame to him I was thinking part of the while coming along. For bad work there's apt to have been, sure enough, in anything that in anything that ends in landing a body in the union. The blind woman in her corner across the hearth seemed to have caught the last word, for she abruptly said, Ay, ay, it's there I'm going, and the first of the morogs ever went on the rates or the Conroys either. But I'm not taking their name along with me. Troth, no. Sorra the Elamorah will they find in it. Sure, not at all, woman dear, said Theresa. Why, Mrs. Doyne, it's great work the two of us had this day coming along the road, planning a fine name for Mrs. Morog to have in the Union, for she says it's none any decent poor people own she'll be bringing into it. So we've settled she's to be Mrs. Skeffington Yelverton. That's an elegant sounding one, isn't it, ma'am? Everybody expressed admiration, and a forlorn glimmer of complacency at the arrangement passed over even the sorrowful countenance of Mrs. Skeffington Yelverton herself, as she sat in her ragged old wisp of a shawl. She was holding it under her grand new delft teapot whose beauties she should never see though by this time much fingering had made her familiar with the outlines of its raised pink rosed wreath then theresa joyce said we ought to be stepping on with ourselves if we're to get to duffclane before dark the evenings took up a bit i see the sky there turning like golden glass again the windy pane but the neighbours protested against their setting forward again, and it was agreed that they should sleep the night at the Guilfoyles. When this point had been decided, Mrs. Morog said, Would that be the sea, the rustling I hear outside there? Upon this people looked ruefully at her and at each other, as if the question had given them a glimpse into the darkness in which she was sitting. Ah, no, ma'am, said Mrs. Doyne, that's only the sedge leaves and the wind round, the big pool just back of the house. Few days of the year there is, summer or winter, but there'll be shush shoein' that way, a dreary sort of noise it is to my mind. I do be tired listenin' to it in the night sometimes. Sure there's ne'er a drop of sea water nearer us, ma'am, than the place you're after quittin' out of, said Judy Ryan. It's the queer willahaloo. It'd have to be risin' before we hear it that far. Well, well, said the blind woman. Yous are the very lucky people, I'm thinkin', all of yous, that see the shinin' of the sun, and live beyond the sound of the sea. Her remark was followed by a short silence, during which her hearers were, perhaps, questing for consolatory rejoinders, rather than congratulating themselves upon their own luckiness. It was Big Anne who broke the pause, saying with the best of intentions ah sure ma'am dear please god you won't be so and we won't be so a sentiment which apparently did not meet with the approval of oddy rafferty as he frowned bushily at her and said in a testy undertone musha good gracious woman what talk have you out of you at all just at this moment sounds the nature of which could not easily be mistaken rose up close by shouts and laughter and thumps and trampling of feet people who ran quickly to the door were in time to see a knot of youths fall confusedly out of the house over the way the quigleys 
obviously to judge by their subsequent proceedings for the purpose of continuing a scuffle with ampler elbow room but it was only for a very brief space that their wrestling and skirmishing among the puddles held anybody's attention that was speedily diverted to the far more extraordinary and astonishing behaviour of their visitor mrs morogue for she suddenly sprang up off her chair exclaiming saints above it's paddy that's paddy's voice him that i haven't set eyes on for nine years next easter there's felix yellin too the both of them's come back glory be to god and so saying out of the house she ran and across the road as straight as a dart she who not an hour before had been led gropingly in and would have put her foot among the glowing hearth sods if her guides had not pulled her away the neighbours could at first look on in only mute amazement but in any case the two boys and she were for some time so intricately entangled that any attempt to elicit any explanation would have been futile when at last questions and answers were possible no very lucid account of the matter was forthcoming to the many voices that demanded is it seeing you are woman alive is it seeing you are all mrs morogue all mrs morogue could answer was i be dad am i and as well as ever i done in me life praise be to goodness sure i don't know what way it was but me sight came back to me all of a flash the same as it went just the very minute i was hearin the lads shoutin och paddy avick but you're the grand man growin and felix och now to be seein you again and everything else as clear as clear it's meself's the lucky woman this day glory be to god and mary in short the marvellous restoration of her sight is to this day a miracle very freshly in the remembrance at lisconnel and laurigmena where the inhabitants know little about paralysed optic nerves and might perhaps continue to wonder none the less even if they knew more beside it the unexpected reappearance of the two young morogues seemed almost a commonplace incident though paddy's fine new suit and gold watch-chain were indeed very exceptional things at lisconnel his story ran that he had prospered highly of late out in california having made enough to set him up grandly on a good bit of land in the old country and give felix a fair start and keep the old mother in comfort all the rest of her life with what objects in view they had landed at queenstown he and his wife a girl belonging to a very respectable decent people in the county of wicklow so next morning walking along the quay who should i see but me gentleman there and another chap along with him and both of them looking as wild as if they'd been caught and says i to sally you bet that's felix from our place at home and right i was and just slick in time to stop him going on board paddy had then left his wife with her family in wicklow where he had seen a promising farm and he and felix were now on their way to fetch their mother thither and it's in the queer consternation you'd have been said theresa joyce if you'd landed up at laurigmena and found her quit out of it the way she was and that would have happened us said felix if it hadn't been for young dan ryan in there just now passing the remark that we couldn't expect father martin to be sending us notices all the way to the county cork and supposing i'd very belike missed the right day for the steamer be reason of it for if we hadn't got fightin and tumblin out of the house you might easy a gone along with yourselves and never known we were in the place at all twas great luck entirely fortune in truth had seemingly taken mrs morogue and her affairs into the highest favour even the luck insurance of a trivial loss was not wanting to her as in her hasty exit she had dropped her new teapot which broke into many pieces on mrs doyne's floor so that as has been said she never beheld it in its beauty but the very skies had cleared above her head swept by a waft of wind that scattered the clouds faster and further than a drift of withered leaves and the sinking sun broadened in splendour before the eyes that had lost sight of him through ten interminable days 
the wet stones of the road glistened like jewels and the shallowest pools between them held unfathomed deeps of blue when the morogues set off for la Rigmena, where they intended to sleep the night and bid their friends farewell and if it's themselves would be in the fine astonishment when they set eyes upon you woman dear said theresa joyce for if you'd been twenty years away travelling the world crooked and straight you couldn't have come back a different creature from what you were and we settin out this woeful mornin little notion you had what was comin to you and it all the while runnin up your road so to speak like the sun racin the shadows on a windy day deed now i'd be goin along wid you to hear what they'd say to you but i'm old you see and every step i've tramped i have the feel of it in every bone in me body so i'll stop this night up at brian's and me dad ma'am it's well off you are if you've the feel of nothing worse in them said the querulous voice of old peter sheridan whose acquaintances describe him as being terrible gathered up with the rheumatism this great while so great in fact that everybody except himself has by this time become accustomed to his condition for the most part however they were rather pleased faces that watched the three strangers out of sight the last long beams from the sunset making blink the eyes of nearly all lisconnel the west dispread its fiery golden bloom wider every moment as the swelling scarlet disc wheeled lower burning with orbed flame a hollow path through the kindled haze one laggard cloud a great soft nest of snow drifted into the heart of it and out of it again flushed and glistening and sailed on a radiant shape to meet and eclipse the misty white ghost moon faint and dim in the east far away over the level bog the light was stealing about in streams like water spilt on a floor well now i declare said mrs brian it does one's heart good to see a bit of luck like that happenin to a body ay does it said judy ryan the creature to be gettin back her sight just at the right minute of time to see her son comin home to her sure now one might take a pleasure in plannin such a thing if one had the managin of it ah dear but i wish somebody would be contrivin a bit of good luck for us then said mrs quigley maybe there's plenty more where that's comin from suggested brian kilfoyle hopefully it's apt to stay there then quoth mrs quigley for any signs i can see ay ma'am that's me own notion said peter sheridan bitterly i'm thinkin we'll have to be goin there wherever it is and lookin after it for ourselves if it's good luck we're wantin and i don't know what better we could be doin said theresa joyce than goin where it is when we get the chance ay there's the last of the sun she said as a quiverin red shaft shot up suddenly and trembled away into nothing on the air ay for sure he goes down a great way off out on the bog the creature would have been pleased to see it deed no i don't know anything better we could be doin than goin after our good luck so all through that gathering twilight mrs morogue and her two sons were journeying away with their high fortune to la Rigmena. they were still on the road long after the clear moon had filled the air with shimmering silver and sent their shadows stretching darkly far over the frosted grass but lisconnel had gone to seek for the time being it's good luck in the land of dreams end of section ten recording by james carson end of strangers at lisconnel